So uh, let's move to session two, spectral data collection, proximal and remote sensors, UAV, airborne and satellite data. Uh, so we will have a few presentations about proximal sensing during this first part of the session. Um, as I said before, Javier Pacheco will um, give a presentation showing some conclusions from the Working Group 2 Intercomparison Experiment carried out in Italy at Montebondone. Then I will <coughs> give a presentation on behalf of Alessa MacArthur, uh, focusing on the conclusions of our last Eurospec meeting, Working Group 3 meeting um, with the industries, and uh, then there will be a presentation on one of the uh, hyperspectral automated spectral measurement systems. Then uh, Micol Rossini will talk about uh, ground-based hyperspectral and fluorescent measurements for the estimation of gross primary production. So these uh, two presentations will um, involve ocean optics uh, measurements. And then the last presentation will be given by Hector Nieto, on multi-angular thermal infrared data and radiative transfer modeling. So, Javier, yeah. the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, well, as Lori said, I will tell you about the experiment we did in Montebondone last year. And first of all, we would like to explain why we did this experiment. On one side, hyperspectral sensors are being and are going to be more demanded in edicovariant flux towers because. They provide uh, an spectral information, very fine spectral information, who allows to, to retrieve and to detect subtle changes in the plant physiology. And on the other hand, there's an increasingly uh, need for data sharing. And the first thing we should ask ourselves is if we can share this data and we compare them and we can reproduce the, the, the measurements we are doing. Uh, there are several sources of uncertainty when, when we are doing optical sampling. We are using different instruments. We are using different configurations. We are, we are measuring under different atmospheric conditions, under different illumination conditions. We are using different reference standards, and we are using different protocols that sometimes are not even uh, documented or are not sufficiently documented. And there are also another barriers to uptake uh, because we, we still have to deal with calibration. There, uh, we have to make familiar with the physical uh, nomenclature. We have to work uh, in the uncertainty estimation and reporting. And, and in the end, comparing between sites is not an easy task. And we don't even have a baseline against which to compare. So in the, framework of, uh, in the framework of the summer school on optical sampling, uh, we, we did the experiment. Uh, we wanted to quantify what differences could we find when we were measuring with four different spectral emitters and, uh, and uh, how important were these, these differences if uh, we were actually able to compare this, this data. So we gathered four different instruments, one uh, Unispec DC spectral radiometer, two ocean optics with a different configuration, one for beach near and the second one for fluorescence, and uh, also we use an ASD Field Spec Pro. Uh, and we gather together the, the fiber optics uh, in, a, in a rotating arm, uh, and we, we try to, mes to measure very close. Uh, we try to, to actually measure a very similar thing every time, and we use the, the same number of fiber rates, and, and we measure four different targets, three spectral on panels, calibrated panels, and we also measure a, plus, a plot of grass uh, to, to see the effects on, on vegetation reflectance. So we did two things. Uh, first thing we did was uh, we took 50 rounds of measurements. Uh, we repeat the same, the same uh, cycle every time. We took a dark carbon measurement. We took a white reference measurement. And then we measured sequentially uh, the other three targets. And we also wanted to see uh, how our differences were due to the, the shift of the, the field of view, the time that passed between the measurements and everything. So we wanted to, to measure the intra-variability intra of the measurements. So we did also 10 repetitions of each target. So the first time we took the dark current, we also took a wide reference, and then we measured 10 times one target, and we repeat, and then measure another target, and so on. 
Uh, there was also uh, some metadata sky monitoring, uh, and we we tried to to make sure that the sky conditions were stable, were similar, and were comparable uh, along the experiment. So, we on one hand we we measure the diffuse to global ratio using a, an SVC a spectroradiometer with an integrating sphere. We also took the hemispherical pictures of the sky to 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 monitor the clouds and the position of the sun. Uh, we also characterize the atmospheric state using a microtops handheld sun photometer, and we use a GPS for time matching of, this, of the measurements. Uh, well, this was a, a good way to estimate how, how the sky changed along the time of the experiment. Uh, in in the most of the, the spectra, the di global, diffuse to global ratio was uh, lower than point of, 0.2, and uh, the, the, maybe the most noisy or the most diffuse radiation was in the, in the blue bands because of the Rayleigh scattering, and the minimal, the, the minimum digital to global no, diffuse to global ratio was in, in the in the 776 nanometers, uh, which was uh, increased along the along the uh, along the experiment and was maximum at the end of the experiment. In general, there were no clouds uh, obscuring the sun, but uh, there was an occasional period. Uh, Peri peripheral haze uh, of clouds around the noon, and uh, in general the vapor water content increased along the along the morning. Uh, the first outcome of this uh, experiment is that we found that we have uh, an unexpected maybe a uh, nonlinearity in the unexpected DC spectral radiometer at the at the top of the dynamic range. Uh, but we were working with the uh, range of the spectra, and we were with that range of the dynamic uh, no the, that range of the of the energy level of the sensor. So we we fall in the nonlinear part of the of the sensor, and we have to characterize that the uh, characterize that the uh, nonlinearity, and we could correct the data. And then we, we were able to compare the the results. I, I have to apologize because uh, I could not uh, I cannot show all the corrected Unispec data in these plots. So uh, you will you will always find uh, from now on a, a comparison of the ocean optics uh, spectra and the ESD spectra and the uncorrected uh, Unispec spectra. But I am also plotting the, the ocean optics and the Unispec corrected spectra on the, on the other side. Okay, we, we could not uh, get uh, all, the, all the data on time. So this would be the example of the 15 rounds. This is the average reflectance of the 15 rounds of the, of the dark uh, spectral on panel uh, that we, we got. And we can see that the, there is a difference between this average and the average we got just repeating 10 times on the same place of the panel. Uh, the measurements and the dispersions are also lower. Uh, this would be the example for the 80% reflectance spectral panel for the 15 rounds and also for the 10 repetitions. And this would be the example for the grass plot. We can see that the largest differences were found in the near in the near infrared region of the spectra. And this would be the example for 10 repetitions. So we we are. Uh, Trying to account uh, how no these intra and inter sample standard uncertainties. So this would be an example for the 20% spectral on panel. Uh, we have here the standard deviation of the 50 measurements of the this panel and the standard deviation of the 10 measurements, the 10 repetition of this panel, which are much lower. Differences uh, with this, uh, those are for the corrected data. And uh, we can see that differences are lower for the 80% spectrum on panel. It was maybe more homogeneous, more Lambertian, or we have less problems with that panel. And this would be the example for a, for a real spectral of vegetation, which is in the end is mainly where our main application. We don't work on panels, we work on, on vegetation. And this would be the example. No? There is, uh, especially in the near infrared, there is, an, is, a, there is a high uh, deviation of data. It's quite variable, so we have to take that in account when we work with, the, with this data. And this would be the example for the corrected inspect data. <clears throat> Another thing that we, we are doing is to, to, to analyze the effect of the spectral resolution. We were working with different instruments, and these instruments have different features, including the spectral resolution. Uh, the ocean optics uh, have, uh, present, uh, they have a very high spectral resolution so that they are more noisy, you know? and we wanted to know how far the, that noise could be comparable or could be resampled to the noise of the other instruments. So uh, the data, the ocean optics data have been resampled for, in example here, for the, the spectral resolution, the nominal spectral resolution of the ASD spectral radiometer. And you can see here that when, when this is done, the signal is less noisy, and, and we, can, we must consider this. No, no, not all the data have the same noise because not all the data 
have the same spectral resolution. This would be the example for the fluorescence uh, sensor, and this would be the, the differences in the standard, in standard deviation. And just to talk about the conclusion, this is an unfinished work yet. We are finding or we are looking for a method to evaluate a standardized uncertainty measure of this instrument comparison. And we would like to take in account these differences in the full width of half maximum, the spectral resolution. And we also would like to characterize the instrument specific standard uncertainties in operational measurements conditions. And then the next question is when these differences are significant. When do we have to care about these differences and we, when we don't have, no? We have to take the uncertainties in place. And that's why, that's why maybe no, uh, estimating and reporting the uncertainties we find is very important because for some applications, maybe we could not compare this data and for others we could. So that's maybe the, the final objective of uh, this kind of uh, experiments and of this kind of works to find out when, 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 when we can share data for what applications can we, can we share data and when not? Thank you very much. Do you have any question? Any questions? Yeah. It was Nicole who, who resampled the data. Maybe she can answer you. But uh, we are working on this, and we would like also to see the effect of uh, this variation in reflectance on the vegetation indices, but uh, we have not done uh, this yet. But is, the idea is also to see the effect on the vegetation indices. So, thank okay. you. <laughs> Any other question? What is that? Percentual differences. Well, let me check. <coughs> the differences depend on the, its target. Actually, the in example, this dark uh, spectral panel was very noisy. Maybe, uh, maybe it was not uh, completely clear, or maybe. I don't know, maybe the, the material was not so Lambertian. Or we have something here, and, and the, the variation of data in this panel was the, the maximum. But uh, in example, in the 80% panel, uh, differences were lower. So, I mean, uh, we, have a, we, we also compute the stand, not only the standard deviation, but also the, the coefficient of variation. And uh, in, it was, in general terms, it, they were similar for the 80% uh, spectral panel and also for the, for the grasp plot vegetation, at least in the visible wavelengths. And it was larger for the 20% spectral on panel. So we, we have also to take that in account, uh, but uh, we, we haven't done it uh, yet, maybe. We can think about that. Yeah, so, so what I usually find quite um, interesting to look at to, for, for an easier comparison, also across the wavelengths, is if I um, do the percent variation over the wavelengths, then it's it's easier to see where you got the biggest deviations. I mean, because if with the absolute like reflectances, it's a bit hard to see um, what, what is really going on in, in terms of also uh, across the wavelengths range. So I think uh, just as a, a nice plot for analysis, I find the, the percentages quite useful. But uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. You mean you mean the you mean the that we should consider the the ninety percent example, the ninety percent probability of uh, no, it's range. it's just a just a normalization to percent of the data. Um, but I'll, I I can also explain it to you in okay. in the next break. So okay, not no worries. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So.
So I have a question for you. Did yeah. you get any feedback for this uh, problem of non-linearity of PP system? Yeah, we were in contact with uh, with them and also with John, and we were uh, I mean, we were working on this, and also we finally asked Nicole and she told us about this ocean optics method to for the correction, and we did it, and we showed the results to John and to PB Systems, and they are working. I mean, they 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 release or they prepare a, a technical note about the, this issue. Uh, I mean, we've been working together and. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's they they did a technical note. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the it was the the outcome of the. Uh, but is it a problem affecting all the instruments or just? Uh, uh, this is a problem that um, I think, and this is a problem that affects uh, maybe the most of the instruments. But the the point is that the uh, well, linearity is something that you have to work mm -hmm. when you build uh, yeah. a sensor. And the, the, in this case, an example, the problem was that the, the, linearity, the linearity is lost at the end of the, at the top of the dynamic range mm -hmm. because you have some switches that try to drain off all the, the overflow of, uh, of signal when the sensor saturates, but they actually overflow. They, they start draining before the overflow is reached. Mm -hmm. So then that's why you are losing this. No? An example, ocean optics uh, sensors are neither linear, but they are, they are corrected in advance. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's why you don't find a problem when you measure because it's already correct. It's automatically automatically corrected. Okay. We did this in in post processing. John? Yeah, I, I would like to add some comments to your question. First, I, I give you a lot of credit for pointing this issue out, Javier. It was uh, really your work that brought this to the attention of PP systems. I tested these sensors years ago; they were fine. I went back and tested my unispecs. One was fine, no problem. Another one had a slight nonlinearity, but only mm. at the very, very top. So it seems that different detectors are different, or, and this is something I hadn't thought about, because you test one and you <coughs> think they're all the same, but they're not. Each instrument really does have to be looked at. And you know, to, the ocean optics, they do provide corrections. They're aware of their problem, but I, somebody else I know who uses that tells me it doesn't work properly, like even though there's a correction, it doesn't work as well as having an instrument that's linear. So it's just a good example of one of these things that when you really dig in, you know, there's a lot of work to do here and we need to work with the industry on these things. Yeah. Sometimes uh, I've, I've been telling that uh, we use different instruments, um, but we sometimes we use the same instrument, <laughs> but it's not exactly the same instrument then, so you get different responses. I think this is an important remark now because optical sampling is not an easy task and it's not you don't you cannot just trust what the the producer tells you and say you 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 purchase an instrument and say okay it works perfectly you you sh you should check every one of your instruments before working with them and that I think that would be a very important uh, outcome no to, to some good practices what do you have you buy an instrument and what do you do then. You just put it on the field and measure. Now, what can you do to check that instrument, to check it over time? And th I think that's a, a, an important issue. No, you, you, don't, you don't have to buy an instrument and just use it and trust what you, what you get. You, you, you have to check it. And everybody should do it so that uh, you can actually know if your instrument is working properly or not. And that's something, that's a, maybe a, a, another question here in this meeting. How can we do that? And, and how can do we do it in an easy way that we don't have to have like huge integrating sphere or something? No, do we do these kind of things in an easy way and also reliable? Yeah, I mean, Alasdair MacArthur <coughs> is uh, the coordinator of working group three, and he's working in the NERC uh, field spectroscopy facility, and he's been telling uh, that uh, within a network, within an established network it would be important to have a sort of central calibration facility to test all instruments within the same lab before uh, starting. I mean, before uh, you start taking your measurements. Yeah. So, and, and then calibrate them on a continuous <coughs> basis. Hmm. Any other questions? It's not really a question, it's a comment related to this uh, discussion about the nonlinearity. It's actually something we have seen e even in satellites. And actually, now uh, most satellites are calibrated uh, accounting for nonlinearity. For instance, Sentinel 2 will have this nonlinearity calibration because I think this is very important. It was neglected in the past, 
basically we assume that everything should be linear, but uh, actually this is not the case. And it was a big discussion with Sentinel-2, but Sentinel-2 will be calibrated, uh, it will be a non-linear core for calibration. And I think the same is true for all the sensors. The main problem is that every sensor is different, and we have seen that even comparing the same instruments in the field, or uh, saying airborne, the instrument had been uh, uh, different behavior for the non-linearity non in particular. Also spectral shifts and other, and other number of things, which makes very difficult the intercomparison between the different instruments. And this came to the last point that was also mentioned by you about the need for calibration facilities, because we are facing the problem that particularly with these kind of spectral resolutions in the order 0.1, and now we have even airborne instruments with 0.1 nanometer resolution, there are no calibration facilities for that at all in Europe. So basically there is no way to intercalibrate the systems because we don't have calibration facilities. And the calibration facilities which are available are good enough for sensors at the resolution of in the best of one, two nanometers. But below that, there is no calibration facility. So we don't know the radiometry, we don't know the spectral stability, we don't know the broadening of the, of the bands, and of course, we don't know the uh, uh, nonlinearity issues. If we just do the comparison at the field level, so by means of field experiment, that's very risky because there are many other things uh, involved. So it will be good to have European facilities for calibration. I think maybe this will be one point for discussion later on because we definitely need that kind of calibration facilities. And this is not available in Europe right now. That's a good point. Any other comment? No comment? Okay, so we could move on to the next presentation. Um, I will give the, this presentation on behalf of um, Alice there. So as I said, I will um, give you some of the outputs uh, of the Working Group 3 Science Industry Interaction Meeting, which is being carried out in Brussels uh, last month. Um, the coordinator of this working group is Alasdair MacArthur, with the working group um, of the Working Group 3, and the um, co-coordinator is Albert Pocar castell from the University of Helsinki. So that was a quite a fruitful meeting. Um, Alasdair MacArthur uh, invited these um, in instrument uh, industries and uh, PP System Sky, Delta T, Electropics, uh, Ocean Optics, and Kip and Zona were were present to this uh, meeting. Um, multispectral, uh, the use of multispectral uh, sensors and instruments and um, also hyperspectral instruments have been uh, presented uh, to the industries. We shared uh, our needs, the needs of the scientific community, and uh, there has been some relevant expressions of interest uh, by some of these industries. So, um, as I said, Working Group 3 is investigating the instruments available to make spectral and especially hyperspectral measurements at the edicovariance towers. And, but as I, say, uh, as I said before, uh, there is no ready-to-use system, so we uh, um, actually uh, we, we don't have any system which is ready to use, and uh, uh, we need a complete system uh, rather than an individual spectrometer. Um, there are some teams who actually uh, are running continuous uh, hyperspectral measurements. Uh, there are three groups who, who have deployed uh, these uh, systems and then developed these prototypes. And uh, one system which has yet not uh, deployed at these uh, flower, uh, um, uh, flux tower sites. So um, we will have more information about these systems later on during 
um, the presentation of uh, William Comfort, Mico Rossini. So uh, we mentioned this uh, document, uh, which uh, has been delivered by Eurospec to uh, ICOS. At the very beginning, we uh, came up with a very general uh, recommendation document. Uh, but now, um, la last year, last uh, month, we delivered this uh, more detailed technical document uh, to ICOS, and uh, I think the, this working group three meeting was really important because uh, um, it uh, raised some questions, uh, which uh, and and also some possible solutions which were uh, actually uh, included in the, in this uh, document. Uh, as I said, th this document has been presented to the ICOS network, and Arno is going to uh, tell more about this ICOS initiative and these uh, mm, including spectral reflectances into this uh, long-term uh, observation uh, infrastructure. So, just uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this uh, document uh, because uh, some of the observations which came out during this meeting actually were included. Uh, we started with some definitions and concepts um, which were um, discussed and then included in the document. We included uh, uh, terminology, uh, reflectance terminology, what we mean by reflectance. Uh, we uh, uh, mentioned directional sampling uh, and uh, also different instrument in co in, uh, config configurations we are uh, using. Um, as uh, John Gammon mentioned before, there are many instruments out there, and some of them are multispectral, su su superspectral, then we have uh, narrowband, multispectral, hyperspectral. And um, using hyperspectral and narrowband uh, products, uh, um, of course, can allow us to calculate some important vegetation indices uh, like PRI or chlorophyll indices, water band indexes. But using a fully hyperspectral instrument, uh, is, it is also, also uh, possible to uh, simulate the satellite bands, so to run uh, uh, calibration and validation activities. So. Uh, we also discussed and then put in this document some general considerations on the operations on the, of these sensors. Temperature sensitivity, uh, I think that the following, following presenters will talk about these of the sensors. And then uh, in-field calibration uh, of the sensors, we talk about this need for a common facility to uh, calibrate uh, this data. And then... Um, we talk about uh, data quality assessment, uh, which is needed uh, within our network. Another issue was the maintenance of the optical sensors, which need to be uh, monitored, uh, calibrated, but sometimes we have uh, some more uh, practical issues like uh, dirt and sensor degradation, and uh, we have to deal with. Um, so, uh, only a few um, instruments, as I say, as I said before, are um, for hyperspectral me measurements only um, prototypes are available, and the industries are actually interested in knowing how many instruments we are going to buy, because they are interested in, uh, in the market. So. I think we, uh, that our community needs uh, an input from ICOS uh, regarding the number of, uh, the possible number of instruments to be deployed at these sites. We were talking about um, uh, a number like 50, uh, 50 uh, sites, 50 level one sites where spectral measurements will be adopted. So other general considerations we've been talking about during the working group three meeting, well, ecosystem heterogeneity uh, is a, a big issue uh, to overtake, as, um, um, as John said before, to overtake these footprint issues, there are several strategies. Uh, the tram system is uh, one of these uh, strategies, 
multi-angular can also be uh, be adopted. I, I would like to mention also wireless uh, sensors, which can be deployed, uh, especially multispectral sensors. Um, setup is another big issue. If we want standardization, we should um, think about a common setup for these measurements, at least a common setup for each canopy type, like a forest or crop, uh, grassland, uh, shrubland, and, and ecosystem. Per, per each different s uh, ecosystem, there should be a sort of common setup. Uh, so John mentioned the BRDF effects, uh, which, was, which are a challenge. And uh, we also mentioned the po potential use of LiDAR uh, or just the um, cameras to acquire ancillary data, which can be used to correct for these effects. So um, at the beginning of this meeting, we talked about multiband multi instrument. Uh, which are measuring a limited number of bands in the visible and near-infrared domain. Uh, of course, these sensors are relatively cheap uh, and uh, they are easier to use. Uh, let's say they are more or less ready to use, although there are some problems when you go in the field and, to, and you install these uh, sensors. Um, so, uh, but there's still some need, uh, some work to be done on these uh, installation and some uh, data uh, quality issues. Uh, of course, in this case, we have a limited number of spectral bands. We are locked into uh, some a limited number of indices for analysis. We also have problems with uh, temperature dependency and stability issues. So, um, what we observed also uh, in these uh, sensors publication is that um, the different uh, teams dif uh, use different bands and they are um, selected uh, on an ad hoc basis by individual groups. So, these measurements vary from site to site with different NDVIs, different indices measured. and. Um, there is uh, a really big limit when it comes to cross comparison, and uh, and the the cho band's choice is generally related to the canopy type and to the canopy characteristics. So basically, when we use these multispectral sensors, we use a very simple. Uh, well, we can use man in very um, dynamic ecosystems. We can use very uh, simple models uh, uh, where GEP is a function of a vegetation index, uh, which is a, a function of uh, FA par. But the level of complexity uh, can be higher. So in for uh, less dynamic ecosystems, normally uh, we uh, also perform uh, PRI measurements. So uh, most of these... Um, uh, of these sensors, basically, uh, multispectral sensors measure uh, NDVI, which is a proxy of uh, FA par, and then uh, uh, both sensors just use PRI, which is a proxy of uh, light use efficiency. Uh, of course, there are more complex models uh, which ma can make use of these uh, of these data, such as biogeochemical models, and this is one of the tasks of our uh, working group uh, four. As I said before, um, uh, on very dynamic ecosystems where FA par is varying a lot throughout the year, we tend to use, um, I mean, uh, we, we use NDVI as a proxy of GEP. This, uh, I'm just showing you some data of the uh, some of the Polish uh, sites. The Brody station is a crop, and as you can see, uh, the, the trend of NDVI uh, is mostly uh, explaining, uh, is it, I mean, the, it's, it is a very dynamic ecosystem, so we can assume that uh, NDVI is giving us a lot of information on 
uh, on GEP. Uh, in other cases within our uh, network, uh, mm, the information actually doesn't come from NDVI, as you can see at the Tuczno station in Poland, uh, the trend of uh, NDVI is quite flat because it's a nevergreen forest. In this case, the, the relevant information comes from, um, from PRI. And there are also some complex trends which uh, need to be investigated, for instance, uh, when it comes uh, to uh, peatlands with a where phenology is, is quite complex, this needs to be investigated. So we've been talking about uh, sky sensors, which we are very uh, widely used within our network. Uh, there is a good uh, technical support. Uh, factory sensors calibration is quite efficient, but um, data flare-ups and, and problems are reported by many PIs. And uh, Arnold uh, Carrara, during one of last our meetings, uh, maybe uh, mentioned that the, the need of a in situ system calibration. Not only the sensor needs to be calibrated, but the system in, in general. There are many different problems like waterproofness, insects, dirt, which has been reported by the Australian partners. And one of the big limits of these sensors is the limited number of, of bands and as I said before the installation is not always so uh, easy. That's just an example of a sky sensor which has been installed in, uh, um, in one of the Polish sites where you can see th that uh, just uh, dirt is one of the problems uh, of these sky sensors. So. Coming to uh, data problems, I would just would like to show you that these trends of uh, uh, PRI. So sometimes we get we got weird data when we stole these sensors some years ago, and then uh, we kind of fixed these problems, and the 2008-2009 data look a little bit better. So there's a problem when you install these sensors. Uh, sometimes you just get nonsense data and it takes some time to realize how uh, to fix this, this kind of problems. So um, we also talked uh, about the crop scan sensors. Uh, my team has uh, installed one of these sensors, uh, which is a kind of one of the outdated uh, sensors, let's say. Uh, the technology is not updated. Uh, it's a super spectral sensor, so it, it provides up to 16 bands, and so it's possible to calculate many spectral vegetation indices. Uh, the good thing is that they uh, provide a procedure for in situ sensor calibration, so you can calibrate uh, your own sensor. Uh, there are problems of waterproofness and and also some software problems because the um, uh, the, the software is quite old is I think it's a basic software or something like this but um, on the other hand the data sets are, are quite promising uh, we we are actually currently working on these data sets and um, we uh, calculated several vegetation indices and we found that GEP is related to um, these uh, uh, chlorophyll indices and we, we, we found some encouraging um, uh, results and so we are going to work more on this uh, crop, crop scan sensor which uh, is a little bit outdated but still gives you uh, in, in interesting results. So. Um, by the second part of the meeting, we focus more on the hyperspectral instruments, uh, which are measuring hundreds of contiguous bands. The advantages of these systems, we all know, and John mentioned these, uh, these advantages, they are, you can get a very a good data set and you can play with a, a radiative transfer modeling and you can calculate narrow band indices, you can simulate bands. 
And of course, uh, there are some disadvantages related to the cost of these sensors, uh, to the higher complex, uh, uh, to the higher level of expertise needed to deploy and, and use these sensors. But of course, we will talk more about these during the next uh, couple of presentations. So just uh, these are the sensors which the systems actually, which are going to be presented now by by Mikol, and this is just uh, has been taken by the ICOS recommendation document. So, the MRI and HSI, which will be presented by Nick Mikol Rossini, then the system, uh, the hyperspectral system designed by the University of Edinburgh, which will be um, presented by William. And then there's also another system which uh, we included in this document, which has been designed by uh, the, nat the Natural Environment Research Council, uh, University of Edinburgh. And then, uh, of course, uh, mm, we will uh, learn more about this uh, mm, NSPEC2 system, and we will also visit the site on, on Friday, so there will be time for, for discussion and actually getting in touch with this uh, instrument. So, challenges for working group three. three. So, uh, the systems can uh, be considered as proof of concept models, but they need refinement. Uh, so, we still have um, no manufacturer appears to have all the required technology, so there is a lot of work to do uh, together with the industries. Uh, we need to understand the performance of these instruments, as we said uh, by, at the end of um, Javier's presentation. We need a field and lab calibration and validation of these uh, hyperspectral, but also multispectral systems. Uh, we need a, a cross-site comparison and full instrument characterization. And uh, during this meeting, um, um, Alasdair presented the NASA Aeronet network as an example of a good example of networking for optical measurements. And then, uh, as a final result, it is necessary to include the spatial domain of measurements and analysis. Uh, to be scaled to the regional and global coverage using optical data acquired from satellite platforms. So we need to uh, connect these ground measurements um, performed at the Eddy Covariance Towers and use them as a validation uh, facility uh, for the um, uh, satellite platforms. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions. So, 34. Any questions? Are we still in the progress of trying to figure out uh, which of these will become maybe a standard, um, or, or is or is it just choosing the one with with the least problems? Or <laughs> so it's it's um, it's a good question. I think uh, that after the next presentations, we we will have uh, some more uh, information uh, about you know, these issues, this kind of issues. Uh, the feeling is that there are three uh, instruments, as there are three instruments currently uh, running uh, the European level, we might use these uh, systems as a sort of pseudo standard, as John mentioned. So we are, we are not going to ask uh, everybody, All right, let's use just one instrument because it would be just a, a nonsense, but just providing a number of instruments and maybe being open to uh, other possibilities as much as possible. And so, as I said before, the 
Haikus is, is going to run for 20 years. So uh, innovation is going to be a, an issue. So we should remind ICOS that in five years or seven years, we should uh, review the state of the art of the measurements and maybe in, in, in some of these level one sites, just uh, uh, change the standards, basic, mm -hmm. basically. And, and to answer again to uh, your question, uh, actually, We've been talking a lot about these uh, standards, these instruments, and and actually we got an expression of interest by Kippenzonen and Electropics, Electropics, right? So uh, and and they're not actually working on hyperspectral radiometers. So uh, the I the interesting thing is that we got more interest by companies who are not actually uh, manufacturing uh, hyperspectral sensors, but imagery um, sensors or the Kippenzonen or, you know, just uh, uh, radiation uh, measurements. So it was quite interesting to see that, you know, we were sitting in front of PP system and ocean optics, and we got expressions of interest by people who are actually not into this field. So as John said, uh, there is some innovation going on, and if you're stuck into one instrument, you might just get uh, lose this uh, opportunity to move on. Uh, maybe a follow-up question. Is there, uh, w what is actually the goal of the accuracy we are looking for? How many percent of uncertainty could we tolerate? Or, I mean, is there a threshold? Yeah, uh, that, that's another big question. I think this will be, it's, uh, it's supposed to be the main outcome of the working group two uh, by the end of the action, which is going to end in uh, 18 months or, or so. So we should, uh, in, the, in this protocol, we are going to deliver, by the end of the action, we should also include uh, these, um, uh, this information about the what we, could we, what we can accept as a an error. This in issue of working with industry is is an important one, and you've indicated some challenges. Um, it seems to me that one of the best things this group can do is come up with some recommendations for industry um, as a target and something that could be sent to all these manufacturers. And, and then we can see who responds. Uh, sometimes you don't get the response right away because they're very reluctant to commit in a public forum. But really the, what matters is what do they do over time? Do mm -hmm. they meet your goals and meet your needs um, eventually? And there are some companies that will do that even though they don't show that interest. And there's new companies that haven't been mentioned here that have some very promising designs that want to get into this area. And they, they're not there yet. So those companies should be part mm -hmm. of the list as well. So I, I see big opportunities here because I, I believe ultimately we do have to work with industry um, to to reach these solutions. Um. Yeah, I mean it's quite. Um, I found it quite uh, interesting that ASD, for instance, didn't participate because they have a target and they have a, uh, you know one of the best. They have very good systems out in the market so maybe they are not interested in moving uh, anywhere you know different from their field so there yeah there's a certain laziness that sets in when people become the providers of standards and this is a danger in setting standards is you you're going to settle on a company that will become lazy um, and they won't provide the good service in the future and uh, the aeronet um, people complained about that in a recent meeting because they feel that that's happened to the companies that provide their sensors. It's a good example of standardization, but an example of problems that emerge when you do standardize and industry gets lazy. Question. Yes, about the, this relationship with the companies, uh, I think uh, it's very important to address the proper company. I have recently some discussions with ASD because they are becoming interested on developing operational instruments for fluorescence. And I have, it was very interesting to discuss with them how they approach the problem, because obviously they are looking for the customers. 
So they want to know how many people can buy the instrument later on, and then compromise on quality, of course. And I, but I think the discussion is open. The other company which I, I have been in recently in contact with, Simmel, because they, they developed the instrument for Ironet, and they are now looking for the possibility of developing something similar for our field, and they are open as well. And there are other companies around which are developing yeah. things. So I think it will be very important to, to keep the discussion ongoing. But of course, they want to keep some quality because they have some prestigious or some yeah, yeah, uh, sure. sector by the community. And on the other hand, we have to set very carefully the requirements. And this was my second comment because the requirements, I think, will, very, will be different if we talk about the absolute calibration, which uh, we have to set something because we have to say if this 5% will be enough or 10% mm -hmm. or 2% because that will be... A, a completely different instrument for, for the industry. Mm -hmm. But uh, probably more important is the interbank calibration. Because if you have a, a bias in the absolute calibration, maybe we can tolerate that or we can correct for that. But mm -hmm. the interbank calibration is very tricky because the indices even will be affected by that. Mm -hmm. This is a reason in favor of the spectrometers of the hyperspectral systems uh, against the multiband systems. Because for multiband systems, even if you have only two bands, it's very difficult to warranty the stability of individual bands. While for hyperspectral systems, even if you have a bias, global bias, still the interbank calibration can mm -hmm. be better controlled. So I think these two aspects, the, the, link, the links to the industry, keep, keep the discussion ongoing, and the, uh, for our community to clearly set what are the requirements, what we need, because we mm -hmm. cannot go to the industry and say, we want, we want an instrument, but we don't know it could be 2% or 10%, that, that, will, that will kill ourselves because we need to go with a very clear message. We need this calibration facility, this, this uh, calibration performance, this interbank calibration, and I don't know if this, we will be at the point of uh, providing these uh, specific requirements for the industry. I would like to make a point also here, uh, as you mentioned, ISD. And I think that it's very important that the, the instruments you use are transparent, are open. And we know where the data come from and uh, who are the process inside the instrument. Because uh, we are being very exigent, we are very, very demanding of these instruments. And we cannot be happy only with a black box that you put an input and get an output and, and you don't know where, how has it been processed and, and what has happened inside there. So I think this is also a point we should make to the industries. We want to have the raw data. We want to have all the control of the data because then we find problems, then we have a, something that we want to know. And if you have a black box, you don't know what's going on. And maybe your data are worthless. So I think this is also a, a thing we should consider. Yeah. I mean, um, I just would like to take the chance to say that uh, Alice de Macarto is the new, let's say, uh, coordinator of Working Group 3, and he's doing a really good job uh, because he knows all these um, industries' representatives. Uh, he knows them, he's in contact with them, so he managed to, to get them to come apart from ASD. And, um, and as you, you know him, he's doing a really good job because he's, um, uh, I mean, he's telling them these sort of problems we need to to know what uh, uh what's behind the the these systems and he's doing a really good job and and showing also that the asd uh has got some limitations uh so, so in uh, one of his uh, last presentations he just showed um some problems related with the mercedes you know of the of the spectrometers like the asd uh, so I think he's the right person and he will organize a meeting because this, this meeting uh, was just uh, uh, as a scientific community, we are explaining to the industries what are our needs and they didn't show anything. They were just asked to uh, take home this message and then we will organize another meeting where some of them or maybe on a, a separate basis maybe uh, will uh, come up and say, uh, express their interest in developing or just a new instrument or just upgrading the instrument. So uh, I think that Alas there will uh, organize a follow up uh, very soon. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, mostly related to how the, uh, the remote sensing community has kind of taken direction. The first one is you mentioned about using uh, 
LiDAR and cameras f as to calculate, to get some ancillary data for the sites. Are you also considering radar type measurements because a lot of the satellite community has kind of moved quite a bit in that direction and creating some high level derived products uh, from those. Uh, the second question is in terms of the calibration, there has been a lot of discussion on that and I'm wondering if this community has, has looked into uh, creating like a data product with calibration information and maybe um, uh, kind of incorporating them as, as quality flags in the data. So, so what's the direction that, that this community is, is looking into kind of taking the calib calibration information and then passing it on to the data users? Well, as it comes to radar, uh, I think that's one of the possible uh, ancillary data sets we could use uh, Within the within the community, that's that's for sure. Coming to the calibration, uh, for now we we more thought about. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We we thought about a central facility was going to uh, calibrate this network, which is uh, going to be very small at the very beginning, uh, at the very beginning of ICOS, and then expanding. Of course, there's a lot of work involved with with it, and uh, we we we. Still didn't figure out how this uh, facility should be structured. If th there is going to be uh, one uh, calibration facility in Europe, which is calibrating, and of course there is a problem of, of, of funding. So I think we will have to address this these problems once ICOS is is going to uh, to say yes. Okay, now we can start with. Uh, with spectral measurements, uh, of course, we will have to buy the instruments and and uh, and provide detailed protocols. But uh, before we start, we need to know how to calibrate our instruments. And from what we've seen, uh, it's it's better to do this uh, before you start. Do you think that that's the direction for calibration? From what I know, the idea for now is to to have a, a sort of central facility for calibration. But this is just a, a very preliminary phase of the process. We are still trying to set up some pseudo standards. and But we, we, we that's a good point. I mean, by the end of this action, we should also come up with a sort of structure for calibration facilities within uh, ICOS. Yes, and one last comment from my side. The, uh, concern, well, first, concerning calibration, I think the discussion is there. Maybe in the discussion session, we have to go back to this yeah. because I think Eurospec can play a role. I think the calibration possibilities exist, but somebody has to take the, the action to, to put the calibration in place, and maybe it's something to be discussed. I would like to mention something about the LIDARs because I think radars can play a role here, but uh, it will not be easy to implement that on the tower. However, there is a discussion ongoing about the LIDARs, and there are three LIDARs playing here uh, some role. One is the structure of the canopy, which could be one possibility just to have mm -hmm. a sonar scanning LIDAR to give a description of the, of the canopy surrounding the towers, or, mm -hmm. or at least in the, in the area. There is a second discussion on LIDARs because it's about the aerosol height. The, when you go to resolutions in the order of zero point something, then the radiation on the surface becomes very much dependent on the height of the aerosols, not only the optical thickness. And for measuring the height of the, of the aerosol layers, then you need a LIDAR, but the aerosol LIDAR, which is a different mm -hmm. LIDAR. Yeah. And there is another discussion about LIDAR, which is concerning the, aeros the CO2 concentration, because for people working on CO2 concentration, it will be nice to have the vertical column of, of CO2, and there are possibilities now to have this kind of LIDARs, but of course it's a different kind of LIDAR. So I think it would be important to clarify that uh, we have three different LIDARs at least, and um, maybe mm, we can make recommendation what is the most important for us. Uh, but of course, I think LIDARs will play a role in, in, in the whole discussion. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I was just mentioning the, the role of LIDAR for structure. Uh, and uh, But of course, uh, the other two options you mentioned are quite interesting. The other important point for LIDARs is this one instrument which is not easy to move from one place to another. So if you install something, uh, I mean, there are some instruments which are easy to move to the field and then you can deploy on campaign basis. There are some instruments which are very tricky to move because 
and LIDARs is one of them. So maybe the idea of installing a LIDAR somewhere, it will be a good uh, opportunity. Okay, shall we move to the next presentation maybe and leave some time for discussion? Uh, hello everyone, um, I'm William Cornforth from University of Edinburgh, I'm a PhD student. Um, my supervisor, Dr. Caroline Nicole, which um, some of you may know, uh, sent me here to talk about her and her colleagues system to get automated spectral measurements at a field site in southern Finland, Hitiala. Um I haven't actually worked at all really on this, um, but please ask questions, of course. Um, so you can see in this picture the flux tower in the center and then a smaller tower for the for the ocean optics boxes so the objectives um, which have been discussed uh, you want long-term measurements with minimal interve uh, intervention easy to maintain and calibrate uh, and you ideally want it from off-the-shelf technology and any additional flexibility is of course um, useful so the system requirements for this were to get both radiance and irradiance measurements. Um, so this was done with a dual field of view configuration. Um, and the repeat interval, ideally you want that to be adjustable. You don't need so many um, in the later, that towards the beginning and end of the seasons, and you want one, uh, I don't know, every five minutes, uh, in the summer, perhaps. Uh, high spectral resolution and sampling, high radiometric stability, it's all um, one of those things that everyone uh, wants for their systems. Uh, it's always restricted by cost and reliable over extended periods, so you can have um, the system set up over many years without having to, to do too much um, to, to fix problems. So as I mentioned, this is a dual field of view configuration. Uh, there are two ocean optics boxes being used, and they're in an insulated box with heat pads, fans, and a uh, heat sink, so that you have the radiometric stability, um, and a temperature controller and probe connected to the heat pads. And uh, this was outside the insulated box, obviously, and then also the AC-DC power transformer. Uh, and a notebook which was not on the tower, but this was at the, 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 the field station. So the, at the end of the two meter optical fibers, there's one fitted with a cosine diffuser to get downwelling solar irradiance, and then a, a bare optical fiber with a 25 field degree field of view. But you can put, um, you can restrict that with. Uh, you can adapt that to get a narrower field of view. This is, well, as was, has been mentioned, you can use LIDAR to, to get ancillary data, and this is one of the uses to see exactly what the field of view is picking up. Um, I've just overlaid the LIDAR image on the top left on the, on the, the aerial image, and I think I've read that it's a 400 meter squared um, uh, canopy that is picking up. I'm not quite sure if that's right. It doesn't look 400 meters squared. And also, it is mostly um, the the canopy that is picking up. Although in the image in the bottom left, you can see that it's, it's quite possible that it's picking up uh, reflection off the, the ground. Um, this is a, a s about a 280-degree azimuth and 70-degree uh, looking down. This is inside the insulated box with the ocean optics 
uh, systems. There are two USB 2000 plus boxes in there. And the heat sink at the bottom. Fans, one inside, one outside. I think it's just the inside one that's important. The outside one isn't necessary. The USB cables is, is quite difficult to see both, but there are two in there They're connected to the ocean optics boxes, that one behind the other. Uh, temperature probe at the back, which is connected to the, the temperature controller outside. This is the insulating board. I think it's urethane foam that's being used and power connectors for the for the fan, I think. And this these are heat pads also connected to the temperature controller and optical fibers and also copper strips to help with maintain the relatively constant heat. This is the outer enclosure. You can see the inner enclosure in the bottom half of the outer enclosure. And there's also space for the notebook, although this isn't kept in this box at the Hitiala site, I've been told. Uh, the temperature control is at the top there, and you can see on the bottom left the, the box in relation to the to the irradiance and radiance optical fibers. They could, one restriction here is uh, two meter cables. You can't really have anything longer than that. Otherwise you start losing, you, you have problems with signal to noise, etc. So you can't get that any higher. This, it, the, this is the, um, some of the, the features of the ocean optics box. It's very small, no moving parts. Uh, it's, a lot of it is user configurable. Uh, the, the sensors is a uh, linear CCD array, and it's what well, it says high performance, but I'm not quite sure how high performing it is. This, you can see the spectral sensitivity of the, the sensor on the bottom right. Uh, it does drop off quite a bit to on either side. <clears throat> the operating range is between minus 10 and 50, but you obviously want to keep that as stable as possible at one of those temperatures. And it can communicate with different interfaces, USB 2, RS 232, I2C, and SPI. But USB 2, I think, is the most commonly used. It's very easy to use. And it also has three external triggering modes. But for this case, we are only using the normal uh, triggering mode. This, this is the configuration that was used with the, the grating that was ordered. It has a spectral range between 350 and 1,000 nanometers, but as we can see later, the, the noise at, uh, at, at either side uh, of the peak, around 575 nanometers, the sensitivity is really quite poor, and so you get noise at both ends. The full width at half max is one nanometer, and spectral sampling about a third of a nanometer. Integration time can be anywhere between a millisecond and over a minute. The For this system, there was a software built specifically for it, and the acquisition frequency could be set between anywhere uh, around a minute to 60 minutes, and it has been in continuous operation since March 2010. I say continuous, but it's only really May to September that you get uh, acquisitions. You wouldn't find much use of a spectra of, a, of the image on the right there, and we're using uh, USB 2 communication and power. Uh, this is a picture of the site, pictures of the site uh, in the winter. You can see the system gets completely frozen over and any efforts to to heat it and get rid of the ice is futile and freezes over instantly at minus 20, minus 30. Um, and it survived the freezing over, the f fibers were fine afterwards, which was a relief. This is another thing I think that was done with the LiDAR analysis. You can see uh, roughly how much of the of the field of view is in shade for different azimuth and zenith angles. Um, for most of the year, I think it's uh, below 0.5 shade, which is reasonable. So the software that was built by Guillaume Drolet, I think, uh, was done with the OmniDriver spectroscopy development platform, which is a paid-for thing from Ocean Optics, and it was built in Java, but it can run on any platform. Uh, it has a 
intuitive graphical user interface that's relatively easy to use and the acquisition parameters are all configurable and it can also produce some diagnostic plots which are useful. This is what the software looks like. You can, well, one of the, this is just with one of the boxes connected, but you'd have two uh, connected, so there should be two there. And the parameters configurable all here. The one of the best, or one of the, the most useful features of this software is the auto-optimize function, which uh, it automatically sets the, the, in, in, the integration time uh, for the box. I think it gets about 80% of the, it goes, so it configures the integration time so that uh, you have a eight, at least 80% for the maximum response, uh, for eight, at least 80% of the maximum response for, uh, for the highest, for the wavelength with the, the largest response, and it also has the midpoint for both the irradiance and radiance lined up so that it's taken at a synchronous time. This is the diagnostic plots that you can do just to check everything's working before you leave the site. It can uh, look at the last five measurements taken and it changes with the what's coming in. I think this is a shows the changes from a clear day to sky, to clouded sky. And this is the temperature stability of the box. It didn't uh, go more than uh, one degree above or below the mean throughout uh, the months July and August when you had maximums 32 and minimum 5.7, which is is quite impressive. I think it was done before at 30 degrees, but this, it wouldn't maintain that, st that stable a temperature. So at 43 and a half degrees, uh, it really can maintain a stable, much more stable temperature, which is important for the radiometric stability. It's also possible to do cloud screening. There's a shortwave radiation sensor on the same tower as the ocean optics boxes. So you can determine from that sensor when there's a uh, clear sky and just take the measurements from that. It's just one of the things that's possible. This shows the radiometric calibration, which was done with the ocean optics um, radiation source and you can see how important it is to do this re relatively regularly. It does change quite a lot and the, ma the pattern matches the, the spectral, the sensitivity of the sensor which is to be expected. Um, this is just a, a plot of the reflectance of the Scots pine forest there. You can see it. it's as to be expected, except you do have a considerable amount of noise above around 780 nanometers and below 500 nanometers. So I think it's not possible to use any parts above 780 and below 500 nanometers uh, for analysis, but that still means you can get fluorescence and PRI, etc., from this. Um, this is the same graph, but for different times of the day, and this is irradiance and radiance measurements, uh, and apparently it, it all works very well. Uh, to conclude, the, as I haven't done any work on this, I, it's important to acknowledge all the people, Caroline, Nicole, Guillaume Drolet, Tom Wade, and the colleagues at uh, University of Helsinki, and of course, um, at the field spectroscopy facility, there's Alison McArthur and Chris McLennan, who worked hard to calibrate the ocean optics boxes. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Um, is that the, the instrument or is it the lamp that's... The lamp is calibrated to NIST. Uh, but but how stable is that lamp? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I think that might have been calibrated to at the field spectroscopy facility to something which is also calibrated to the... I forgot what the UK standard is. It's um, the NPL, I think, in... 
Yeah, I'm just not sure that that particular one is designed to be used as a calibration standard, and if it, it, that it's stable enough for that. Um, but I mean, these applications really do bring up the question of stability. So, in, uh, related questions are the dark have to do with the dark current and the um, deriving a absolute reflectance using spectral on or whatever methods. Um, how is that done in this system? You know, when you have an automated system, is is it electronic dark current? Is that how that's done? And well, there's I think there's two dark currents that are measured. There's the this this does it can take an electric dark current to the at the bottom left. That box isn't ticked in this example, and then it also takes a dark spectrum acquisition with the rest of the the pixels on the array. At and that's just the time when. Um, there shouldn't be any light, but in the summer in Finland you do have light even at 2 in the morning or the day time. So I'm not sure how reliable the dark current is in this scenario. And, and in terms of reflectance, um, I mean, yeah. is there somebody up there with a panel or do you know how that's done? I ha haven't been explained how the reflectance <laughs> was done, but I assume it wouldn't be too hard to stick a spectral panel underneath it to get to get that information. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't answer that question probably, but I can get back to you if I speak to Caroline about that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to see that you have different problems than the ones that we have in Cáceres. So you have problems with the cold <laughs> winter mm. and we have problems with the hot summer. Yeah. Um, you say that in both systems you are not using multi-angular measurement, just only nadir mm -hmm. measurement. So, oh, well, so 70 degrees, I think. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm. Did you consider the possibility of doing those multi-angular measurements? Because you told that you are observing a quite small area, and one of the key points is how representative are those um, point measurements we use in hyperspectral or multispectral sensors in the flux tower, how representative are they from the footprint of the tower? So how are you dealing with that? Right. Uh, I'm not sure what the foot, how, how it's done in practice, but I know that it is possible to, to change the, the degree that the arm is, is pointing at. Mm -hmm. and one restriction for this size is that I think it just can't be raised any further, which also limits what it can look at. But um, yeah, other than that, I'm not really sure how what the best way is to get around problems of footprint and and uh, the site. Yeah, sorry, I can't answer that question. Yeah, it's properly. a <laughs> difficult <laughs> so, question. Yeah, I haven't worked on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you please go back to one of these um, reflectance plots you had just like two slides back or something? Um, I wonder how this was uh, computed. It seems that this one spike at 7, I guess, 62 or something uh, is sort of connected to the oxygen A band, presumably. And if that would be true, then this would point to the fact that there's somehow a spectral shift. That, that's usually what happens if you do atmospheric correction, you've got a spectral shift. Um, so practically, it would mean that uh, the reflectance is computed from an irradiance which was uh, measured by a different instrument or something, I would expect. Well, apparently the reflectance here was calculated from the irradiance and radiance measurements. Um, I have the equation in here, but it would just be a regular. And, and that, that sure. would be the, the same instrument sampling that, or? Yeah, it, I think it is the same, yeah. the ocean optics. That, that's kind of bizarre why you would well, or, or maybe it's a time difference, or I mean, usually you don't get that. For example, with the ISDs, if you do a spectral on panel and then you do the, 
the measurement of the irradiance and the, I mean the reflected irradiance and the target radiance, then you, this usually cancels out in a way. Sorry, I don't think I can um, able to answer that question, but maybe somebody else here, I think, <laughs> probably can. Yeah, I think, I mean, you, this discussion points out that, you know, two measurements or two detectors looking up and down inevitably have some slight problem with that area. And I think that's very diagnostic of your measurement issues. Uh, I think it's a useful clue. Um, it's just like the noise is useful information, like the levels on the left and the right that most people throw away. I think we can learn a lot by using the data that we normally don't use to tell us something about the quality of our data. And uh, I think uh, when you're doing dual, you know, up and down measurements, that often shows up as slight problems in these areas. And that maybe that's what you're referring to. But uh, thank you. So thank it's both a problem and an opportunity. Thank you. As you can imagine, I am very sensitive to this particular problem because this is exactly from where we get fluorescence. So any error in this particular region will translate into fluorescence, but usually what you will see is the peak upward because if you take the ratio over a reference, then the excess uh, reflectance will be uh, fluorescence but then should be the peak up and not down, which is here. So this should be an instrumental problem. But in any case, I am very interested in solving this problem because we will not get any credibility about fluorescence if we are having this kind of troubles with the instruments. So we should calibrate, calibrate the instruments properly and do the measurements properly if we want to show that we are able to detect fluorescence. And this is a key issue because there, there is a part of which is noise, spectral noise or radiometric noise or some noise, and part which is a real signal, which is the fluorescence. And this is why we want to separate that. And, and I think this is a, an area where we should work very carefully because if we have these kind of noises in the data, then forget about retrieval of fluorescence. Thank you. Miko, who is going to talk about fluorescence in the next talk? <laughs> Taken because by Ocean Optics. I think Optics. that this problem is related to the fact that you are using two different spectrometers one looking up and the other one looking down. We have tried to do the same with two different spectrometer, but even if uh, their technical characteristics uh, are the same, are not really the same. And so we okay. choose to try using a, a single spectrometer, but moving the, um, uh, the optical fiber, one's looking up and the other one's looking down in order to reduce the error associated with changing the detector to measure the upwelling and the downwelling fluxes. And I think that is a spectral um, shift between uh, the two spectrometers you are using uh, to measure the incident and the upwelling radiance, I think. And that's uh, a reliable solution to this, probably, you think? <laughs> In our case, it's easier because we can use uh, the radiant spectra to infield calibrate the spectrometer. For example, we have some uh, small shift in temperature during the season, and uh, looking at the radiance signal, you can um, mm, characterize uh, how big is the shift during the season. In your case, I think that the only thing you can, the one thing that you can do in field is to put a white reference panel behind the down looking fiber. Sometimes, I don't know, every two weeks, I don't know how it's feasible. And to look on the white reference panel, the position of the spectral lines, the absorption spectral lines in the irradiance. Yeah. I, I don't know if uh, the. It Maybe <laughs> you can yeah. find other solution, but... All I know is that just the radiometric and wavelength calibration is done with the... I think for wavelength, they use argon mercury lamp and the radi radi uh, radiative uh, calibration. It's just that ocean optics lamp. Yeah, we use it. So at the beginning of the season, we use the, cali the wavelength calibration lamp, but do you, if, you, mm. if your spectrometer stay outside for one year, is 
probably the calibration will shift yeah. and only a small shift if uh, you are trying to measure fluorescence can uh, have an effect on the fluorescent measurement. So I think that yeah. it's better to think uh, uh, on a way to have a constant characterization of your spectral. Mm. Uh, I think the calibrations are only done once a month, but that's probably not, it doesn't solve this problem, so. Yeah. In our case, the uh, full width was 0 0.1 nanometer, and it was impossible to calibrate the two spectrometers. Even if you try to, to use the lamp, but it's impossible to, do, to find the function linking the two spectral channels. I don't know if in uh, your case uh, is a problem of the spectral calibration of the functions that you use to uh, correct the, to calibrate the, the spectrometer, I don't know. I have a question actually, do you use a cosine diffuser on the, your, your arm that goes up and down? Uh, in one instrument we have the cosine for above the up and the down, and in the other case now we are using uh, an integrating sphere for the up mm -hmm. and the bare fiber for the down. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> Shall we move to the next presentation? So thank you, William, thank you. for your presentation. So now we're talking about fluorescence. <laughs> so it's a, an ideal continuation of Hi, I'm Mico Rossini from the University of Milano Bicocca, and uh, my presentation <laughs> deals with the use of spe hyperspectral measurement of uh, reflectance indices and uh, fluorescence to estimate uh, GPP in two different uh, terrestrial ecosystems. So the objective of this presentation are to investigate the possibility of monitoring carbon fixation from high spectral resolution field spectroscopy measurements and to evaluate the more effective indices for the estimation of um, a gross primary production based on a light use efficiency model. Uh, maybe you already know the, the light use efficiency model formulation, but it says that the gross primary production of an ecosystem can be estimated as uh, the product between the light use efficiency term and the photosynthetically active radiation absorbed by the vegetation, and we can uh, also estimate the APAR as the product between the fraction of uh, radiation absorbed by ve the vegetation and the incident photosynthetically active radiation. This model is widely used in, uh, in the remote sensing community because all uh, its uh, input parameters can be in principle derived from remote sensing measurements. For example, uh, there are uh, a lot of studies showing that the FAPR can be estimated using uh, vegetation indices related to the canopy greenness, like for example the NDVI. And uh, a more challenging is the estimation of the light use efficiency using uh, hyperspectral measurements. Two methods have been proposed up to now to estimate light use efficiency. The first one is uh, using the PRI index that tracks the uh, xanthophyll epoxidation cycle that is related to the photoprotection and uh, uh, the interconversion of the pigments of the xanthophyll cycle um, uh, determines a reflectance change at seven at 531 nanometer, and these reflectance changes can be uh, used in the PRI to have an estimation of the use of the absorbed light. And uh, a lot of study up to now have found uh, a good relationship between light use efficiency and PRI on different spatial scale from the leaf to the ecosystem and also from in different uh, temporal scale. 
The other uh, way with the remote sensing to estimate the light use efficiency is based on the use of the chlorophyll fluorescence that is uh, emitted from the core of the photosynthetic machinery and this is directly correlated to the efficiency of photosynthesis. However, the fluorescence has a small uh, contribution to the reflected light and, is not, and cannot be measured with classic spectroscopy. In this example, uh, I show a reflectance spectra acquired, for example, with an ASD uh, field spec with a full width at half maximum of 3.5 nanometer, and we can uh, see only a small uh, contribution at the 760 nanometer due to the fluorescence. But uh, if we use a spectrometer with higher resolution, for example, uh, ocean optics, in this case, the, resolution, the higher resolution in the uh, around the oxygen A band is uh, 0 0.1 nanometer, and we can see a, a great peak on the near infrared plateau, and this peak is uh, due to chlorophyll fluorescence. We can measure chlorophyll fluorescence because the um, uh, so the um, solar and our atmosphere present some uh, um, strong absorption features, and two of these features can be used to estimate uh, uh, fluorescence because they are quite close to the emission maxima of chlorophyll fluorescence that are the oxygen A band and at 760 nanometer and the oxygen B band at 787. Uh, the method used to estimate fluorescence in these oxygen absorption bands is um, named for Fraunhofer line depth method. And this method consists in decoupling the two contributions that compose the signal measured by the spectrometer, the reflected flux and the emitted flux. The standard Fraunhofer line depth method is based on the measurements of the spectral uh, irradiance coming from the sun and the spectral radiance upwelling from the target in two uh, wavelengths, one in the, in the well of the oxygen absorption band at 760 nanometer and uh, the other one outside the absorption band. So, uh, solving the system on the right hand side of the um, of the slide, we can end using a um, wavelength inside and outside the um, oxygen absorption band. We can try to estimate the fluorescence. The major limitation of uh, this basic method is uh, the assumption of the constant fluorescence and reflectance in the two uh, wavelength, but if we have uh, a higher number of bands, if we have an hyperspectral measurement, like the one provided by the, the line by the ocean optic spectrometer, we can assume a linear variation of the reflectance and the fluorescence around the oxygen band. And uh, we can use, for example, in our case, uh, more than 400 nanometer to um, more than far, far, um, 400 bands to solve uh, the, the system and uh, to estimate the fluorescence. I will present two study case, case. The first one is a subalpine grassland and the second one is an alfalfa field. The subalpine grassland is located in Tornion, that is on the northwestern north side of the Italian Alps. And, um, um, the snow pre f we have collected measurements only in the snow-free period that lasts from uh, uh, May to November. And uh, to take spectral measurements, we use uh, a handmade uh, prototype that is called uh, hyperspectral irradiometer. And this system is based on a rotating arm that observes the sky and the target su surface with a cosine response optic. In this way, we can estimate the hemispherical reflectance factor. And uh, with such optics, the area seen by the spectrometer is about 10 meter diameter. Spectral measurements were acquired every five minutes uh, using two different uh, HR4000 um, HR spectrometer. In this talk, I will focus uh, for uh, this uh, case study only on the, the result obtained with the 
spectrometer having a resolution of one nanometer and covering the spectral range 300-1000 nanometer. In the site we have collected uh, a lot of field measurements, green and total above, above ground biomass, leaf area index, we have a visual estimation of the greenness through natural photos, we have also a webcam belonging to the Phenocam network, and uh, during uh, 2010, we have also collected uh, measurements of um, chlorophyll and carotenoid contents, and this site is equipped with an ID and meteor towers, allowing to have uh, um, gross primary production uh, estimation and uh, um, characterization of the meteorological condition. This is uh, an example of the CO2 fluxes between the atmosphere and the vegetation measured with the eddy covariance technique. And uh, in the graph you can see the, the, the seasonal trend of, for example, air temperature, uh, photochemical uh, active radiation and precipitation during two years of study, 2009 and 2010. Both the eddy fluxes and the meteorological variable are measured uh, every 30 minutes. In this uh, study, we test different formulation of the light use efficiency model, and this formulation differs based on the um, method we choose to estimate the light use efficiency and uh, the APAR based on uh, remote sensing data. We test uh, different models with an increasing uh, requirements of uh, data input and complexity. The first kind of model estimate the GPP as a direct re relationship with uh, vegetation indices related to the canopy greenness, and in particular, we test the use of the normalized different vegetation indexes and the Meris terrestrial chlorophyll index that is related to chlorophyll content. A second version of the model is based on a direct relationship between the GPP and the product between the Y related to the greenness and the PAR. And in this case, the input parameter, the PAR, is derived by the meteorological station installed in the field. A more complex uh, model uh, estimates uh, GPP like the product of a constant epsilon and uh, um, the FA par estimated as a function of uh, a Y related to the greenness and the par. And the last model tried to estimate also the light use efficiency model, uh, uh, also the light use efficiency terms as a function of the photochemical reflectance index. And uh, we have test different reference band and we choose uh, the four uh, bands derived by the MODIS sensor that the have been used in uh, recent literature to estimate PRI on uh, a satellite uh, spatial scale. To take into account the nonlinear relationship between GPP and PAR, we then test also the inclusion of the, logarith of the logarithmic of PAR um, in the model formulation. These are the eddy covariance and meteor time series of the two years of studies. So we have the PAR that serves as an input of the light use efficiency model. We have estimated an uh, FA PAR green uh, using uh, multiplying the FA PAR by the um, um, greenness estimated by an adiral picture to take into account the yellowing of the canopy during the senescence. We have the GPP estimated directly from the um, CO2 fluxes provided by the eddy covariance tower. And then we compute also a light use efficiency green as the ratio between the GPP and the uh, APAR green. This is an example of uh, the data collected with the uh, spectral spectrometer during 2009. It has been operated for 130 days. In this case, as an example, the NDVI plot uh, is uh, shown. And uh, we can see both a seasonal variation and the diurnal variation. And it's quite interesting that the shape of the um, diurnal uh, trend of the NDVI changed during the season with uh, changes in the uh, structure of the canopy. 
For this reason, we have choose to uh, use uh, um, as the input parameter of the latitude efficiency model only the average data acquired around noon. These are the um, seasonal trend of the midday NDVI, MTCI, and two different formulation of PRI. The first one based on a red reference band, and the second one based on a green reference band. And uh, correlating these measurements with uh, field uh, data, we have found that the um, NDVI, in uh, this case, is the best estimator of LAI and FE para green. The MTCI is the index uh, showing the higher relationship with the chlorophyll content. And the PRI, based on a reference band in the green region, is the best estimator of the lettuce efficiency green. In this uh, grassland ecosystem, the PRI indices index based on the red reference band is uh, better related to chlorophyll content rather than the lettuce efficiency. Based on this um, relationship between the different indices, we have applied all the set of models I presented at the beginning on the two years of data, and we can see that uh, the first model was the one assuming a direct relationship between GPP and MTCI, and uh, we can observe that we have already higher um, performances of the model with um, uh, a quite low uh, root mean square error. Increasing the complexity of the model, the, the performances uh, in GBP estimation slightly increase. And uh, another thing uh, we can uh, note is that the, the inclusion of the par term slight, um, tend to decrease the performances of the model, while if we use the uh, logarithm of the par, the performances of the model tend to increase and are similar to the uh, direct relationship uh, obtained with model one. The model that performs better is the model using the MTCI for the estimation of the FA par, PRI for the estimation of the light use efficiency, and uh, uh, logarithm of par as the meteorological data. Uh, the R square of the model is quite similar to the previous one, but it's quite in interesting that the um, uh, IC coefficient, that is a, a coefficient taking to account the uh, complexity of the model, tend to decrease uh, even if uh, this last model is, um, is based on a higher number of parameters, but it seems that uh, um, the um, increasing performance in estimating GPP compensate the uh, higher number of parameters required by this uh, last uh, model. These are, uh, for example, the uh, gross primary production uh, simulated with the best performing model for the two years of study. And we can see that the um, GPP simulated with remote sensing input agree quite well with uh, uh, GPP measured with the eddy covariance technique in respect to both the amplitude and the seasonal phase and a significant linear relationship between the eddy covariance GPP and uh, R and remote sensing GBP with a, uh, an R square of 0 0.9 and slope not far from one uh, was obtained. The other case study is uh, an alpha-alpha field, and this uh, campaign was conducted in uh, the framework of the Sentinel-3 experiment uh, founded by the ESA. And uh, in this case, uh, we use uh, a different spectral system and uh, also, this system hosts uh, two different um, HR4000 spectrometer. The first one with uh, a spectral resolution of one nanometer covering the visible and near infrared spectral range, and the second one covering a restricted spectral range uh, from 700 to 800 nanometer with an higher resolution of 0 0.1. Uh, this system is based on uh, an optical uh, multiplexer that allows to switch uh, the 
input signal from the cosine receptor looking uh, the sky, bay fiber uh, looking down, and uh, a blind channel that allow to measure uh, the dark current measurement for every set of acquisition. The optical um, a receptor are a cosine receptor to measure the radiance and a bare fiber with a 25 degrees field of view for the measurements of the upwelling radiance. And with these instruments, an area of 0.5-0.8 meter was observed. And we acquired spectral measurements every three minutes for 27 days in 2009. Also, in this case, uh, we try to test the light use efficiency model. These are only some preliminary results, but the first test we have done is to evaluate the potential of the fluorescence at 706 nanometer uh, to estimate uh, the fluorescence. In fact, the light the, that can be absorbed by a canopy is closely related to canopy chlorophyll content, in particular in uh, agricultural crops, and uh, a model uh, um, proposed recently is based on a direct relationship between the gross primary production and the product between the um, vegetation indices related to canopy greenness or uh, chlorophyll concentration uh, times the par. In uh, this experiment, we try to use uh, fluorescence instead of the, uh, of the product between VI and PAR. Another uh, issue we are investigating is in the use of the fluorescence yield, that is the ratio between the fluorescence and the incident or the absorb uh, PAR by the canopy to estimate the light use efficiency term of the um, light use efficiency model. <coughs> These are uh, the seasonal trend of the NDVI, of PRI and fluorescence at 706 nanometer from 12 June to 19 July 2009. And uh, if we look at the diurnal and seasonal variation of the fluorescence, we can see that the, um, seasonally the fluorescence tend to follow the um, green biomass accumulation of the canopy and is uh, closely linked to the green, uh, greenness of the canopy and to the chlorophyll content. And uh, in the, at the diurnal level, it is... Um, uh, the fluorescence is driven by the variation in, in the incident par having maximum value around, uh, around midday. If we uh, look at the relationship between the GPP and different vegetation indices, we observe that uh, for uh, all the indices tested, that are two indices related to canopy greenness and DVI and MTCI, fluorescence and the um, product between NDVI and PAR and MTCI and PAR, we obtain a quite good relationship with a quite high um, determination coefficient for uh, the, in particular for the NDVI and for the fluorescence at 760. But it was quite, it, um, was quite expected because uh, our ecosystem show a strong seasonality in the biomass grow and um, mm, chlorophyll content is expected to be a major driver of the um, gross primary production. But if we look at uh, dyes in which the we can assume that the biomass, the greenness of the biomass is contacts, we can look that the for example, the NDVI and the MTCI lose their correlation with the gross primary production, while the result obtained with the fluorescence are still good with a root mean square error of 0 0.6. We can obtain quite good uh, uh, relationship also uh, using the product with the PAR, but um, in this case, we need to have also uh, ancillary measurements uh, from a meteorological tower, like uh, for example, uh, uh, the PAR in this case, 
while if uh, we can use fluorescence uh, we uh, we can base the whole estimation of the GPP from remote sensing data without the need uh, of uh, ancillary measurements. We have done the same test, uh, also looking at the relationship between uh, PRI and fluorescence yield to the reduce efficiency. And also in this case, uh, if we use uh, the whole data set, we have a good correlation with PRI and the fluorescence yield. But uh, if uh, we look uh, only at um, the days in which the biomass was already high, and we can assume that uh, we don't have a great variation of uh, chlorophyll content, the um, correlation with the PRI decrease, while uh, the um, also the correlation with the fluorescence yield decrease, but is still uh, significant, and the coefficient of, of determination is uh, 0 0.47. That's concluding. In this um, talk, I'm presenting some long-term data series of eddy covariance data acquired uh, with uh, acquired uh, contemporary with high resolution canopy spectra at high temporal frequency, including for the first time uh, seasonal trend of the fluorescent seven angry cysts in nanometer. We have tested different optical indices as input of the light use efficiency model. And uh, with regard to the grassland experiment, the spectral vegetation index uh, designed to be more sensitive to chlorophyll content explain uh, most of the variability in GPP. And the accuracy in GPP estimation improve when taking into account high frequency modulation of GPP driven by the incident par or uh, modeling the light use efficiency with the PRI model formulation. For what concerns the alpha-alpha field, some preliminary results show that the fluorescence can be successfully used for a GPP estimation without requiring any ancillary measurements, and that fluorescence yield is related to the light use efficiency with a, a higher coefficient of determination. As I said before, this, uh, experimental site, in this experimental site, the vegetation cycle is characterized by a strong dynamic of biomass growth. So uh, chlorophyll contact explains uh, a great portion of the variability of the gross ecosystem production and the light use efficiency. We think that to better assess the capability of the fluorescence seal and also to, of the PRI to track the light use efficiency term, Future field experiments should focus on vegetation types such as the Mediterranean ecosystem with uh, low seasonality in uh, vegetation indices and then higher seasonality in uh, gross primary production. And uh, we think that the investigation of the possibility to use the fluorescence to improve uh, the estimate of the gross uh, ecosystem production can be very attractive for the monitoring uh, from space of the um, vegetation productivity in the context of a future space mission, like, for example, the ISAFLEX uh, mission that uh, I think that is the subject of uh, the next talk of uh, Jose Moreno. Thank you. If you have any question. Thank you, Mikael, for the presentation. Any questions about fluorescence? Uh, maybe not just about the fluorescence, but I was just interested in the, this um, interesting instrumentation that keeps turning upside down um, to measure the irradiance and the reflected radiation. Uh, how does this compare to a conical setup? Because it's taking somehow, it's giving a weighted, sort of a weighted average. Yeah, I, uh, in my personal opinion, if you are looking to the data acquired around midday, I think that you can have uh, good data and maybe they are better than the hemispherical conical reflectance because you are sampling a wider uh, area. But for what I can see from our data set, the BRDF effect uh, using the hemispherical uh, to look uh, both down and up is higher. And I think that uh, 
it's very difficult to use the the wool uh, diurnal cycle measurements because uh, they have a, a great effect and so i think that if you are using a midday is a, a good option but if you have to look at all the diurnal variation it's more difficult or maybe you have uh, little experience with respect to the measurement of the H of the um, conical hemispherical reflectance. And you we have also done different tests changing the diffuser on top of the arm and it's very important to have a good diffuser because in uh, our optics we use two diffuser very close each other to try to have uh, th the best cosine response as possible for our instrument. But we have also tested uh, with only one diffuser and the response uh, was uh, quite poor. So you have to be very careful, I think, in the choice of, uh, of your setup. Um, you bring up, this question brings up an interesting point. I think, Loris, you had some experience with this where somebody didn't like your results because you were using hemispherical, hemispherical, and they said that you're not, not supposed totally. to do this. I'm not totally so, this. So, you know, this is not accepted by the remote sensing community as a legitimate method, and I think there's a lot of education that this community has to do, uh, you know, because people get stuck in their concepts of how, you, how these things have to be done. And I agree with you, Mikol, that it works very well to do these. And it's a shame that you know, this is going to be a challenge to educate the larger community, because it's very, it's very likely that reviewers will say this is not the way to do it. Um, so there's, there's quite an effort that needs to go on here. And I agree that it actually, because it integrates over a large area, you can get better results if, in some cases, but it is important to be aware of your limitations in that hemispherical diffuser is, is critical. And that's something we haven't talked about, but the, they're very peculiar. Each one is different, and they're not very well characterized typically by manufacturers, for example. But we have tried to compare measurements with uh, hemispherical conical or b hemispherical measurements, and they are uh, in particular, at the end of the day, they are very different, but it's also very difficult to find the reason because uh, you are measuring different objects. The light path is changing if you are measuring with a narrow field of view or a wider field of view, and you can uh, lose uh, the cosine response of your system, so it's very difficult. I don't know if the beam is spherical is uh, better or not, but are different, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Yeah, I think the uh, the hemispherical reflectance is quite attractive, let's say, when it comes to footprint, because, you know, you have a higher, uh, bigger footprint, so this makes you happy, but there are some limitations. For instance, in um, in the Brussels meeting, others there um, was just showing some data of the response of the cosine uh, receptor in the medium infrared bands, and it looks like... Uh, different cosine receptors respond in a totally different way and even in the near infrared uh, the response is not uh, so good so it's quite attractive but we should be careful <laughs> yes but i think that is the same if you don't have a good cosine receptor to measure the incident yeah. radiance and this is the reason because we are using now an integrating sphere but maybe it's uh, more expensive than a cosine receptor <laughs> Any other question? So I um, just have a question. Are you going to use your system on uh, less dynamic ecosystems like uh, you mentioned probably some conifer mm, forest? This year, no? Maybe in the next year it would be interesting. Okay. Um, do you have any... We are thinking about the uh, Mediterranean ecosystem. Okay. I, was think, I was talking with Albert last meeting. I don't know what. Uh, we don't have a, a okay. site now. <laughs> okay. Do you have an ethical variant site on uh, conifers? 
Mm, no. On a large, but is a deciduous. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. same problem. Yeah. Any other question? No? Okay. So we should move to the last presentation of this uh, first part of session two. Uh, given by Hector Nieto, we are moving towards a different domain. We're talking about thermal infrared data. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, as Lori said, it's a different uh, domain. So yeah, I guess I have a difficult task here to introduce the thermal infrared in here in Eurospec that I'm expected that I'll mainly focus on optical sampling. So yeah, I expect that after this presentation, I will be able to explain the, mainly the title so in the first half of the other presentation, I will express the motivation. So I will try to explain why estimation the sensible heat flux, why using thermal infrared data, and why multi-angular, and why using radiative transfer modeling. Uh, in the second half, I will present the, the model uh, we are using uh, and the results using uh, 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 reflecting the estimation of net radiation and the sensible heat flux. And yeah, finally with some conclusions and, and future work. So why estimate the estimation of sensible heat flux? Well, uh, as, as you can, uh, you may know, uh, there's a close relationship uh, between the fluxes of water and CO2 in the, at the leaf level, since most of the water uh, lost uh, at leaf level is through the stomata, which are as well at the same time where uh, CO2 is fixed uh, in the canopy. So there's a close link between evapotranspiration or transpiration, canopy transpiration, and CO2 fluxes. On the other hand, there's as well a, a close li link between evapotranspiration or in terms of energy, this latent heat flux, and the energy balance. And finally, this energy balance, that is the energy that is uh, available uh, at, uh, at the surface, this energy can be split and be either conducted and stored in the layer that we call the soil heat flux, or uh, this energy can be uh, uh, used to evaporate the water that is the evapotranspiration, or call in terms of energy the latent heat flux, or uh, this energy is used to warm up, to heat up the, the surface. So it results in a sensible heat flux because it uh, results in an in a increase of temperature of the surface. And indeed, since we are dealing with temperature, we can use thermal infrared data to uh, retrieve surface temperature, and therefore we can somehow uh, directly estimate uh, the sensible heat flux using uh, uh, thermal infrared rate data. Also, uh, why sensible heat flux and not uh, a latent heat flux? I mean, uh, uh, by having or estimating the sensible heat flux and getting a, an estimate of the soil and net radiation that are more or less straightforward, we could estimate as well the, the latent heat flux. But then it becomes difficult to validate the latent heat flux we use in the uh, edit covariance tower because among the fluxes that edit covariance measures, the latent heat is the, the one that shows higher uncertainties. So it's a difficult uh, validation task to estimate, to, to validate uh, latent heat. So we just stopped and focused on the, on the sensible heat. So yeah, uh, we can use uh, surface temperature to estimate the sensible heat flux, and these are the, the physics uh, behind. So the sensible heat flux can be uh, estimated as a gradient of temperature between the surface, or the, what we call the aerodynamic temperature of the surface, 
and a reference temperature over the, over the surface, that is the, the air temperature. This uh, transport of, of heat has a uh, present some resistance to the transport, so we need to define a series of resistances to this transport. And we can use both one source, two source, or several uh, source, uh, or several layers. So in a one source model, we uh, uh, use the temperature, the surface temperature, and an ensemble of the soil and canopy, and we drive the sensible heat flux uh, of, of the surface by using a series of resistance to, uh, to estimate it. The main problem is that, yeah, uh, there's a difference between the, the, the radiometric temperature, that is the, 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 the measurement that we estimate with, uh, the magnitude that we estimate with remote sensing, and the aerodynamic temperature. So we have to add some uh, resistances that are somehow empirical based. For that reason, uh, there's been developed uh, another approach that is based in a two, in, in a two layer source model. So in that case, we split soil and canopy. And we take advantage of the uh, concept of the, direc the directional surface temperature. So by splitting this, uh, uh, this uh, temperature into soil and canopy temperature, we can uh, get rid of this uh, uh, empirical approximation of, 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 of resistances. And more important, we can split between uh, fluxes of canopy and soil. So we can estimate this, the sensible heat at the canopy, the sensible heat at the, fluid, at, the, at the soil, and therefore we can then estimate the, the soil evaporation and canopy transpiration that then can be uh, linked to uh, another fluxes as, as CO2 fluxes. So yeah, uh, and why multi-angular? Or why using the, the, the directional surface temperature? Well, as it happens with, uh, the, with the optical, optical data, there's a dependency of, 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 of a directional dependency of the, of the satellite signal. And this is mainly because uh, if we are in a, in a canopy, uh, we can assume that we are uh, in a, a composite of a cool vegetation and warm soil. And depending on the angle we are observing the, the surface, we are observing a different fraction of soil and vegetation. And therefore, there's a difference of temperature that the sensor is receiving, whether it's in a nadir, where we can observe a higher amount of warm soil than in off nadir, nadir where most of the, of the surface is vegetation, and therefore, we expect that the off nadir uh, temperature will be uh, lower than the nadir. So we take advantage of these differences to retrieve soil and canopy. But how? Well, first we have to estimate the fraction of, of vegetation observed by the sensor. And this is, uh, can be estimated from the leaf area index, assuming a poison law, uh, combining the leaf area index and the views and its angle. But the problem is that we have a single observation that is when most of the satellite op uh, operate. Uh, we have uh, two unknowns and only a, sing and a single observation. Uh, we have the canopy and soil. So we have an undet undetermined problem. But if we had uh, two different observations, two simultaneous ob observations at two different angles, we'll have two equations, two lens surface temperature, and two unknowns, canopy and soil temperature. So we can uh, derive uh, a straightforward the canopy and soil temperature by uh, solving this uh, system of two equations. Okay, so that's why we have the, oh wait, we had the AATSR sensor, uh, that which is on board the NVSAT satellite, part of the European Space Agency. And the main advantage of this sensor is that it provides two near simultaneous observation at nadir and at 55 degrees forward. And it provides information on the uh, optical as well and in the thermal. So with, with AATSR, we uh, somehow estimate the surface temperature at both nadir and uh, forward. 
One of the main problems, and I will discuss it later, is that, of course, uh, we are dealing with uh, some problems of scale. Since the uh, nominal spatial resolution at nadir view is one kilometer, while at forward, the, the pixel size is uh, 1.5 times two kilometers. So when we uh, combine these two information, we have to be very careful when uh, dealing with this, this information because we, we can find some spatial issues when deriving the, the canopy and, and soil temperature. Okay, so, and finally, we have tell, okay, we are convinced, or well, I'm convinced that uh, it's important to stimulate insensible heat flux, that we need surface temperature, that we need multi-angular observation, but why radi radiative transfer modeling? Well, the main uh, 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 issue to be addressed is that, yeah, with this previous uh, equation that uh, partitions the, or explains the land surface temperature is a fraction of uh, canopy and soil, is that, that you are only considering geometric issues. But of course, we are dealing with radiation, and as it as it's happens in, in, in the optical, we are subject as well to volumetric scattering in the thermal domain. So of course, we have some influence of the downwelling radiation, downwelling long wave radiation, and this radiation can be transmitted through the soil, reflected by the vegetation, uh, have multiple uh, reflections in the, in the canopy, go back to the soil, and et cetera. And the same, the soil is emitting energy, and this energy can be uh, went straight to the, to, the, to the sensor, or this energy as well reached to the canopy, this energy as well is reflected, and multiple scattered in the canopy as it is volume, and transmitted, and the same with the canopy. So the question is, is this equation already valid? since it only considers uh, geometric issues. So that's why we are using a radio transfer model that is for sale, which uh, it's a four-string model, so it, uh, it deals with uh, both uh, incoming uh, beam and diffuse radiation and outwelling, uh, upwelling diffuse and uh, beam radi radiation. So it simulates how the energy is uh, reflected, transmit, and uh, absorb through a, through a canopy. This canopy has to be homogeneous as well as the soil. And for that model, we need uh, several parameters we have to define or uh, retrieve, which are re leaf reflectance and transmittance, as well as we are dealing at in, the, in the thermal domain emissivity, soil reflectance, em soil emissivity, uh, the canopy and soil temperatures, which, has, which are the, uh, the variables we want to estimate and invert. But as well, some canopy parameters that are different in index, leaf angle distribution and the hot spot parameter, and the solar and diffuse in, uh, fluxes. So by using for sale, uh, will allow the estimation of first, the directional surface emissivity. I didn't mention before, but when dealing with thermal data, uh, the, the, the energy observed by a sensor mainly depends on the land surface temperature, but as well on the emissivity. And as well, there's a, a, a bidirectional a directional effect of emissivity. So we need as well to estimate this uh, effect, this directional effect of, of emissivity. Once we have that, we can estimate uh, the directional land surface temperature, invert, for sale with these two observations and retrieve soil and canopy temperatures. And as well, we can estimate the net radiation split of diverge between the soil and the canopy and as well both short wave and long wave. So this is how the model works. So while dealing with satellite data, our main uh, 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 source of data is the AATSR, AATSR data sensor. But we are always using uh, a leaf area index product, either for Marys or for bodies. And as well, we need some ancillary data related to land cover from MODIS, which are the canopy height, crown width the ratio, and the leaf angle distribution. So the final objective is to retrieve the valuables the, the, uh, needed for, uh, to, uh, to be fed into the two source energy balance model which are, of course, canopy and soil temperature, net radiation, 
and some uh, other uh, ancillary, ancillary data related to the roughness of the surface. That's why we're using the canopy height and leaf uh, crown width ratio, and as well some meteorological data. So the, in, 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 in this scheme, you can see that the, the print uh, 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 processes are that, that ones that are based on force sale on the radiated transfer model. So we can estimate leaf area index by, in, by inverting a force sale, prospect and force sale. Once we have the leaf area index, we can estimate the directional emissivity of, the, of both uh, observation geometries of AUTSR. But as well, in order to retrieve the directional land surface temperature, we need to know the precipitable water vapor content, since it's the main absorber of thermal uh, radiation, and therefore it's the, we need to perform this atmospheric correction. And once we have the directional, uh, the directional land surface temperature, combined again with the leaf area index, we can retrieve the canopy and soil temperatures, as well the net radiation, and finally, use these variables into the two source energy model to retrieve sensible heat, sensible heat flux and then latent heat. So as well, uh, we have to, since you, we are using as well force sale for the net radiation, you're just showing how uh, we are, we are uh, using this approach. So for estimating the net radiation, we have to first estimate the leaf spectra and the soil spectra. For the leaf spectra, we use some information of leaf biochemistry fed into the prospect model to simulate leaf reflectance and soil reflect uh, leaf reflectance and soil uh, uh, sorry leaf reflectance and transmittance. As well, we use a, a soil spectra based on the Aster uh, spectral library, and we need as well to know the uh, uh, diffuse and beam radiation. So that's why we use some uh, very simple model that which is based on the incoming solar radiation, well, incoming short wave radiation, and the sun zenith angle to fed into this model div, uh, developed in 1985 to uh, get an estimate of the diffuse flux ratio, so which, how, how much uh, uh, of the incoming radiation is based on the diffuse and the beam. From the, all this data, together with the leaf area index and the leaf area in distribution are uh, running for sale in forward model and we cannot uh, integrate this data in, in the full uh, uh, spectrum and in a hemispherical way and we can retrieve canopy, net radiation, soil net radiation but as well the photosynthetically absorbed radiation for future models uh, based on, on CO2 fluxes. So let's go to the results and the case study. So this is our site, placed in, in Denmark, in Jutland. So we have, a, this is part of a hydrologic project, and we are based, uh, we have based three eddy covariant sites in a catchment of the River catchment. Uh, most of the area are agricultural, because most of them are based on agricultural, and most of the crops are either barley for beer, uh, potatoes, which are what uh, we Danish, they, the Danish eat, and uh, Christmas trees. So we have one site placed in close to the to this uh, 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 lagoon, which is a wetland meadow. We have as well uh, a crop field, which is our primary field site, which has mainly been planted with uh, barley different varieties of barley every year, and we have a uh, conifer plantation. All the results I'm show, I'm, I am showing you are based from the uh, crop site, which is, uh, is, is, the, is where we have uh, most uh, results developed. So this is how uh, Forcell uh, is able to perform, the, to estimate the net radiation. So there's, uh, this, this data is a full year time period for every, uh, 30 min every 30 minutes. So we can, say that, we can see that uh, uh, the model explains quite well the, uh, uh, var the variability of, of the net radiation and with uh, an acceptable root mean square error. But rather than this scatter plot, I prefer to show you this, this small time series. 
that is uh, from uh, ten or well, yeah, ten days of 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 of, of daily data of uh, thirty minutes data of May, and we can see that uh, the, the first days we have the unlikely event of clear skies in Denmark. Since well, I, I explained you the the bottom uh, plate is the in, in, in black is the incoming short wave radiation, while while the blue blue spots is the diffuse fraction. So when we are in the early morning sunrise or sunset, the sun is still very low, and of course most of the radiation is still diffuse. While in this clear sky uh, days. As, as long as the sun uh, starts rising, the diffuse ratio decreases up to a minimum of 0.4 in that case. And in these three very clear sky days, we can see a very nice uh, pattern of the albedo, which are the top plate. So in red spot, we have the model albedo by force sail, while the, the blue, uh, the, the yellow triangles are the albedo estimated with our pyranometers in our flag site. So we can see that in this very clear sky, when there's an uh, important uh, directional effect, the force sail explained quite, quite, quite well the diurnal trend of the, of the albedo. On the other hand, this is more typical, and this is one thing that I want to comment that Denmark is very cloudy. So this is, these seven days is a typical week in Denmark with cloudy and very overcast skies. And in particular in these two uh, overcast sky, of course the diffuse radiation is very close to one. So there's no, uh, there are fewer directional effects and therefore for sale uh, present uh, flat albedo, which is somehow in agreement with the flatness of the, of the uh, uh, field measurements. Now we pass to the estimation of sensible heat flux, and this is the the, uh, the scatter plot of the predicted vessels of surf in this flux site in, in the crop field for three years record. And the first thing that is worth noting is that we have very few points taking, taking into account that we are dealing with three years record. Well, this is a combined effect that AATSR data provides the, uh, images every two or three days, so the, its repetitivity is not that high, and as well, we have a huge cases with uh, cloud skies. So even though we can say that it's not very pre representative, on the left side, we have the predicted observed uh, estimates of the sensible heat flux using this uh, combined model of two-source model with radio transfer model, while on the right side, we have the original model, which is not using for sale to retrieve canopy and soil temperature. And we can, we can see that the model uh, significantly improves, both in an increase of the determination coefficient, the, the points are closer to the 1-1 line, and the root mean square error is reduced. So uh, we can say that uh, it seems that the using of force sail improves the estimation of the canopy and soil temperature versus the, the original approach. But of course, I mean, we not always have uh, the possibility of using uh, uh, multi-angular data. So there are other approaches to, to use in a two-source energy balance model. And originally was developed as well thinking on a, a single angle uh, observation. And when, once we have only a single uh, LST observation, first we have to uh, get some assumptions. And in order to retrieve uh, soil and canopy temperature, first we have to assume that the, uh, in the first step, that the uh, temperature of the canopy is based on a, a potential evapotranspiration, since we can assume that at, uh, in, the, in the first case, uh, vegetation is, trans is transpiring at its potential uh, stage. Right, sorry. So we get a first guess of the canopy latent heat flux. From this, we can estimate the sensible heat flux by the energy balance equation, get the canopy temperature. From that, we get the soil temperature, 
estimate the sensible heat flux of the soil, and finally, the, sensible, uh, the latent heat flux of the soil. And if we assume that there's no condensation, that means that the, that the latent heat flux has to be positive in daytime, we can reach, uh, get a, a, an iterative process until this condition is satisfied. And these are the results by using this approach. This is ground data of, of surface temperature for one year record, 2011 in this, in this crop site. And we have two different colors in the scatter plot of predicted versus, of, of versus observed, with two very different behavior. We can see that the red spots are very uh, well correlated to the, uh, to the predicted, with the estimates very close to the one run line, and with, we assume, the good, good mean square error. These points uh, are uh, uh, for data of, of dates before the day of the year 150, that is more or less at the end of May. The other set of points, the blue spots, uh, present a very strange behavior with some overestimations uh, tail and another underestimation tail. And these points uh, are related to uh, uh, dates with the, when the day of the year is after 150 on the 30th of May. And yeah, we can see that there's a strong relationship of, of the phenology in this, in, this, uh, in this pattern. And this is because this parameter, which I haven't mentioned yet, because of course, transpiration only occurs uh, on the leaf, uh, we assume that transpiration occurs in the leaf green, in the green leaves. So this FG is uh, a parameter that uh, reflects the fraction on green leaves in the canopy. So in that case, we have assumed that over the full year record in, the, in this crop, uh, all the crop is green. So FG equals to one, which since there's a sentence this is not true. And we can assume that while the leaf area index, which is the, the, the red, uh, the, the figure on the right side is increasing. We can assume that uh, crops are growing, everything is green, so yeah, Fg equals to one. But after the peak of leaf area index, senescence start, they stop irrigating, and the amount of yellow uh, leaves increases. And therefore, is when we have this over an estimation. So it's very important uh, when we have a single uh, observation to well define this fraction of, of, of green leaves at the canopy, which can be used, of course, uh, using optical methods. And we try to do something similar, uh, some, some approach to, to estimate this fraction of, of green leaves. And we are using a different model as well, based on, the, on a two-layer source model, what is called the dual temperature difference. And this, this model as well, Instead of using multi-angular uh, observation, we use the temperature at two different times in the day. One LST observation at night time, where the fluxes are minimal, so and uh, a land surface temperature in daytime. So this, day, uh, this model can be applied with both sensors or with satellites like a MODIS with an ascending and descending node when we have, we can, and we can have these two observations of which are stationary data, like Severi, for instance. So we apply this model and the same. On the left side, we have the retrieval of sensible heat flux when we assume that the fraction of green is one along the full uh, season. On the right side, is by cha it's changing uh, the fraction of green based on an empirical relationship between two different spectral indices, like a EVI and NDVI, and this is uh, the evolution of this estimate of fractional green. So we can see the same pattern on the left side. The red dots, which are the observation before the year 150, are very close to the 1-1 line with good correlation coefficient, while the blue dots in the left side uh, have uh, an underestimation of, of sensible heat flux, and therefore the points are uh, distant from the 1-1 line. When we apply this variable uh, FG, we see that the blue, blue dots gets closer to the 1-1 one, one line. So it seems that the, 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 the effect of this parameter is affecting. But 
we have the, the opposite effect. The red dots are getting farther from the 1-1 from the one, one line. So, and of course, this is estimate, it is because uh, uh, this case is the uh, growing season, but for this method, FG is still not assuming a fractional green of one during this growing season that we have in this crop. We should assume that everything is green. So this is because this up, uphill uh, uh, part of the, of the estimation. So yeah, as conclusion, we can say that we have promising results using this linked model of, of, of a radio transfer model to the two source energy balance model that allows, allows the use of multi-angular data that we obtain better uh, sensible heat flux estimation that are related to the re better retrieval of the canopy and soil temperature that for sale as well is able to estimate the net cell wave radiation with enough accurate and as well partition between soil and canopy that is able to explain the early variation of, of albedo, PAR, and the net radiation divergence, although I'm not, I'm not showing this, these results, and that the leaf area index is the most sensible, uh, sensitive and vari variable for both the net radiation estimation and the retrieval of the canopy and soil. And finally, the ongoing and future work we are taking is that we want to improve, improve the estimation of the downwelling radiation, both in the short wave and long wave, using MODTRAN radiation transfer model. We want to continue comparing the comparison of, of, of these models of dual angle and single angle, both with the, using the pretty tailored approach. <coughs> we want, of course, to validate the model in other region, in Spain, in, in Majadas, in West Africa, in America. Uh, apply the model as well with multi-angular angular data, not only with AHSR, as well with ground sensors and airborne sensors. And as future work, we want to get better retrieval of leaf rate index by merging multispectral and multi-angular data, both with MERIS and AHSR and with the future Sentinel-3 mission to assess the, a better retrieval of the directional land surface temperature because most of the uncertainty in the estimation of latent heat flux, the sensible heat flux are based on uh, 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 uncertainties in the retrieval of land surface temperature as well as this scale effect. Uh, we will try to combine multi-angular with multi-temporal data and of course, compare this model with other the models uh, for uh, estimation of about respiration and sensible heat flux, like the triangle method, Seval, uh, uh, Fisher, uh, Priestley Taylor approach. And finally, try to model this, uh, uh, the, the model the sensible heat flux in heterogeneous and clamp canopies, while our areas are mainly homogeneous and for sale assumes homogeneous areas. We, we have to assess how this model works as well in, in this type of vegetation. So, yeah, thank you a lot. Okay, thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> Any question? Answered questions. Yeah. And are you trying to, you, I mean, are, are you, maybe you haven't done it already, but are you using this data for an estimation of GBP or some? I mean, productive parameters of the of the sites uh, you're working on, and, and if so, what what would be the best uh, temporal scale to do to do that? Can you work in the intraday variations, or you should work in seasonal or daily variations, or? Um, if you mean for the estimation of GPP? Yeah, an example GPP or net. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, as well, there's a, a model I haven't mentioned, and we want to work with is that couples the the uh, two source energy balance with a light, light use efficiency approach. So I mean, instead of using this approach of based on the Priestley Taylor to estimate the, the potential transpiration of the canopy, they use a light use efficiency approach to estimate as well, linked the, the, the CO2 to the uh, uh, water fluxes and get this uh, first guess of, of, of canopy transpiration. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in terms of, of temporal uh, and spatial, yeah, it's always the trade-off that with, I mean, uh, by gr using ground sensors, uh, we can have a very good estimation of, a very good 
a temporary resolution, but we are working a plot side. And yeah, satellite data, well, ATSR, which uh, as I told you, have data every two, three days, maybe it's not, cannot be operational. So can I get, can uh, uh, give a rough idea of, of the instantaneous fluxes, but cannot be used operationally. Mm -hmm. For operational methods, uh, we can uh, either use Severi, for instance, that provides images every 15 minutes, uh, but has the limitation of that only observes that in a, in, in a, mm -hmm. in a disk, in a Earth's disk, and with some, as well, some uh, geometrical issues or uh, uh, assimilate this data into land surface model and once we have this observation assimilate in the surface model in the in in a SVAT model or in a land surface model and get these estimates in a, uh, in continuous thank you Janusz, maybe wanted to ask a question yeah I'm not sure, to, did I get you wrong or, or not? Uh, you, you compared the results of modeling and measurements, yes? Sensible heat flux, watts per square meters. Yeah. And uh, the measurements are from eddy covariance, am I right? Yes. Okay, you show once uh, a picture from a cropland, mm -hmm. uh, one of the first one, and my impression was that your sensor was pretty high, like seven, eight meters, am I right? So I'm just uh, thinking about the footprint analysis. Uh, was your field really so great, like a few hundred hectares? The field, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's quite big, and you mean here? Yeah. For example, yeah. a couple of pictures like that, but uh, especially from the cropland you said about barley. Yes. Yeah, it's for barley. Uh, in that case, is uh, winter barley. So yeah, the senescence of, of, of happen in in May. Uh, uh, do you remember the height of the hand, the, of the sensor of Eddie Covariance sensor? The sensor is placed uh, at six. We have different uh, two, in that in that side. We have six meters and twelve meters. So we can uh, as well get an idea of the footprint and the scale effects of, of comparing both both Eddie Covariance. Oh, okay, be because I was thinking when I saw the picture, there can be an influence of, of other fields also. And then if you have stronger wind in the mm -hmm. second half of the year, which mm -hmm. I heard uh, can happen in Denmark, uh, then you get yeah. a mixture of different signals and you can get overestimating mm -hmm. or underestimating. Yeah, well, there's, of course, there are some, uh, uh, some influence, but I mean, we, made, we have made a, a book print analysis and most of the times the fluxes come from the field and there are other fields that have the same crop then on the other side we have some forest but most of the wind in denmark comes from the from the west and this is where our most of the fields are, are placed but yeah i mean in, in future research we have to uh, we want as well uh, make a kind of spatial analysis and combining flux towers with a scintillometer to get a better idea of the of the uh, scale effect. And yeah, this data and as well, I mean, I, I, here as well, we, we have some scale effects because uh, we are comparing a flux a footprint of maybe a few hundred meters versus one square kilometer of AATSR. And in that case, we have, a uh, we have some signal coming from uh, the forest. Well, I have two questions. One is for the uh, modeling issue, because basically you saw be at the beginning that the main effect is due to the geometrical variability in the fraction of soil, the warm soil, and the cold vegetation you see. And this is the main explanation for the variability in the angular domain, while later on you use um, uh, um, for sale, which basically assume homogeneous, homogeneous canopy. So maybe this is, and there is also a scale issue because you use kilometers scale for area TSR. So I think but this is the general discussion going on for, for all these things. The question I have is more, spe more particular for the, for the community, which is here uh, thinking about uh, ground measurement from towers uh, and things like that. And my question in, in particular is the following. When we have tried to measure multi-angular thermal, and the problem is that there are two complications as compared to the multi-angular in the visible or near-infrared domain. One is common, which is the, the, the um, BRDF, 
or the footprint issue. So basically, when you look at different angles, you see different things, and and this is partly the explanation for the for the variability of angular effects. And I think this is common for the thermal and from the visible infrared. Uh, it's a general problem. But the, particularly for the thermal, there is another issue, which is the the thermal waves. So since from from one angle to the next uh, you need uh, seconds or in some cases minutes, there is a variability in the thermal behavior of the surface, which cannot be decoupled from the multi-angular effect. And I don't know if you have, can think about a, a dedicated experiment that can, we can run in a, from a tower or in, in a field campaign, so that uh, this particular effect of the combination between the different footprint and the different temperatures variability with the time can be somehow understood uh, better. Yeah, this uh, is a very good question. And yeah, uh, when using AATSR data, we have to assume because uh, I think there's a minute and a half between the f uh, forward overpass and the nadir. And temperature change very quickly, can change in terms of seconds. So here we assume that temperature is not changing. But yeah, uh, the experiment, of course, will be comparing these changes with ground sensors, with uh, multi-angular ground sensors. And yeah, we developed a, a setup, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah we installed uh, a couple of thermal sensors in a multi-angular scheme, observing the same spot. So we get uh, get rid of the scale effect since they are observing exactly the same spot, uh, playing with geometry. But the problem is uh, the problem that uh, we have in the thermal and both in the optical is the sensor calibration, and we haven't got any, uh, I mean, we just conclude that the, the calibration coefficient that were given by the manufacturer were not to be trusted. As Javi said, uh, you cannot use and go straight forward to the field. That is a, this is the mistake we made. And yeah, once we start analyzing the data, we saw that the data was meaningless. So yeah, uh, the experiment is in mind, but we have to, to to get uh, to fix our our calib uh, calibration problems with our field sensors. And the questions may be in Pilar. No, but my question was more or less the same because we never deal with optical with thermal sensor in US tech, and uh, I wanted to know your your experience about this ground sensor, ground thermal sensors about temporal stability, this uh, comparability issues with when you are using sensor, different sensors? Well, the experience is bad, as you can imagine, because we failed with this experiment. And yeah, I mean, the main problem is, of course, there's not, an, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a common discussion, which sensor to use, which protocol apply, and it's the same problem both in the optical and in the thermal. And yeah, in our case, we are using just a set of, of sensor coming from Everest. That is, suppose, one of the the the, the state-of-the-art manufacturers in terms of thermal sensors. And despite of that, we're having some problems as well because we have uh, our flux towers are, are quite tall, and we have deep, uh, long cables, and they add an, an add resistance that the manufacturers didn't take into account for the calibration coefficient. They don't, I mean, they just plug this, even though they, you ask them for uh, several meters of cables, because of course they are the specific cable that you pay, pay 10 times the, the, the normal price, they don't calibrate based on the length of these cables. So we are having problems in the, in the calibration. And yeah, uh, we have to calibrate this sensor with black body source, so. But yeah, I mean, there's no, uh, I guess that there's no uh, international agreement as well on the calibration of, of thermal sensor. It is not in the, in the optical. Okay. Thanks. Any other question? Yeah. Um, when you're using models, you have to be relatively careful about uh, validating these models. Um, but that's only one aspect. Um, when you're ingesting products, whether this is LAI or something, 
you also have to be careful uh, about the consistency of these products. So uh, when you, you see you said, for example, you used a Modis LAI. Now that is retrieved with something you could call a three-dimensional algorithm. So it has 3D properties. Uh, the four-cell model that you talked about was one-dimensional, for uh, homogeneous, let's say. So I was wondering, did you try, for example, with the parameters that you have to run your models, to see if you could actually reconstruct the observations, whether that was from MODIS or from ATSR? Going back to see, actually, are you able to go to the initial observations that you had? Because if you're not, there are two possible issues for that. One is the model may not be up appropriate, or it could be that um, there is an inconsistency between the types of data that you're putting into the model to run it. And another thing that occurred to me was, because you have so many steps, getting data, getting variables, putting them into your models, having equations in the end, did you do some kind of error propagation to see what, what, what are the uncertainties we're talking about in the end of your estimates? Well, regarding the, the first question, uh, per se, we didn't did this this exercise. I only check uh, uh, to rec uh, once uh, we estimate the canopy and soil temperature to reconstruct the directional land surface temperature, with the idea to check where the code was okay, and yeah, uh, get the same result, but not through the idea to for to to assess the consistency of the model, just to double check if my, uh, my, my code was, was okay. Uh, regarding the second question, uh, uh, one thing we have done is uh, re regarding the net radiation the, uh, and the partition of, of net radiation is to run in sensitivity analysis. Uh, uh, changing the, and yeah, I, I, I haven't solved, but uh, we changed uh, the, uh, the biophysical properties of leaves that came into uh, into prospect, uh, chlorophyll, uh, carotenoids, etc., and also changing leaf area index, leaf angle distribution, soil reflectance, and yeah, I mean it's, uh, the uh, the most sensitive variables in most of the cases is the leaf area index, and of course an error in leaf area index will. Uh, uh, produce uh, larger uncertainties in the output of the, of the models, both because elifra index affect net radiation and its partition between soil and canopy, and in the estimation of canopy and soil. But we haven't uh, quantified the the error, uh, the uncertainty of, of of the error in the in the final output. This is one thing that is is yet to be done. Good. Any other questions? Um, we're probably running out of time. It's probably lunchtime. So if you have any questions, let's keep them for lunchtime or the next session. Okay. Okay, so maybe we should start with the second part of the session two, which is uh, more focused on upscaling. So we're going to talk about airborne and satellite data. Um, I mentioned before that one of our uh, next activities of Eurospec is a, a joint summer school together with um, UFAR. Um, so this summer school is going to be held uh, in three weeks, uh, more or less, in Albacete, in Spain. Um, it is going to last for 10 days and uh, there, there is going to be a course on uh, field spectroscopy given again by Alasdair MacArthur of our action and some other trainers like um, Pilar um, and myself and other people from Eurospec uh, will carry out, we, we will give some lectures. And uh, of course, there there will be many lecturers from uh, the uh, UFAR reflex side, and there will be a flight campaign organized uh, during this um, this uh, summer school. 
And now Jose Antonio Gomez, who is involved in this um, uh, Reflex uh, Eurospec um, summer school, is going to talk about, in general, about the hyperspectral remote sensing experiences in the framework or UFAR transna transnational access program, which involved uh, training activities, but not only training activities, like he will explain now. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks to the organization for the invitation to present uh, the activities of, of UFA, and uh, particularly in the hyperspectral domain. Can you hear me properly? Yes. OK. Then I, uh, I belong to the Spanish Ministry <coughs> of Defense, I, I, uh, an institute of the Spanish Ministry of Defense, that is INTA. It's a, a kind of uh, Aerospace Agency, the Spanish Aerospace Agency, and I'm the representative of INTA in, in UFA for, for the last, I think, since the beginning, 12 years. And then uh, uh, my presentation is, first I will give you some hints of what uh, UFA is, and later I will try to point out the, uh, what is the hyperspectral component in, in UFA, uh, and the, the importance, the heavy, heavy load of, of uh, hyperspectral, every time more, more important in, in, this, uh, in this activity. Uh, UFAR is an integrating activity of the EC, ECFP7 program with a duration of four years from October. It started in October, the last edition is started in October 2008 up to September 2012, even though uh, we have, uh, uh, due to the problems, to get continuity the, in the next program, uh, we have uh, agreed all the partners to go ahead up to uh, 2013. And we are a total of 32 pa European partners with a budget of 8 million euro. And uh, UFAR uh, includes six uh, hyperspectral instruments and 21 aircraft, all of them open to transnational access. Uh, the objectives uh, is uh, to lay the, uh, the groundwork of an European distributed and sustainable infrastructure for urban research in environmental geosciences. I have marked here sustainable because that is maybe one of the, uh, the problems. We have not got to get a sustainable infrastructure, and that is one of the problems we have had in the last evaluation we received from BC to get continuity, and right now we are working on that. And then uh, the idea is to offer to each European scientist access to, in equal terms, to the bomb facility, the most suited to his scientific objectives, uh, without uh, uh, considering the, the his origin or her origin and of where the facility or who operates the facility. Here you can see in this map all the, the institutes and agencies that uh, uh, take part in, in UFA in some kind of blue or green, you can see the, the operators of aircrafts and instruments. Uh, we have as well 18 experts in airborne measurements. And uh, all of this, uh, in total, there are about 12 hyperspectral instruments, providers, and uh, experts. So we are more or less uh, one third of uh, total partners are involved in hyperspectral activity, even though they as you will see later, the, the, particip the participation in international access is much higher. In this slide, you can see the, the aircrafts. Uh, you can get access. That, uh, the aircrafts are open, that are open to transnational access. Uh, as I said before, OK, there is a small difference here. I said before it was 21. Instead, here it says 20, because in the case of INTA, uh, uh, we have to gas to 212. So uh, it's count only once, and instead it should be count twice because the aircrafts are different. One for atmosphere, atmosphere studies, and another one for remote sensing. And here, uh, 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 rounded or in, in, in of, with a framing color, you can see those that has hyperspectral capacity. The Donia 228 from DLA, uh, from DLA, that uh, is the platform for the Apex. The Tony 228 from NERC, that is a platform for the, for the NERC equipment. Uh, our CASA, 
uh, Cessna from FUB. And then uh, in total, that is, uh, that is uh, I think some, some of the people in, in, the, in the room has go, uh, had the opportunity of uh, working with uh, any of these teams. And then uh, in, in this slide, you can see the, the sensors, the hyperspectral sensors that uh, when they started, when, when the project uh, started, uh, were offered uh, for transnational access. Even uh, some of them uh, finally had, uh, had no, no application in, in the case of RS because the system was no, has not been available ever. Uh, and, and in the case of the Free University of, of uh, uh, Berlin as well because uh, okay the CASI uh, is not uh, so attractive for the for for the users. The most active sensors or the most active uh, facilities has been the uh, the Apex, the Eagle Hawk operating partner, and our and uh, likely our facility uh, with the 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 CASA aircraft and uh, the AHS and the CASI 1500. In this slide, I, I want to summarize. I will not enter in details. I, I have no time for that. But uh, it's, uh, just I want to present here that DFAR is, is not a, something that I started uh, when, uh, in 2008, but it, uh, it started uh, at, at uh, about 2000 or even before. There were some mainly atmosphere activities in the 90s. And later in 2000, the main the main uh, event or main milestone happens in, in 2000 with uh, it passed to, to, to receive the name of UFAR, which uh, was just a, a forum in which we met uh, periodically, all the people involved in this kind of activities. And then what, uh, what happened in, in 2000, at the end of 2004, we passed from a funding of a point less than 1 million euro to a funding of 5 million euros. That was the, 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 the big step we, we did. And then in, in FP7, we again almost duplicated the, the funding from 5 million euros to 8 million euros. And as well, it was very important uh, to, to consider uh, following the, the recommendations of the European Commission, uh, another activity, HIRESA, that uh, st uh, stands for Hyperspectral Remote Sensing in Europe, was a specific support as action of FP6, was merged with UFA, and then began a, a much uh, bigger, the, the, the specific mark was much higher, and then, uh, okay, that is what we are now, and that here is where we are at the end of, of this program, and we hope we will be able to be among all the people to, to, to find a way of uh, following in the future. So the expected impact is a better service to the users. Uh, we think it's uh, the most complete fleet. Uh, the, we want to ease the access as much as we can, uh, mainly using uh, web, uh, web tools, uh, and expensive web tools, the strong scientific and technical support. Uh, as well, we, we are working in improving the, the performance of, of the aircraft we offer, reduce as much as we can the duplication, even sometimes the duplication is as well good because it gives some kind of redundance and competence between the facilities, optimize operation, because uh, that was one of the problems that uh, these facilities had. Some of them operate very few, and then was uh, very few during the year. So uh, uh, for an uh, 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 air platform, is. Uh, consider a, a good number, a good figure, is about 300 flight hours per year to be considered in some way well, well operated, well used. And then uh, as well we meet, we try to, to join a stronger, the strongest expertise in our own instrumentation. This is the structure. Again, I, will, I have no time to enter in the detail. This is the, the architecture, how we was uh, uh, made up the, the architecture of the, of the of the, uh, this forum, so uh, there is people who has the money and whom the politics who had the decision as well with some, of course, technical background, the experts that had no money but has the knowledge, and then uh, uh, the, the network of operators that wants to, to, get, to provide access to people that has no funding but uh, trying to convince to people who, who has funding and then put all this together with many 
boxes that little by little has become more complicated. And of course, finally, is the, there are the scientific uses we try to, uh, are finally our, our customers, if you allow me to say. And then there are a number of uh, uh, boxes with, uh, of course, we need a luxury of, of people, of doctors, well, the best prepared people and with the highest knowledge, independent. And then uh, there is a figure for, for facilitated transnational access, education and training activity, of course, is a priority. A database, common database, because they, all the data are, are recorded with, uh, with common money. And then uh, after maybe 12 months or so, has to be, the access has to be free for anyone that wants to use them for scientific uses. And the UFA website that that is. And there are some parallel groups, standards and protocols, sustainable structure. I think some of them as well very related with, with your activity. So as I have seen in the program, I had no opportunity to, to be here this morning. In the, and uh, that is, so here is a bit more detail. As I said before, I, I, I have no time, and I don't think it's the, the place to, to enter in all the details. Uh, but this is the, as you know, it's, a, it's a, uh, an integrating activity, so has to have networking activities, transnational activities, and joint research activities. And then uh, in, in, the, in the second part of my presentation, I will try to enter in each of these activities and try to point out the hyperspectral component of this. With this, you can have an idea of what is the contribution of the weight of each one of the activities. Uh, the most important, the most funded, is a transnational act activity because that is the final objective of all these structures to give uh, access to this very expensive and valuable uh, uh, capabilities to people that want to use for, for research. So I don't know how much time I have. Mm. It's okay. okay. So uh, the most important, I, just, I said the first time, transnational access. There is a networking activity called transnational access coordination that uh, the objective of this is to implement what is the, trans the trans transnational access in itself. So uh, helps to designate the members of the selection panel, very important, and to implement the selection criteria and implement as well all the tools, all the uh, decision fl uh, workflow, how, because all, there are many proposals and have to be selected and, and evaluated in more, more or less automatic way and uh, through uh, tele, I don't know how to say, uh, with personal contact. Everything has to be, otherwise the, the cost increases, uh, is, is impossible to support, to afford that, that increase of cost. I said before, there, there are six instruments and 21 aircraft open to transnational access. And then the, in, when it started, it was supposed to, to um, the idea was to support about 64 projects and uh, uh, 20, uh, 215 users and 537 flight hours. I have got the numbers, I call it the numbers from the last um, uh, reporting uh, uh, document, uh, the second one, that is uh, 80, 36 months after the starting of the, of the project, in, in last, uh, at the end of September 2011. And then, uh, okay, we are close to those numbers, uh, finally, uh, there were about uh, 22, uh, yesterday I checked, 26 now, 26 expression of interest has been received, and uh, out of them, 13 has been, uh, became finally to full proposals, and eight were selected to be funded, so it's good. This is a model expression of interest was uh, agreed, was set up uh, in the middle of, the, of this, uh, maybe about 18 months, because to present a full proposal we consider was too complicated and was uh, some users, some applicants, we saw that it was uh, reluctant to prepare a proposal before knowing if it has any chance to, to, to be funded. So we, this is just uh, expression of interest, is just a short letter with what you want to do and then you receive uh, the very preliminary feedback for, for the evaluators if that uh, if has any chance to be funded, selected or not. So has worked pretty well. And then uh, there are 69 full 
uh, transnational application has been received and 39 were selected. 36 has been found up to now. Uh, one during uh, the first 18 months and 35 in total in, in the next 18 months up to September. And now there is no more, more money in, the, in these uh, 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 12 years remaining. And so only remain two more, one of them, to schedule for P3, one of them is Reflex. So we are uh, pretty lucky, UFA, SPEC, Eurospec, and ourselves, uh, INTA. Okay, this, uh, this is available. If you go to the website, here, okay, I wanted to present this, but uh, if you go to the, to, to the IFA web page, you can see there uh, a link in the first, just in the home page, in which is explained the main uh, achievements in FP7 of UFA. So here, what represents uh, is the, the total time needed to one, to one uh, uh, proposal be selected or not. So it's a, the, the due time is about nine months. So that is the reason it's recommended not to present one proposal uh, in, in June to be flown in August or September. Need some time because the, the, the process is, okay, it's much, uh, every time more automatic, but even though it requires time to, to find, I will present some of the problems that, that happen in the next slide. This, here you can see the number of reviews per country. So Germany, UK, Italy, Spain, France, the most active as well. Sometimes we invite uh, people uh, from, from overseas, US, uh, Canada, Australia, to, to participate in the selection. And then this is one of the problems we had been, we found that the feedback from the scientific reviewers of Santa is not easy to receive feedback. Is uh, what happened is the, the activity is not paid at all; is uh, free, and then uh, in the 20 percent of the cases, uh, no reply at all. Sometimes uh, refuse, and sometimes they accept, but even though the the reaction time is too too short, too too long, or even uh, finally there is no no reaction at all. So that uh, means that the the the, the the process of, of uh, selection becomes very, very slow. Here in this slide, we uh, uh, is, is, uh, summarize uh, 69, 69 uh, uh, the status of the of the sorry of the, of the application at, at the time of the uh, of uh, September last year. So uh, you have here 69 receive, 35, 35. Uh, flown in uh, in FP2, already flown, and two more remaining. And uh, what is more important uh, is planned to uh, do about 520 flight hours. Uh, 64 user group will get benefit of this. 160, 164 uh, was the individual uh, users, and up to now is 314, so it's very good. And okay, there is uh, almost uh, fulfilled the uh, use the the budget available. Now I enter in what is hyperspectral. Here is the is presented the percentage of projects per, per installation. And then I have rounded what is hyperspectral. So in total, the hyperspectral, the numbers of projects related with hyperspectral is 62%. Uh, NERC with 28% uh, of the total number of projects, APEX 7%. Apex has the problem that enter enter to, to be offered very late, uh, later than the other facilities. Seven percent is the same because uh, the, the Donia two to eight is the platform, the a platform for the Apex, so they go join. And so finally, there are three facilities that are giving access, are getting applied and uh, giving access, providing access for to the hyperspectral users, and in total. Summarize about 62% of the total number of projects. We think that is very, okay, it's a, it's very a successful result for for our for people who work in this in hyperspectral. And then in in the in the case of the total percentage of a, a transnational spent for for installation, for you have here a, again in 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 money in funding is 42%. What happened is the atmospheric facilities, many times the cost per hour is much higher, so that is the reason there is that uh, gap between 62 and 42% of, 
of percentage. In, in UFA, there's as well a number of expert working groups uh, that uh, the objectives is uh, to compile the knowledge in high-level handbook. Uh, that is one, uh, one, one handbook is, pre is being prepared uh, that uh, will summarize uh, the state of the art in airborne physical measurement principles. Uh, Professor Yalbendor is uh, coordinating this activity for remote sensing. As well, uh, uh, the second objective is, is to improve the expertise among the specialist scientists in 18 fields, that uh, I will go later to that, and to facilitate the transfer of F expert knowledge to users, operators, or funding agencies. So this I have got it from, from the website. And you see there are two groups of expert working groups. One is what is called support to airborne measurements. And here, out of seven, there are three uh, directly related with the hyperspectral. One is calibration and validation, as you know, is uh, uh, coordinated by team. And now, as far as I know, is in Australia, in zero. And uh, he works in, in NERC. And then, OK, he's coordinating. And is, uh, as I said, is uh, mainly uh, uh, involved in uh, spectral uh, uh, ground measurements. And then uh, hyperspectral data processing, uh, coordinated by Daniel Slaffer, and imaging sensors, uh, coordinated by Kummelman from Vito. And then there are a number of, of uh, a second group that is what is called specific measurements of uh, fields. And here we have, uh, again, four groups uh, 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 working in, in the hyperspectral domain out of uh, much, much of them. You can go through the details of this in the website. Uh, uh, the expert working groups, they meet periodically. And uh, in this case, up to uh, last uh, September, we organized a number of, of uh, workshops that are funded. And um, the conclusions, the, the, all the reports are, are available, freely available at the UFAR website. And in the case of hyperspectral application, there were, has been a, a total of two, two, seven, six, uh, 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 six uh, meetings, one in soil application, Another one in instrument integration and certification, slightly uh, is related with hyperspectral. There, there are three in one. There was a meeting in Edinburgh uh, past year, uh, one for, uh, related with cal um, calibration and validation issues, imaging sensors, and hyperspectral data processing. Okay, we, we meet all together for, for one week, for some days, in order to, 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 okay, to reduce the cost and to, to make the the, the the coordination more, more efficient and then there, there there has been as well in past uh, august one uh, one uh, meeting organized by by EYAL, uh, about hyperspectral application for soils this is uh, now is not anymore available because there are no funding but here is uh, just if, if you are interested you go to the first you you describe in the mail list you are informed whether it's one of these activities you ask to the coordinator if you if uh, he select you or he or she select you, so you you can be funded to participate with a mm, with a presentation or just to assist to the to the meetings. Again, uh, another activity important is the education and training, which of it is uh, attract attract uh, the new early stage researcher to urban research to educate and train theoretically and practically new early stage research in urban and atmospheric research and urban hyperspectral remote sensing, it to train trainers in urban atmospheric research and urban hyper, per, hyperspectral remote sensing. Right. So I will not go through the details because all these opportunities, all these options, training courses and urban research, join an existing campaign, uh, participation on the design of a new campaign, and visit to aircraft all those are closed because the lack of funding, just the funds are finished. It's not the crisis, it's because there is no any more up to uh, the, the, the new proposal be approved. So, <clears throat> and then UFAR provides for all these activities 100% support after uh, following a process of, of selection, evaluation and selection. So if you are finally choose, you you get uh, 100 support 100 percent support for 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 these activities okay there are some training courses i will go directly 
to reflex. I have one slide prepared. There was another another training course organized by Balaton Limnological Research Institute uh, two years ago in May, and uh, was uh, made the, the the facility was uh, the donor to to aid from mm -hmm. from Hasa German a plate or I call but it's uh, English, it's operated by NERC under one agreement. And all the, the instrumentation is from, from NERC with this, you can see here. And then uh, that was organized, was successful, where many uh, registrations received and 20, finally 20 were selected for IFA funding. These are the objectives. And then uh, all this, again, all this is available in the website. It's just, uh, I have made just a selection of what I consider was, could be interesting for you. And here comes one of those activities pending to be done. We were lucky to, to receive a positive feedback to support Reflex before these problems of continuity in, the, in UFA and was, was considered by, by UFA that even though the problems of, of, of continuity was worth, very worth uh, to, to go ahead with this uh, activity and that is the reason. In about three weeks, we will hopefully we will be in barracks with ten people from funded by UFA and ten people funded by Coast, by, in order to 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 tell us what we know and how to prepare a real flight campaign and uh, to use the facility. The operator will be us, Inta, with our aircraft. It's organized by Bob Su, Dr. Bob Su from University of Twenty from ITC, the Netherlands. And then the host is the ITAP, Instituto Tecnico Agronomico Provincial. And will be the working area, will be a very well known, uh, well characterized place in Las Tiesas Experimental Farm in Barracks. Uh, has been, the call has been very, very successful, where 100, a total of 120 registration received. And then, uh, okay, I know the details I have told before. And um, okay, these uh, already are closed, so I don't think has just uh, as information. There is as well uh, an activity ongoing that is standards and protocols that is alive and is is uh, managed by DLR and is working very well and is mainly uh, affecting the hyperspectra. So I invite you to go for detail. There are some documents, deliverables, already issued, very interesting with all the. Uh, protocols and standards in order to to be able to 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 get some to agree some some formats and in common all the the, the very few uh, producer data providers in in Europe. And again, uh, here you have the the references. And as well, I want to mention the database. As uh, I said before. Uh, the, the objective of this is to provide a centralized gateway to data acquired on board aircraft because, as I said, the, the data has been paid with European money, common European money, and then after a delay term that is given as uh, preference to the user that applied for the project, after that, has to be freely accessed, access, access, be able to access by any, any other group. And then uh, what we do is we we send, after completing the, the data acquisition, we send uh, our data to the database center based in here, in the NERC, that is uh, responsible of keeping that. And in this table, you can see the, the data. It's about, in our case, in the case, this is not update to now. It's uh, in, in, in uh, September last year was 350 gigabytes of, uh, of uh, INTA data and about 3.6 terabytes of NERC. Okay, there is the, you know, as you know, they operate a LIDAR and the, so it's, uh, the amount of data is much higher than in the case of, of uh, the atmospheric aircrafts. They are much, much uh, heavier, and as well this shows the success of, of, uh, of the hyperspectral activity inside the UFA. Here, sorry, it cannot be seen in detail, but uh, you, you can, Again, this is available in the UFA website. So in case you consider some of this data could be uh, useful for any of your projects, you just uh, write to the UFA 
a, a coordinator, you, you declare, you want to get access, and what is, you, you fill a form, and then uh, you can go directly to the, you, you will get some kind of a password, and you, you can download those data from, from this uh, database. E-communication is a basic, uh, basic uh, tool. Uh, this was the responsibility of Metro France, and has been crucial to make all this working. The best is practice in this case, so again, I invite you to go to the website and then check every day is, I update the, this presentation with uh, the information I found yesterday. I found some more buttons, operators. And, uh, we try to coordinate all our planning, everything that reflect our activity in, in the website, because the, the website is finally the the tool that we consider people interested in, in this uh, go through. So in the case of expert working groups, you have here, it's very easy to use. You can see the details. Uh, in this case, you can see the description, who is the leader, the meetings, and the documents. In the case of uh, aircraft, the same, I'm, I'm finishing. In the case of uh, aircraft details, you can see the details of the platform. If you want to install a new instrument, you have the, you are developed the instrument available and the planning. That uh, okay, we are some of this part don't work so smoothly, but uh, we are trying to to improve them. In the case of instrument, the same. Uh, you select the instrument, or you select the parameter or the the magnitude you want to measure, and then you go through that. I want to mention one of the joint research activities is as well directly related with uh, with hyperspectral details. This uh, the, the joint research activity number two that is coordinated by Ilsrusen from Vito is uh, related with the development of quality layers for bone hyperspectral imagery and data products. It's called HiQuapro. Again, I have no time and uh, in going through the details. Here are only the objectives, and I invite you to go to the to, to the website to find uh, all the progress in this. And just uh, the last slide is uh, uh, four conclusions I wanted to present here. One is the during the last 12 years, UFAR has shown to be a very useful forum to meet all the actors that participate in the environmental research uh, basing platforms. In this last edition, the program has implemented, we consider has implemented very valuable tools to the community of novel as experienced scientists, operators, funding agencies, and others. And uh, this is uh, what the result finally is has changed the way of, of uh, as we work. Uh, we have to follow all the all the blogs, the discussion the has been very exciting, and I, I think now is work, working very smoothly, uh, I mean, uh, the feeling we have, the operators and the users, that the feeling we receive is, is really a very useful and, and productive tool. And then uh, we consider the addition of the hyperspectral scientific community through the merge uh, of HIDESA and at the end of FP6 to become F F UFAR FP7 has enriched the whole consortium. Uh, I think I have presented some, some proofs this, is, this has been so. And then uh, we think sincerely we have contributed to the success and, the and as well we have got a lot of benefit of, of it. And then uh, for the future, okay, the future is very uncertain because we have received in, now in, in mid-March very poor evaluation um, by the evaluators, of uh, independent evaluators of F F EC FP7. And then, uh, as I said, the, our future is uh, unknown, uncertain, and then it puts in, in high risk the results we have achieved. Uh, we are taking, uh, last uh, was uh, past uh, Monday, we had a meeting in order to agree some surviving actions to keep the consortium, consortium alive and ready to prepare and improve an innovative and competitive uh, proposal up to the new EC call. There are new options to guarantee the sustainability of the macro infra infrastructure created up to now, and then uh, now they are under assess assessment. And that is. So I want to thank for your attention and thanks to the people who has provided me the material to I have present today. And I hope to see you in Kreflas in about three weeks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jose Antonio.
Thank you, San Antonio. And um, time for a quick question, or maybe we can keep it for the final discussion, or if you have questions. Jose is going to be here. Yes, uh, I'll be in the afternoon. So. In the afternoon, so, okay. So, okay, so we can move to the next uh, presentation given by Andreas Hueni about the Apex system. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'll um, go through this agenda, so I'll um, give you an introduction to um, IPEX, then I'll show how we move from data acquisition to products, I'll um, go into the operational processing, how it is implemented at uh, our partner Vito, and I'll also show some product examples. So IPEX, um, has been an ESA project under the Prodex um, rules. So practically, uh, Switzerland and Belgium agreed to pay um, the cost to develop this instrument. And then it's been implemented by uh, Ruag Aerospace and uh, also the, the Belgian company OIP for the um, sensors and optics. Now, you're probably pretty aware of the, the principle of imaging spectrometers. Um, what I want to point out here is that uh, APEX is uh, imaging in the uh, wavelengths region 380 to 2500 nanometers and we are using a uh, prism to disperse the light. So I've already been saying this was a ESA products project. Practically this means that this is the um, currently only ESA airborne uh, imaging spectrometer. Um, it includes a uh, calibration home base which is situated at DLR and also processing and archiving facility which is um, run by VITO. The, the idea uh, behind APEX was to, to build an instrument that could simulate, calibrate and validate um, future and also existing spaceborne missions and generally at the time if we look now at uh, at the history this started say 20 years ago when uh, at that time the only instrument available was the uh, American Avaris and it came over here to, to Europe to be uh, flown and uh, it was the feeling that uh, the Europeans should have a similar instrument. This is why um, funding sources were identified and essentially it, it took a long time till 2008 when we got the first test flight. Um, we had more flights in the following years leading up to an instrument acceptance by ESA in 2010, by the end of 2010, so practically last year was the first um, public operations of the instrument. And it, then it's been also entered into the, the UFAR uh, pool of instruments. Uh, these two plots show you the spectral range and also um, the spectral response functions, if, if you like. So we've got um, two sensors built in, uh, a FNIR over here and a SVIR. Um, the FNIR covers the 380 to about 1000 nanometer region and this is in the, the unbent case. So we've got a very high resolution in the blue and if you move to the, the uh, like higher wavelengths here up to 1000 nanometers the response functions are getting broader. And usually uh, these channels in the blue are then binned together spectrally, which gives us a default of uh, 114 spectral channels in the FNIR and 
a default of about 200 channels in the sphere. The system, uh, the, the main part of the system is obviously the, the sensor. It's in this um, black container here. Um, this sits on a stabilizing platform, uh, which is then contained in this environmental control box, which is stabilized by this thermal control unit here. And obviously there's also an instrument um, rack controlling the whole thing. Now, uh, as we fly, we usually have um, sequences prepared which will specify the, the instrument settings, then we acquire dark current, imaging lines are acquired, followed by dark current again, then we prepare for the next imaging which might have different settings and we acquire one line after the other. So that is the data acquisition during flight. Now to calibrate the instrument we move to the calibration environment which is provided at the CHB calibration home base at DLR, Oberpfaffenhofen. Um, there we characterize and calibrate the instrument. Out of this, we eventually um, generate what we refer to as calibration cubes. Now these are calibration coefficients which um, are specific for every spatial spectral pixels um, of the sensor. So this will give you, for example, um, the, the gains uh, and offsets for the radiometric calibration. And um, within the Apex processing and archiving facility, we then um, process the raw data, eventually up to level one, which is a radiometric calibrated data. The operational processing is carried out at VITO. So they've got uh, uh, the computers that actually do all the work. This is um, a system which is based on a master worker um, scheme. So you've got a master that takes in all the, all the orders to be processed, then distributes um, the actual processing to some worker nodes, and in the end collects the results. We will look at this um, in detail. So there's um, users can access this processing system through the internet as well as operators which can control the system. Um, so this is going to show the, the whole setup of this archiving and processing system. So what happens here is um, we got Apex data which is injected into this archiving workflow. This is practically segregating the data and um, entering the information in a product and processing database. This is just a collection of metadata telling um, what um, imagery is available and at what processing level. Um, then the, these data are entered into the data archive. If now a user yeah, down here wants to access data, um, they can browse via the internet, they create an order, this order is entered into this product processing database and this then triggers a processing according to the level that is required. After the processing um, and this Process data are then, depending on the level, also inserted into the data archive. So if people process that again, it's just gotten out of the archive, obviously. And uh, finally, you get it via FTP account and you download it. Uh, within this uh, level 0 to uh, 2, 3 processing, there is actually this um, processor developed by RSL, University of Zurich. Uh, which does the, the data format checks, data segregation, and the data calibration. So that's like raw to level one is done by this processor. This processor is installed at um, the VTO operational processing facility. Uh, the VTO processing uh, also allows to uh, do atmospheric correction. This is based on the 
uh, mod train simulation, what, what they can do is you can do a, you know, like for example, tools like AdCore, they've got a predefined lookup table. Now what they can do, because they've got a lot of processing power, is they can um, do these lookup tables on the fly. So for every um, scene you, you, you want to have processed, they are actually computed in real time. That's what um, the web pages look like. So if you want to order products, you'd, you'd have to obviously have a user access. But then you select a uh, mission or you uh, search via the sensor or via the, the product level you want. In any case, you'll get a certain amount of data that um, complies to your research, uh, like search criteria. There's also quick looks that are in fact also geo-referenced if you want to put them into a GIS. Now you select the images you want to process. Then um, as we've selected already level one, there's level two processing to be done. You select uh, the bands you want to uh, have in the output. The next thing is uh, you can have a few options about uh, BRDF processing regarding uh, atmospheric and target BRDF. You can also um, go for certain uh, bands you want to specify here. Uh, you also need, especially if it's a hilly terrain, uh, you should have a digital elevation model. As a fallback, the system uses the SRTM. Uh, obviously, uh, if you supply your own DEM, you'll get the better results. Okay, so off you go. And once you've um, ordered this particular processing, you can view your orders. Um, a few of them will have here success because they've, that's just your total ordering history over the years. And then you see the one which is currently submitted. And then you just wait till you get the email telling you the download point. point. As a um, operator, you can look into this in detail. You can look at all the, the current uh, jobs that are running on these processing nodes. And by the way, this, this system was developed by Vito. And it's, it's very generic. You can practically, if you've got a process, you just plug this thing uh, into this generic chain and it'll uh, do the processing. Now a few quick looks. Um, these are just band combinations. So the first one is uh, the normal uh, true color. Then we've got this uh, false color infrared one. And this one is also pretty fancy. Combines um, just three bands that are um, carrying information about cellulose, hydrocarbon, and canopy structure. OK, that's the, the pretty pictures. So um, for, the, for the real products, we've got the vegetation toolbox. This has been um, developed by Alex Dam. And practically, it's not really restricted to Apex. You could use any uh, sensor, given that it's got a, a proper uh, spectral resolution. And what you can get out of it is uh, you know, various canopy variables like uh, water content, dry matter, with a leaf area index, it can also uh, extract fluorescence and um, pigments. Here's a few um, examples of such a, a product output. So like the, for example, the PRI down here or this uh, Tikari Osavi output. Uh, the, the pigment outputs. And what is quite interesting is what we lately tried is to combine the, the three pigments into one pigment composition. We just do a false color um, image by uh, normalizing the total to 100%. So you, you get somehow like you're somehow moving within this triangle here in terms of color combinations, whatever the pigment composition is. Now you'd have to ask the expert 
what what this really means if you got a certain color so like okay were these trees maybe not that healthy already building up more like the, the reddish hue and colors or whatever that's a uh, output of the, this um, vegetation toolbox this is a, a study site in the Swiss Midlands, which we've now flown uh, every year with Apex over the past three or four years. So we're starting to build up a time series. And I think one of the more exciting products on this study site is the fluorescence. Now, like Alex has been playing around with um, retrieving the fluorescence with the Fraunhofer uh, line depth um, method. And it does work, although the, the spectral resolution is is not super fine we be getting. It, it appears that we can still retrieve uh, some results that are quite meaningful. So if we look into the, the detail here, we've got a few uh, fields we picked out. So this one here, so the, the, the lighter in color, the, the higher the fluorescence value. So this one is um, some, some barley or whatever um, field, which was quite green this is a grassland and then uh, one which is really low fluorescence is one of these ones where there's just a new growth starting so in, in that respect it um, that made already pretty much sense and um, we've also had some ground data which we compared then with the retrieved information from apex and I, I believe the correlations are actually quite, quite satisfying. Obviously, you need to uh, fiddle around a bit with the atmospheric uh, assumptions in to, to get to these results in the end. Uh, what, what is actually an interesting property is that uh, in this fluorescence data, we are not seeing any BRDF effects across track, which is actually suggesting that uh, the fluorescent signal is not influenced by the, the BRDF characteristics of the target. Uh, finally, I'd like to point out that we've now got a, what we call the Apex Open Science Dataset. This is a little example cube which is available on the internet. So if you go to um, apexeza.org, yeah, it's down here, you'll find somewhere um, uh, like a tab called data. There's a link to free data cubes. This um, is about 800 megabytes. It's corrected to um, hemispherical conical reflectance factors. It's still the raw geometry, so there's no resampling. Um, being done, but it's not so important because we just want to point out uh, the spectral characteristics of the data cube. So if you want to have a play with that, just go and um, get it. And um, that will be all. Open for questions. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Andreas. Any questions? John? Mm. Oh, yeah, let me see. And also how much work has been done to link that to either species composition or known cover types. Um, Well, I actually, so that the, the principle of this is, um, let me see if there's details. Yeah, so this, this one's um, practically using this radiative transfer model. So you are building up a looked up table, full certain uh, parameter ranges, and then you just um, try to find the, the best fitting spectrum and uh, that's how you get uh, the pigment compositions out of it. That's how I um, understand it, at least for the um, K 
can be chlorophyll, water dry matter content. So about the other pigments, I cannot cannot say whether this is through the same tool. And in terms of uh, ground validation, um, not too sure about that either. You'd have to ask Alex about the details. Any other question? So, question in general for the flight missions. Um, the one of the directions that I, I know NASA has taken is to move from missions to measurements. So, meaning you know having a sensor and then collecting all the data and then figuring out you know what what variables we can get from it, but. They focus more on basically taking okay, we need to understand carbon in the Arctic. So so we basically fly missions with multiple sensors. Um so is is that a direction that ESA and you know the previous presentation as well, is that a new direction that you think that the European com community might be taking to focus more on specific variables? Yeah, this this could be the case. I think what what might point to this is this um uh experimental aircraft DLRs now. Uh operating or started to operate, I think this year, this, this halo, high altitude, uh, long range observations, I think it's standing for. I mean, it's got all these instrument base and and, uh, and the wing pods. So you could start to, to build multiple experiments on the same aircraft to observe one specific phenomenon. I mean, we, we had the idea of maybe doing um, like the, the the melting processes in the, in the tundra, where you want to have methane mapping or things like that. This this could be one of these tools. The the thing is though that, and and for for such a aircraft, you would want to combine instruments as many as possible to contribute to the to the horrendous cost of such an aircraft because one flight hour on this aircraft is about 20,000 euros. So flying from here to the Arctic and back again, you can do it in a day, but it'll be a long day and it will be a costly day. So, yeah. And then there's also this comparisons with the the satellite data along with that as well. So, yeah, so yeah. if you're collecting some information, collect it at the correct time, but you've got multiple measurements from a train or some of those other satellite missions as yeah, well. Yeah. So. Yes, but uh, I would like to add for this last question that we have not been successful in Europe to do that. Uh, yeah. And I think we have to, because we have some discussions with NASA how to join activities and maybe try to uh, do in Europe like uh, NASA is doing. But unfortunately, we have not been able to do that, and UFAR uh, is, will stop the activities next year. So basically, uh, we have this problem now in Europe that we have to find out how to really solve the problem. And basically, the point is, this is wh why the proposal has not been accepted, is I think that uh, most of the activities were focused on, let's use one instrument of one aircraft, and let's see what we can do with this aircraft, while the approach is, let's have a science problem and try to solve the scientific problem. And I think because of that, uh, we have not been successful, and now we don't have a program in Europe to, to do this research. So probably it's a lesson for the future to focus more on the scientific uh, activity rather than on the exploitation of particular instruments. Yeah, it's a quite a valid point, I think. It's probably also pointing to the fact that data were acquired by various institutions for the same reason, and then probably lessons are not really learned. I mean. Every time, honestly, every time I go to conferences, I hear the same story over and over again. And I wonder, why do we do this over and over again? It's, we, we are not moving forward. We are just learning that, yes, in this study area, the same applies what we already hear, uh, hear last year and the year before for a different place on this planet. So, yeah. We have progress. So the... the the vegetation toolbox that uh, you talk about, um, is that uh, available to be applicable to other hyperspectral sensors? Yeah, it would be, yeah. It's already available or is... is it is... 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, just write uh, Alex an email, okay. and and he'll he'll let you know. I expect. Yeah, I know he's uh, he's been using it also, applying this toolbox to the to ASD data. So practically, that's a one pixel <coughs> image, right? Other questions? No questions? Apparently. So thank you for your presentation. We should move on to Jose Moreno's presentation, which is focusing on upscaling fluorescence observations and linking these ob observations with Flux Tower and ground validation networks. So I will try to give an overview of the Fluorescence Explorer mission and uh, also emphasize the links of this mission with the network of flux towers and ground validation networks because from the very beginning the mission is not conceived only as a satellite but uh, basically as a scientific problem which is the mapping of vegetation photosynthesis and carbon assimilation. And for that we have to use on the one hand the satellite but on the other hand the ground networks and, and all the available tools. So what I will try to uh, outline is basically the scientific motivation for the mission, the requirements, uh, give us some words about the technical concept and feasibility, and then I will try to describe the current status and perspective. The mission is currently in phase A, so some of the things are still in discussion and the, the mission is being, being uh, now prepared. So what is the context of that? Basically the context is what uh, ISA called the Living Planet Program, which is a general program for uh, Earth observation that includes basically two main elements. One is what they call Earthwatch, which are operational missions where uh, they have the uh, uh, implementation together with UMESAT, so Meteosat and Polar Satellites, also in cooperation with the NOAA and in the States. And then the new missions called Sentinels, which is the operational uh, missions uh, uh, that are supposed to last for 20 years and provide this kind of uh, operational data. On the other side, there is the, what they call the scientific program, which is Earth Explorer, which are more research-driven uh, missions. And then they, ha they have already six missions which are approved, or some of them already launched, like OCHE to measure the uh, gravitational field, EOLUS to measure the wing speed uh, in the atmosphere, the vertical profile of wing, EarthCare, which is to measure the impact of clouds on the radiation balance, and then Cryosat, uh, which is uh, to uh, understand the behavior of polar ice. Then SMOS to measure ocean salinity and land uh, moisture, so soil moisture. And SWAR, which is to study the uh, Earth magnetic field. Then the next round are what they call Explorer 7 and Explorer 8. In Explorer 7, there are three candidates right now. One is biomass, which is a P-band radar to uh, monitor the carbon, the amount of carbon in forest. Then Courage 2 which is a mission dedicated to basically to study snow and uh, cold regions hydrology. And Premier, which is to understand the dynamics of the troposphere and the interaction of the troposphere and stratosphere in the atmosphere. Uh, then the uh, eight explorer candidates are only two. Usually they choose three missions for phase A and out of that one will fly. This will be the case for Explorer 7. But in Explorer 8, we only have two candidates, which are CarbonSat and Flex. So one of the two will fly as Explorer 8. So what is the mission concept for FLEX? Uh, summarizing in one single slide, basically most of the remote sensing tools that have been used so far, uh, this optical remote sensing in the past, were based on surface uh, reflectance so that you get the reflected light. From the reflected light, you get a part. And then from that, by making some approximations about the light use efficiency, then you get the carbon assimilation, GPP. 
But there is always a discussion about this, how this can work, because light use efficiency, in, in, the, in the preliminary definition of light use efficiency, the idea was that light use efficiency is constant, and then the only thing that changes is the radiation. Then the question is from where do you get this constant, and this constant depends on, on several uh, different factors. It could be uh, water stress, but it could be light stress, or it could be nutrient stress, or other kind of stresses, or other kind of circumstances. So light use efficiency is not really so constant, and actually it varies even from the morning to the afternoon. So the approach that we measure the radiation variability, and just assuming that the light use efficiency is provided somehow, then we get the carbon assimilation is not really uh, working very well. Then the alternative here is to use a new thing which has not been used so far uh, by any uh, satellite, which is the fluorescence emission. And the idea is that the absorbed light in the vegetation basically, basically can split into three uh, elements. One is the uh, fluorescence, the other one is photosynthesis, and the other one is heat, heat dissipation. So the total amount of light that uh, has been absorbed has to be distributed in one of these three. But after the plan is a climate, uh, there is a, a, a good um, um, interaction between the amount of uh, light going for photosynthesis and the amount of light uh, uh, that is uh, emitted at fluorescence. Both becomes highly correlated, and you can actually measure fluorescence to estimate the amount of light, absorbed light that has gone to photosynthesis, and from that uh, estimate the carbon assimilation. So this is the approach that we will follow in FLEX to go from fluorescence and absorbed light to directly to GPP. Uh, what is fluorescence? Uh, basically, all the remote sensing done so far was based on absorption of light. When you have electrons in the ground state and the light arrives to the uh, chlorophyll, the, uh, fo the electrons uh, become excited, and then uh, immediately the, uh, they go back to the ground state, and the light is emitted. And this is what we call reflected light, and the, uh, this allows us to measure the absorption. But uh, actually, some of the light is converted internally so that the, when the electron goes from the uh, high energy level to the low energy level, the amount of energy that has to spend to go back to the ground state is less than the amount of light that is was the amount of energy that was needed for the absorption. Basically, this translates into an emission which is of uh, less energy than the energy that was absorbed, which basically means is that the, en the uh, light is emitted for longer wavelength. And this is the, the difference in the absorption and fluorescence would allow us to decouple what, what is the amount of light that has been absorbed and the amount of light that has been emitted. This is just because of this shift in wavelengths due to the internal conversion of energy that some of this energy basically go to photosynthesis. In normal uh, solar illumination conditions, the amount of uh, emitted light as fluorescence has a maximum in two peaks, which are around 690 nanometers and 740 nanometers, which is called the red and far red uh, emission. There is also two small peaks, one in the blue and another in the green, which are related also to uh, different status of the plant, but these peaks are very, very small. Only when you use laser excitation with UV, then you get a strong uh, emission back in the blue and the green. But for normal illumination conditions, the most interesting fluorescence is coming in the, in the red and, and near infrared region. In order to use this fluorescence, we need to decouple the amount of light which has been absorbed by chlorophyll. This is why we need uh, high spectral resolution instruments on the one hand to separate the APAR absorption into absorption by chlorophyll content and chlor absorption by carotenoids and, and other, other pigments. And then out of the total light that has been absorbed, basically around 80% in the best case goes to photosynthesis, around 20% goes to uh, heat and uh, less than 2% usually goes to fluorescence. So fluorescence is a very small signal. However, because of the correlation between the different dissipation mechanism, uh, there is a very strong correlation between the amount of light which is emitted as fluorescence and the amount of light which is used for photochemistry. And this is what we exploit. But uh, I would like to emphasize from the very beginning that the amount of light is less than 2%. So it's really a very, very weak signal. Uh, actually, until very recently, it was considered like a part of the noise. But uh, because of the sensitivity we have now in the detectors and the, the mm, instrumental capabilities, this is why we can now detect such, uh, such a small signal. 
Now, what are the scientific objectives for, for these things? Basically, we have four main scientific objectives. The first one is the global, vegetation, the global monitoring of carbon assimilation by, by vegetation, basically mapping the photosynthetic efficiency at the global scale, and the activation and deactivation of photosystems. In some cases, like for instance, boreal forests, uh, you have all the time the forest there, but uh, during winter, there is no photosynthesis at all, and only during summer, you get photosynthesis, and you see, uh, you measure the fluorescence, you see uh, activation and deactivation mechanism. And this week, we can also map these kind of things with fluorescence. And for the rest, when you have continuous uh, photosynthetic capa capacity, basically you track the photosynthetic uh, activity with the fluorescence. The second objective is the link between photosynthesis, I mean carbon exchange, and transpiration. And we know that in climate models, particularly for climate models that are trying to predict what will happen in the future, one of the key elements is the link between carbon and water cycles. Because the, at the leaf level, carbon and water cycles are automatically linked. If you monitor better the carbon cycle, then you can also improve the things in, in the water side as well. This has an impact over the third objective, which is the vegetation stress monitoring. So far, there is no really good indicators of vegetation stress monitoring, and this is something that can be provided by fluorescence, because as soon as you get some stress, then you, you will notice that immediately in the amount of fluorescence. And finally, the fourth objective is the anthropogenic impact uh, associated to the, you, the human activities in, in changing land use. The main scientific topic is the link with the carbon models, and uh, the main issue here is that all the remote sensing methods that we have been used so far can provide, in the best case, what we call potential photosynthesis, which is the uh, potential activity, photosynthetic activity that we have in the plant, but not the real, the actual photosynthesis that the plant will make. And in the best case, plants can do up to 80, 82% uh, photosynthesis, but in some cases they can do 0% photosynthesis, even though they are receiving the same amount of light. So the actual Variability in photosynthesis can go from 0 to 80%. So it's really a huge uh, variability. And we need tools to map, to map this uh, uh, photosynthetic activity. So what we, uh, uh, what we have established in the mission is that from, from fluorescence, you can say something about photosynthesis. Now, if we get additional information, then we can also say something about GPP, that means carbon assimilation. The reason for that is that from photosynthesis to carbon assimilation, there are other issues. This is why we don't like to say that from fluorescence you can get GPP. So basically from fluorescence you can get photosynthesis and then from photosynthesis with some additional inputs you, you can get uh, the uh, carbon assimilation because that depends on C3 and C4 plants and, and other things. So the primary objective of the mission is to measure vegetation fluorescence and to quantify the photosynthetic activity of terrestrial ecosystems. And the main reason for that is that, in, in all the, first of all, there is a lot of uh, differences between models. So what you have here is the uh, prediction of GPP in Europe for just two models. And you see that even the pattern, not only the absolute values, even the pattern is totally different from, the from one model to another. On the other hand, the, if you try to correlate the variability uh, of in GPP, uh, there is some correlation with the variability, spatial and temporal variability in uh, absorption of light, and then also another kind of correlation, also spatial and temporal, with the uh, light use efficiency. The total GPP is basically the product of both, but we want to understand what, what is the variability associated to variability in the light absorption, and what is the variability associated to variability in light use efficiency. And this is important not only to map the actual status today of GPP, but also for people involved in IGPP or uh, IPCC reports and you know, trying to understand what will happen uh, 50 or 100 years from now, the understanding of the actual mechanism with that uh, differentiates from uh, absorption of light from light use efficiency is very important for, for the models trying to predict the future. The secondary objective is the link the, between uh, carbon and water cycle and also to link between the uh, fluxes of carbon and fluxes of water, uh, sensible heat, lead and heat and, and all these things. The problem, as I said before, is that fluorescence is a very small signal, so how we can measure fluorescence? The basic, princi the basic principle is that if you have incoming light, uh, as you have on the, on the left panel, if there is only reflected light, particularly if you work in a small spectral region where you can assume that reflectance is 
pretty much constant over this small spectral region. The amount of light that we, you will measure will be basically proportional to the amount of light which is incoming. So the radiance and irradiance will be proportional. However, if there is fluorescence emission, there will be an additional light that you will see that is not just proportional to the amount of light incoming. So basically, if you plot uh, radiance versus irradiance, the slope of this relationship will tell you the reflectance, and the intercept will tell you the fluorescence. And this is basically the principle uh, we use for that. If you have only a few points, then you, you can uh, extrapolate the line like this. If you have more points, which is the case for flex, we will do a spectral fitting method where we have many, many channels. And, and for every channel, you can write this equation. So you have a system of equations. You solve the system of equations. And then you decouple the fluorescence and the reflectance uh, factors. What you need for that, basically, is to work in a very small spectral region where there is a, a very strong change in atmospheric transmittance, while uh, the fluorescence and reflectance is pretty much constant. And this is true in some spectral regions, like, for instance, in Fraunhofer lines or uh, strong absorptions in the atmosphere. There are two approaches, basically. One is to uh, rely on Fraunhofer lines, which are originated in the atmosphere of the sun, so it's already in the solar irradiance, or uh, atmospheric absorption features like oxygen absorption. For a number of reasons, we, we selected uh, uh, the oxygen absorptions plus some uh, Fraunhofer lines. But at the end, the most promising lines are the oxygen A and oxygen B, particularly because if you look at the fluorescence emission and you look at the location of the oxygen absorptions, they are very well located just very close to the peak of emissions in 690 and 740. So basically, uh, by looking at the two oxygen absorption bands, oxygen A and oxygen B, you can see what is the overall uh, fluorescence spectrum emission and then quantify the total fluorescence which has been emitted. Of course, you, uh, you need to do some calculations in terms of signal to noise, spectral sampling needed, et cetera. But the other reason for having these two spectral bands is because most of the fluorescence can be explained as the contribution of the two photosystems, the photosystem one and photosystem two. While photosystem one uh, basically is providing most of the information in the 760 band, the photosystem one, photos sorry, the photosystem two is basically providing most of the information in the 690 band. So by looking at the two oxygen absorptions, then uh, you can say on the one hand how much photosynthesis in total is being made, but also what is the relative impact of the photosystem one and photosystem two. So how efficient is the vegetation in, in uh, the electron current that ultimately go uh, to the production of the carbon-carbon uh, simulation. So, uh, by looking at the two things, on the one hand, the total fluorescence emission and also the splitting between the two photosystems is how we, we plan to improve the current situation for monitoring photosynthesis. But on the other hand, it was clear from the very beginning that there is an additional source of information. If you uh, try to make experiments where you see the variability in surface reflectance, then you will see that there are basically three main peaks of variability. One is located around 690, and the other one is located around 740, are the two which are associated to fluorescence emission. But there is another peak of variability located around 300 and, uh, 530, which is related to the PRI, so the variability associated to the Santofield cycles and, and uh, other dynamics in, in vegetation. So we want to cover also this. This is why the emission is formulated in such a way that we cover the full range from 500 to uh, 800, describing on the one hand the PRI, the chlorophyll absorption, the red edge, the fluorescence emission, and all this is included in the, in the emission. We have done quite a lot of uh, studies uh, try to quantify what is the signal to noise we need to measure fluorescence, and also the signal to noise we need to measure PRI dynamics. And uh, I will not go to the detail, but this is some results of some of the experiments. So at the end, the emission has been designed so that we can provide this sensitivity which is needed to measure fluorescence, but also the sensitivity which is needed to really say the dynamics of PRI. And uh, it will, we will not use just two, or two bands for PRI. We will use the full spectral range. Uh, in the region of PRI, we are working with a resolution of 0 0.5 nanometers, but the data will be transmitted to, uh, with two nanometer resolution, but there's still enough to see the spectral variability in, in PRI as well. The, the next step is to choose the technology. Uh, after you have scientific objective and you know the requirements, you need to signal to noise, spectral sampling, and all these things, then you have to choose the technology. 
I will not enter into the details, but basically we have been discussing all potential technical solutions, uh, including grating spectrometers in different ways, fabric perotin spectrometers, linear variable filters, Fourier transform spectrometers, and all of these. For every uh, option, we have been studying the spectral range, resolution, temporal registration issues, signal to noise, and technical feasibility. Of course, also the cost. There is a lot of activities going on in this well, but finally we will choose the grating spectrometer because it's the best, the best solution. And here you have the two configurations we have right now. Uh, in one case, we use uh, spherical mirrors just to eliminate as much as possible the contamination by a stray light and other uh, spectral artifacts. As you can imagine, the key problem here is that we are measuring a signal which is extremely low. So any technical problem in terms of spectral stability, uh, noises, uh, stray light, or you know, any, any disturbance that pr can produce uh, reflectance with some noise, for us, it will kill the mission because we will not see the fluorescence. So we have to be very careful on eliminating all the technical problems. And this complicates quite a lot of the technical design of the, of the mission. So right now we have two designs. Usually for these missions, we have always two designs in phase A, and then one of the two has to be selected uh, for implementation. As you can see, the two designs right now are very different, but both are based on, on immersed grating spectrometers or kind of uh, fancy new technology. As you can see, and this is causing quite a lot of problems. This is why I was very happy to see uh, that there is an activity uh, supporting PRI, because if you, if you see at the plot carefully, you will notice that the PRI requires an additional uh, focal plane, which costs uh, several millions. So the engineers will be happy if we just drop the PRI and focus only on the oxygen absorptions to get fluorescence. But I was from the very beginning saying that no, we need, for scientific reasons, PRI and fluorescence together. And this will make the mission slightly more costly, but uh, we have a dedicated uh, uh, optical bands and uh, a dedicated focal plane to measure PRI and then the red edge and, and on all the things together in the same instrument so that we don't have calibration issues or co-registration issues because all the things will be measured all together. And this uh, full spectrum from 500 to uh, 800 nanometers with 0 0.1 nanometer resolution. So it's really, uh, you will see every small atmospheric absorption feature and everything. The other thing is what is the optimal observing time because uh, we are looking at things which are dynamics. And there is a dynamics in time in terms of monthly or seasons, or, but there is also a dynamics in terms of uh, daily variability. And after a number of studies, uh, we came to the conclusion that the optimum observation time is around 10 o'clock in the morning, because this is the compromise between uh, maximum light, but on the other hand, maximum variability in uh, absorption of light uh, splitting between photosynthesis and fluorescence. So we, 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 this, this is what uh, we really want to measure. So the, the mission has been designed to, to measure around 10 o'clock in the morning, but you have to take into account that when you are flying in a, a satellite, there is a difference in local time. For instance, for a single orbit like here, when you are flying 10 o'clock in the Ecuador, that means that uh, in the North, Polo, the North Pole is already noon, it's uh, almost 12, while in close to the uh, South Pole is nine in the morning. So there is uh, uh, several hours difference in the observation time. You have to optimize that and also take into account the amount of light that the plants have been exposed before the satellite pass over because uh, the amount of fluorescence will also be a function of the history of light, not only the particular illumination conditions at the time of the flight, but what has been the history in the previous hours. So it was a number of tricky things to optimize the orbit but finally, to be, we came to this uh, um, optimal solution. And for the implementation, the main problem was that if you put together all the elements uh, we need to have in order to measure everything, uh, uh, imaging spectrometer covering the visible and near infrared, including the SWIR, also thermal information, because we want to know the temperature of the canopy uh, to relate the photosynthesis to the actual temperature. And we also want to measure the aerosols, optical thickness, because uh, mm, we, our, our, uh, our signal is very sensitive to atmospheric corrosion, so we want to do the best possible atmospheric corrosions. For that, we will need to have a dual imager to look through the atmosphere, through different paths. At the end, the mission was proposed in a single satellite doing everything, but of course, it was extremely expensive. 
So the mission was not selected like this because it was very expensive. And we decided to change the mission concept. And the mission concept right now is that we fly together with Sentinel-3 in tandem. In tandem means it's just a few seconds separation from one satellite to another. We, are, we have to fly very, very close one to the other because, for instance, the information about cloud screening, cirrus clouds, atmospheric aerosols, and all these things will be provided by Sentinel-3. And we will use the same information. So we have to make sure that we are flying under the same atmosphere. This is why we are separated by just a few seconds. And we provide only the uh, full spectral resolution in the PRI, uh, absor oxygen, oxygen absorption, and red edge. And everything else is provided by Sentinel-3. Uh, by doing this, the mission becomes very cheap. And this is why we are now selected for phase A and phase B. And I hope the mission can be implemented in this concept because this uh, makes the mission feasible uh, flying together in tandem with Sentinels. From the very beginning, it was clear that, uh, and this is something I have been emphasizing in all the meetings, we should not make the case that one satellite will solve the scientific problem. The scientific problem is much more serious, and it will not be one single satellite that will tell the answer. So from the very beginning, the mission is presented in a way that we really work together with the tower sites, the validation network, the CAL validation sites, and other satellites which are providing routine data like meteorological data. And we really exchange all the information between uh, our mission and the other mission. And the whole processing scheme is, is planned to do uh, in doing all together to derive the, uh, the final product. For instance, one of the things we are doing very closely with the uh, flash net network, network is to, un to optimize the timing of observations and the uh, periodicity we need. For instance, you can measure GPP every day in every station. So what we have done is to choose a number of stations and then select the data for 10 o'clock in the morning, so the time of observation. Exclude also the, the observations that were contaminated by clouds, because we can see from the tower uh, what observations were contaminated by clouds. So we exclude these uh, points. And, and then we look at uh, what is the periodicity we will need to really observe the dynamics, the temporal dynamics of GPP and a number of things. So all these things is ongoing. Uh, still, of course, this optimization of the orbits and things like that, so not everything is possible. But at the end, the conclusion is that with the uh, frequency of observations and observing only around 10 o'clock in the morning by doing some scaling to the daily cycle and also seasonal scaling and temporal scaling, we can uh, link the daily observations in the towers, but only in some points to the uh, more, uh, less frequent observation from space, but continuous math provided by remote sensing uh, through the scaling exercise. And this is linked to some of the observations in towers. I will skip some material. Another point I would like to emphasize is that during the preparation of the mission, we have developed a number of new instruments that can now be installed in towers. Some of them have been presented before by uh, Nicole Rossini. Uh, some of the instruments are, will be tested for the first time this year. For instance, this PAFLEX system, which is a uh, passive active flex sensor, which is a combination of uh, LIDARs, a sighting canopy with uh, active uh, light, and comparing these values of fluorescence with the fluorescence that is uh, resulting from the excitation from the sun. And this is the instrument. Uh, it's a multi-spectral instrument, but uh, with a number of bands. Some of the bands are the PRI. So basically, the instrument provides PRI with the two bands, classical bands. And then uh, the other bands are optimized for fluorescence. And this is supposed to be installed in a tower uh, measuring continuously. And there are a number of instruments like this. There are also an airborne instrument that has been developed and we will fly for the first time uh, in July. So there are a number of activities. And using these capabilities, we are doing some experiments. So in some cases, in combination also with flux towers, where they measure from the aircraft the CO2 footprint and the uh, uh, fluxes and we measure the fluxes from, from fluorescence and then compare the GPP uh, derived from, from the flux uh, aircraft and the GPP derived from the fluorescence. There is a number of activities going on trying to show that, uh, uh, yes, we can really uh, retrieve uh, fluorescence and GPP from, from our data. Uh, concerning PRI, we have done also some experiments in, in boreal forests, and here you can see uh, uh, in the plot, the uh, red points represent the carbon flux, and the blue points represent the PRI. And you see there is a clearly a uh, trend uh, in, in fluxes that you can also map by looking at the trends and PRI and 
uh, also for fluorescence. What we have seen is that really is complementary information. It's not telling the same story. PRI shows some dynamics, and fluorescence is showing some a different a different story. So it's really the combination of the two was what tells you the uh, what is really going on in terms of carbon dynamics. There is also a this issue about the levels of application between uh, difference in time from exploring up to the capability to predict what will be the feature, so the link with the modeling community, and the, uh, going from the very basic things about calibration, validation, up to the uh, more um, forecasting or uh, looking to dynamical vegetation models, uh, predictive features. There's a lot of activities going on uh, in terms of preparation on the mission. Some of them just dealing with very basic calibration issues, and some of them going to the very high level uh, studies for uh, predicting climate change and things like that. Uh, concerning data processing, there is already uh, quite a lot of activities ongoing, how to link the different uh, variable, how to use the, all the information we have to map fluorescence, but also chlorophyll content, the amounts of absorbed light, uh, temperature, then go to the quantum efficiency of the different photosystems, the electron current, photosynthesis model, and finally GPP, but through uh, very detailed uh, uh, loop of different processes and everything is now being implemented to to have a full end-to-end -end mission simulator that allow us to to see what is the impact in the in the final models and we are also working with the modeling community to see what will be the impact on the global carbon models of the fact that we we do the processing like this uh, concerning the levels of product basically there will be three levels the level one are radiances the level two are fluorescence and level three photosynthesis and then depending on the local scale, regional scale, or global scale, there will be a, a different activities and different kind of products. For instance, at the local scale, photosynthesis will give uh, plant physiology uh, kind of data, while the global scale, uh, we will provide uh, global data for global carbon models. Um, and in between, there will be a number of, of different things. So this is a status. Uh, we are in phase A, B. Uh, it will be a user consultation meeting in 2014 where the uh, one of the two missions, either CarbonSat or Flex, will be selected for implementation. If we are selected, the launch will be around 2020. Uh, but in between, so you will not get Flex data the next day. You will uh, still we have some, some years for that. But there will be quite a lot of potential campaigns in the next years with the new developed instruments, particularly high plan, but uh, uh, at least three or four new uh, instruments which are being developed. Um, we are looking for new sites. So there will be quite a lot of potential um, interest in the next year for campaigns and joint activities. So I think it will be a good opportunity for uh, Eurospec to try to work together on this. And that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, are there questions? Oh, this is a question. Another one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, this is really exciting. Um, I'm glad you argued for the extra grading, and I uh, hope that this succeeds because um, this has been missing for a long time. Um, I had some question about the fluorescence. There's something I don't really understand about this type of fluorescence measurement. Um, maybe you can explain to me. Um, it's not clear to me how you derive the effect, uh, the um, you know the ability to estimate photosynthesis really has potentially different factors or components. There's the sunlight, there's the chlorophyll content, both of which influence the fluorescence. But then there's also the quenching of the fluorescence with stress. So it's not clear from what you've presented whether we really understand how those how the fluorescence signal is partitioned between those three contributions. Um, do, you, do you have an answer for that, or is this still a, a, an area of <coughs> research, uh, would you say? Or? Uh, it's still an area of research, but something that I like very much uh, being involved in all these things is that we are really see how science makes progress. <laughs> because uh, when I started with this, everything was confusing. Actually, if you look at the data, in some cases you get positive correlation between fluorescence and photosynthesis. And in some cases, you, you get a negative correlation between photosynthesis and fluorescence. Right. Uh, in the last year, there was a lot of activities, one on the one side in terms of models, uh -huh. and on the other side in terms of measurements. So, so we collect quite a lot of measurements to understand this. But on the other hand, we develop models 
to try to understand what is going on and what is really the physical mechanism. And now we have very deterministic models which are able to explain uh, how all these things are linked, even for PRI, because uh, years ago it was no model linking the PRI variability with the fluorescence variability. We know there was some relation, but it was no a mechanicistic model that was able to explain that. For fluorescence, the explanation is easy. The, uh, if there is no enough light, then the different the different pathways of the f that the electron can can go uh, uh, after excitation basically the different pathways are competing between them so if the if the uh, if the electron go to to do photosynthesis then it will not go to do fluorescence in such case there is a negative correlation but when there is enough life so you have too many photons so actually you can saturate the the, uh, the photosynthesis current then there is a very strong correlation between fluorescence and, and photosynthesis. Of course, this depends on the amount of chlorophyll. This is why you have to measure the chlorophyll content as well. This depends on, 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 the, uh, on the temperature. This is why we want to measure the temperature as well. This is why from the very beginning we were saying, first we need to understand the basic mechanism and have a deterministic model that allow us to understand the different relationships. The other difference is that you know, there are other missions proposed uh, to measure fluorescence but measuring only fluorescence. What I have been saying from the very beginning is that measuring fluorescence alone is useless because right, fluorescence yeah. is a radiant. So you have to measure the chlorophyll content, you have to measure temperature, you have to measure a number of things, and then because all these things are correlated, then through the model you are able to decouple the different things. Yeah, well, I, I guess I, I understand your point, but it wasn't clear to me um, if or how all those things are being measured. I guess um, it seems to me that you have to constrain the problem and have all, you know, approach it from several places. But anyway, it sounds like a great mission. And <laughs> Let's see if the mission yeah, is selected. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, I have two questions. The first question is, you know, having the strain of sensors and satellites, I think it's, it's wonderful that you get multiple information from different satellites and combine them together. But, uh, What's, is there any contingency planning? You know, we've had a couple of failures on, on NASA for you know sensor launches. So, um, are you dependent on Sentinel three being successful in terms of getting some parameters? And if if God forbid something it it fails, are there um, is that going to put this mission in jeopardy? So that's. A I see your point. I know all the story about the contingency issues, and uh, and this was actually the reason for selecting Sentinel three. Mm -hmm. Because uh, sent there, well, there were other candidates, and, and we have discussions uh, with other other potential, even with other agencies. But uh, the reason why we choose Sentinel three is because this is called an operational mission. So basically, the rule for operation of Sentinel three is like the rule for operation of NOAA satellites. So if one satellite fails, uh, the agency should have another one re ready for launch, so they will be replaced immediately, and there will always be a Sentinel three in orbit. Okay. It's like a NOAA series that there, there will be operational. So it could okay. happen that for some small period, there is no satellite there. But the reason for choosing Sentinel-3 is that there is guarantee that the satellite will be there. OK. I had one other question, if I may. Um, the, w what's the temporal and the spatial coverage for this data? Um, you mentioned about some of the data products, but what's, what's the resolution and the spatial coverage? The temporal coverage? resolution. And well, the temporal resolution for uh, orbital repetition is uh, mm, 35 days in re on orbital repetition. But because of the SWAF, in most areas, we can cover with a week, uh, something like that. Yep. But the main, the main problem is that after choosing uh, Sentinel-3 as the partner for, for the tandem, the orbit is no longer, uh, there is very little margin for adjusting the orbit. So we can only adjust the, sw the SWAF. And this is why the repetition. In any case, uh, this is considered as a demonstration mission, which means that the uh, nominal time is 3.5 years. The reason for that is that we want to cover three uh, full seasonal cycles in both hemispheres. Mm -hmm. So the duration of the mission is 3.5 years plus six months commissioning. So basically, it's a four years mission. So it's not an operational mission, but it's within the program of the scientific demonstration program. So it basically, it's a four years uh, operation. About the spatial resolution? Uh, the spatial resolution is 300 meters. But the, uh, it's a kind of compromise. We have a lot of discussion about the, the, the spatial resolution. Obviously, there were people claiming that we need more and more resolution. Uh, modelers were 
happy with one kilometer data. So 300 meters is, is kind of compromise, and this will be the resolution. Any other question? Last question before we break. Yeah, I was wondering um, if, if I will understood, uh, you are planning to, to measure in one of the uh, O2 absorption bands to minimize the, the reflected light. But what are the risks that uh, since the emit uh, uh, fluorescence is a small amount of energy, what's, what is the risk of this emitted energy through the pass towards the atmosphere, towards the, the sensor, can be totally absorbed by the, by the oxygen? Well, first of all, uh, we, uh, we don't measure only in the oxygen absorption. Uh, we measure continuously from 500 to 800. So it's not just in the oxygen absorption. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of discussion from um, uh, how much energy is absorbed through the atmosphere. Because if you do the experiment on ground, and I will mention tomorrow about that, if you just measure, uh, if you just measure fluorescence on ground, and you put the f uh, your reflectance panel uh, uh, at a different distance from your target, then you will see that the small differences will cause uh, completely wrong fluorescence just because the oxygen absorption is very strong. But this is very strong at the surface level because the high pressure, when you go up in the atmosphere, the absorption is just a little more. It's, it's not proportional to the path because the, it's most on the ground level when you have more pressure. But I have a lot of efforts explaining that. I have to do quite a lot of simulation with Motran to show people that uh, this was really the case. So not mm -hmm. all the fluorescence is absorbed. This is why now we have satellites in orbit. Actually, for instance, MBSAT was measuring uh, in the oxygen absorption so that we can demonstrate it not only by running Motran to show that, the, yes, you, you, you can still see, uh, if not enough signal in the top of the atmosphere. We have seen that in, in satellites. We have seen that even in GOSAT, uh, which is also doing the uh, oxygen absorption measurement. But we have seen that in MERIS, in MBSAT. And actually, we, me we, we were able to program MERIS in a different, MERIS is programmable, programmable, so you can change the spectral bands. So we, uh, for several times, we changed the programming of MERIS to produce very uh, narrow bands in the oxygen absorptions and, and measure that from MPSAT, just to, to prove that we can really measure that uh, from space. So it has been demonstrated through many, many simulations, but we have seen that also in the data. So yes, it's true that there is a, quite a lot of absorption but uh, enough still okay. to measure fluorescence from space. Okay, mm, I think we should move to the last two presentations. Next presentation is going to be given by Agustin Lobo about light aerial remote sensing for carbon fluxes uh, within the uh, flux peer project framework. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me here. Thanks a lot to Pilar and the rest of the uh, organizers. I apologize not having been here this morning and missing the uh, very nice uh, presentations, but I had a, a little health problem. So um, um, this is going to be uh, rather naive compared to the other presentations because uh, we are going to talk uh, um, about uh, not only light, but uh, low cost remote sensing. Um, this um, work is being carried out within the uh, project Fluxpeer, which is um, a network between um, um, Spanish and French regions uh, 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 in the Pyrenees. And, and uh, the aim is in general to um, uh, advance in the uh, studies of climate and land use changes. And within this uh, project, we actually have established three um, uh, edicovariance uh, towers in the Pyrenees. So with the one of Alinea, this makes four of these uh, uh, installations in the Pyrenees right now. And um, my um, participation in, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the project was um, um, essentially focused on uh, getting um, systems that would be as um, low cost as possible to uh, complement and to help interpreting the information coming from the, uh, from the towers. 
So uh, the outline is a presentation, simple, first with just a little of context on the role of the remote sensing in the study of carbon dynamics and the problems involved on that. So some solutions to those problems based on time series of higher resolution satellite products and very high resolution imagery from light aerial remote sensing. So uh, the context is the uh, the role of CO2 of uh, remote sensing in this uh, in the study of carbon dynamics is first the direct sensing of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is something I do not work on, so we are not going to talk about that at all. But then, um, very importantly, is the sensing of the dynamics of the surface, um, helping to upscale the land CO2 fluxes from the EC towers, and also very important helping to understand the relationships between the CO2 fluxes and vegetation dynamics at the ecosystem level. On the other hand, uh, the towers are also very interesting for remote scientists, uh, remote sensing scientists. This is because um, understanding um, uh, natural phenomena having to cross levels of organization is very difficult. So, and this is always or almost always the case when you uh, go to the field and get data. Then you get the data at a very different, but such a different uh, scale that is actually a very uh, different level of organization. So the towers are great because they have a footprint and that footprint is already um, including, it's already working at the relatively similar level of organization. So the spatial the scale is not the same, but the level of organization is very much the same. So this is um, also uh, a big advantage. And, and this is actually the, the main reason why I have been attracted to the data coming from the EC towers, not actually to solve problems for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, community on, uh, on uh, CO2 uh, fluxes, but actually to understand through this data the problems I had with the images. So. <coughs> So um, the, the link between uh, what we get out of the um, EC flux towers and remote sensing is through gross primary productivity. And uh, this is because the gross primary productivity that can be through the flux partitioning be estimated uh, from the towers can also be estimated using uh, remote sensing. This has been done using in, in the 70s, using and, and since, the, since the 70s, using simple relationships between greenness, um, most of the time known as vegetation index, although that's a term that is insulting for any uh, plant biologist because vegetation cannot be reduced to an index. We do not talk about an atmosphere index, so I do not understand what the hell we talk about the vegetation index. Vegetation is multivariate and very complex. So we call it greenness and GPP. And then a bit more complicated using production efficiency models and even also some process-based models. Um, this uh, relationship between uh, the, uh, using tower data between the vegetation, uh, the greenness, and the uh, GPP from the towers has been well established in the literature. And some um, um, conclusions that come from all of these articles is that some uh, um, uh, indexes work better than others. EVI in particular works better than NDVI. And then that the relationship between these indices and GPP are, uh, are better for GPP than to um, uh, net ecosystem exchange, which makes sense. And then that there is a better, a much better relationship between annual integrations. And actually the fact that there is this um, better relationship between the annual integration is on the basis on, on, on why the production efficiency models work in the, in, in the, in the, in the measure they work. Another important um, conclusion is that the relationships are obviously uh, better for deciduous vegetation than for evergreen vegetation. And this is because what we are measuring from remote sensing is FA par. Then if F par varies a lot, then that means that we are getting a lot of that um, problem resolved by remote sensing. If FA par does not vary a lot, then these approaches are somehow a bit um, at the, uh, the extreme. So um, these uh, 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 production efficiency models are based on the integration of APAR and PAR, and 
light use efficiency. Sometimes light use efficiency is just considered constant or it is um, approached using um, meteorological stressors, no? temperature, precipitation, etc. This is um, this uh, second approach is correct if um, we just want to upscale the value that we have uh, for the uh, from the from the towers. But if those estimates are afterwards going to be used to um, discuss or to uh, analyze the relationship between GPP and climate change, then we are here in a tautology because we are including climate variables in the model and then we actually are trying to compare the model to the uh, time series. Mm -hmm. So it's much better, uh, this is why it is so important to try to derive like the use efficiency from other uh, remotely sensitive uh, variables like for example uh, PRI or even now uh, fluorescence. Mm -hmm. So part of the work we are doing is then, then um, analyzing this time series of uh, uh, from the uh, from the towers to um, uh, time series of uh, satellite images, uh, like we are doing with data in uh, Alinea. But the problem we have when we do that is that the, uh, um, the remote sensing uh, images that we have at hand are two cores. Mm -hmm. This is just to show you an example of this would be uh, the, the location of the uh, tower of Alinea in the Pyrenees, and this is. Um, and spot vegetation image at one kilometer resolution and it's an NDVI profile. Those are the situations of these four um, um, EC towers in the Pyrenees uh, right now. And here we just can see the uh, uh, relationship between the size of the footprint, the maximum size of the footprint, which is here uh, represented as a circle, and the size of the pixels that we are using. Mm -hmm. So we have here a problem. We have a, a, a problem of, an, of a resolution that is not appropriate for, the, for, the, for the, the interpretation of the problem we have at hand. So two sol solutions to this. First would be using a higher resolution time series of uh, satellite images at a higher resolution. We, for that, we can use the um, a series of Landsat images that have been produced by Thesbio. Thesbio is one of the partners in uh, Flux Print, so the, the Centre d'Etudes Spatiales de la Biosphere in Toulouse. And uh, then they have produced, I don't know if for the entire France or at least for all South France, um, this um, integrated uh, data set of uh, geometrically and atmospherically corrected Landsat images, taking the Landsat images from the USGS and also from ESA. So it's a very um, uh, impressive collection. Uh, we have just made a little tool in order to um, be able to visualize in the uh, GIS all the um, quick looks very fast so that we can select the uh, images that are cloud free and, um, uh, and shadow free also. And for example, we have the data we, that uh, are available for the Tower of Alinea. So you can see in, uh, in, um, in white, the white dots are the images that are available, and the red dots are the ones that are cloud and snow free. So for 2011, for example, it's a very good year. So it provides quite a good uh, uh, time series. And we are analyzing this time series for, this, uh, for Alinea. So we are selecting several pixels around the, uh, around the tower. And those would be the um, uh, NDVI values for the three years of, uh, that, for which we have um, data. Mm -hmm. Then the, um, the, the next um, uh, step, if, if um, uh, this resolution is still not enough and also uh, it's not so easy to get that many um, images from, uh, from Landsat for other um, uh, places in the world. So we decided to explore the way of getting our own time series using low-cost, high-resolution aerial products. So we have used, excuse me here, oops. So we have used, we have tested, uh, evaluated three different uh, systems. One is based on a, a UV and, uh, and well, actually is remotely controlled 
aerial vehicle, little aerial vehicle. Uh, another one is a little aircraft, a small aircraft. Uh, and then the Institute of Geomatics, which is also a partner in the, in the project, is developing um, a specific system that is integrating two different cameras, an RGB and an, an infrared camera, with all the navigation, uh, inertial systems, etc. So the products that we uh, thought that we would need to derive from these low-cost, high-resolution aerial images would be uh, and related to to the uh, to this work with the uh, with the EC tower, would be multi-temporal layers of vegetation indices at one meter resolution, detailed map of functional types from multi-spectral aerial imagery at about 20 centimeter resolution, and in both cases for the area covered by the EC tower and its context. So the goals uh, within Fluxpeer were to test different alternatives for acquiring the imagery, set up the methodology for planning and acquiring the imagery, and demonstrate the feasibility of the product. So the first system is this one that is based on the uh, uh, UAV, or uh, the remotely controlled vehicle. And it is um, operated by a um, commercial um, uh, enterprise, a commercial uh, company, which is uh, CAT UAV. And they have developed both the, uh, the uh, little airplane and integrated the cameras, the navigations. And they have developed this short of cabin in here that you can see in here, in which you have one screen, which is for the pilot. We've seen there is a navigation camera, so the pilot is being able to actually uh, control the, the, the vehicle. And then there is another display for uh, the planning of the campaign. So there, there is the, the different waypoints where you want to acquire the images, and then you know when the apron is over there, and then you just acquire the image at the appropriate time. And then it's using this um, uh, just, um, I call them tuned um, um, uh, cameras, RGB cameras, which are cameras to which uh, you just replace here. Which are cameras in which you just replace the um, uh, the uh, cutoff infrared filter that they have an app uh, that they have uh, inside, so that the CCD you is uh, you can you can this get the signal for the infrared from the CCD, and then you block with the blue filter, you block the, uh, uh, the blue light, and then you can use that band as uh, your infrared band. Mm -hmm. So this um, came to be uh, operationally very efficient. We, did, uh, we carried out a lot of flights uh, with another project. We had um, an, an average of 70% of the area that we wanted to cover actually covered which was very good because um, actually most of the time this was more than 95% of the area covered. Just one day that we, w the weather was not, was not really, uh, was really bad. Um, but when you actually evaluate the flights, then you can see that the, these um, uh, systems are too unstable, okay? So as I was saying, um, this, um, uh, this, uh, the, the problem of the system is that you, you have to use these uh, little cameras that are actually not real uh, multi-spectral cameras because um, while in the blue you mostly have uh, the infrared, you still have also infrared in the other bands. So the images look, what we call them, fails color infrared imagery because while you can color process the images afterwards so that they look like real color infrared images, then the discrimination that you have is not the same because there is an overlap between the different bands. Mm -hmm. The reason you have to use this, um, uh, these cameras is that um, the landing of these systems is very rough. So it's risky to put any uh, uh, expensive sensor on them. Hmm? So it, there is this trade-off on them. So this is why we, uh, well, an another consequence of the, uh, of, uh, of the instability of this system is that um, the uh, geometric uh, post-processing is very complicated. For example, the conventional polyn polynomial methods cannot be used. 
because the resulting errors are phenomenal. They are uh, sometimes 100, 100 meters. Mm -hmm. But it is true that there is now uh, advanced geometric post-processing for, uh, for this type of systems. And with these um, programs, like for example, the one we have used, that is Enso Mosaic, uh, you, uh, you get to very uh, reasonable results. The results are dependent upon having a very good calibration of the camera, which is not um, uh, simple. And then it's very important that the images have a very um, high degree of overlap. Right? They, uh, with so this would be a, a, an example of a case in which um, the images do not have that uh, high degree of overlap. And then the um, errors that you get with the post-processing, so this is the uh, ortho image, and this is the uh, image acquired by the mosaic the uh, part of the mosaic that has been generated from the images acquired by the uh, UAV. And we, you get here errors that are around 18 meters. But in other cases, like, um, uh, like in this one, you get much better results. Mm -hmm. So if, as you can see here, the overlap between the different images is very high, the um, uh, result of the mosaic can can be very good. Then we were using this uh, other um, this other system. It is um, uh, it's a multi-spectral camera with six bands and using um, uh, and, and a small aircraft. Mm -hmm. the, the camera is actually um, designed for uh, being used within UAVs, but um, taking into consideration the landings that um, the, uh, uh, the CAT UAV uh, system has, we prefer not to put this camera in, inside. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, not recommended. So this is a camera with six, uh, it's actually six cameras with six independent CMOS, uh, independent uh, sensors, within one single block. Mm -hmm. And then the advantage is that uh, the user is free to select the, um, uh, the filters. So you can have a collection of filters, and according to the, um, the mission that you want to perform, you can select the ones that you think are going to better suit your needs. Uh, here you have an example. We tested these two, uh, these two configurations. One would be closer to the standard, so you have an RGB. And, and near infrared, and two for the red edge in between. Mm -hmm. And the other one tries to get a bit more of the uh, uh, near infrared around uh, 900, 850. Mm -hmm. um, a characteristic of the camera is that uh, the alignment error it, the, the, that results from the pre-processing uh, of the software, using the software that comes with the camera, is um, not um, very good, so, um, but this is a problem that can be solved, but it is nevertheless is very, uh, at least un until what we have found until now, um, if you really want to have a good alignment, you have to create uh, uh, the, the, the file for uh, carrying out the correction almost specifically for each flight. Mm -hmm. so, so that takes a bit of time. This is an example of an uh, agricultural field acquired with this, uh, uh, with this camera and this airplane. The uh, resolution is 14.8 centimeters. And this is actually an agronomic experiment in which they have a uh, heat and nitrogen level. So we had a very good um, field uh, um, uh, truth uh, in here. And using a permutation and ordinary uh, multivariate ANOVA, we could show significant difference among treatments using the radiometry, okay? Using the, the data provided by the multispectral camera, which means that it's actually uh, providing uh, useful information. Uh, we could also assess some problems, or some operational problems, as there is not uh, an exposure control, an independent exposure control for each band, and 
the uh, reflection in the in-ear infrared is much higher. Sometimes you have problems of overexposure and underexposure in different bands. Mm -hmm. So this it's a bit tricky sometimes. Regarding the geometric post-processing, uh, post even the conventional post-processing uh, yields uh, relatively good uh, results, so reasonable results. Six pixels of error, 89 centimeters of error using just the second order polynomial. And uh, this is because the platform is much more stable. And then uh, we have not assessed yet the uh, geometric post-processing with Enzo Mosaic because in order to do it, we have to calibrate the camera, which means that now we have to calibrate six cameras, mm, because we need an independent calibration for each of the six cameras. Mm. So we have not done that yet. So uh, we also, um, within the project, we also solved some practical problems, like uh, uh, a little tool in order to, uh, uh, for the user to carry out his own or her own um, campaign planning. This is done using just um, open source code in R and QGIS. So the first thing the user does is just to set up the fly line in, 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 the, uh, in, the, area, in the area of interest. And then using R, you, what you get are the sizes and, and the characteristics of the, uh, of the cameras. You get the sizes at different heights. So you, the user can finally select at what height I want to fly, what, with what pixel size I want to fly. And once you have decided that, then uh, you um, distribute the waypoints along the fly line, taking into consideration pixel size and footprint size, the exposure time, because uh, it cannot be long, because this is a, uh, it's a, an airplane flying at uh, 150 kilometers per hour, and, so, and the speed of the aircraft. So once you have that, you can um, uh, represent your waypoints and your GIS and actually pass these uh, waypoints to the GPS of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. And they are going to fly those lines and take the images there. So we did that for two sites, for La Bertolina, which is the one, uh, one of the sites in which we have established these um, this, uh, e Edi Covariance Towers, and in Alinea because there is a, a long, in relative terms, a long time series of CO2 fluxes there. Then we also uh, developed a little tool for the uh, evaluation of the campaign. So here we have the, have the evaluation of the campaign that we carried out uh, last week. So at, with 1,000, well, around 1,000 uh, meters uh, above ground level, we were successful at covering all the uh, uh, spots. And, uh, oops, oops, oops. and with enough uh, uh, overlap as for these um, images to be uh, um, um, valid for uh, Enzo Mosaic processing. But instead, at, uh, for the um, 300 and 600 uh, meters above ground level, the flight was not as successful because there was a lot of turbulence, so the, the pilot could not make it as he wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so some examples of the um, images we got. So this is one example of, uh, it's, an, um, it's a classic CR, CIR combination of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the bands. This is uh, acquired at the uh, 1,100 uh, meters above ground level. The pixel size is 61 centimeters. This is another case. In here you can. Is that the uh, pointer? Well, maybe. Well, it, oh, here it is. Yeah. Here it, oh, that's one. Okay, okay, so good. So those are the references that we put. The tower is here and, and the tower is here. Mm -hmm. And those are uh, 386 meters uh, above ground level. So those are the references. Um, the car the, in here. So this is uh, 20.6 centimeters. This is the uh, the references, and here you can appreciate the. Uh, uh, alignment problem that you have with the images as they are uh, post-processed with the um, 
bundled software of the camera, so this has to be improved. So work in progress is the spectral characterization of semido invariant targets so that we can get real um, multi-temporal uh, 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 imagery. Um, and then this, uh, we think that we are going to generate our multi-temporal layers of vegetation at one meter resolution. Those are the ones that are intended to calculate greenness and the different uh, indexes. And then um, validation with uh, field hemispheric photography and field uh, color infrared photography and collected samples. This is going to happen in the uh, third week of uh, July. And measurement of PRI uh, using field spectrometry uh, and then testing if PRI can actually be estimated from the field and from multispectral aerial images as we can select uh, the appropriate filters. And finally, test the feasibility of the production of the tailored map of functional types from multispectral imagery at 20 centimeter resolution. Conclusions is that um, uh, broad resolution but frequent satellite imagery proves that remotely sensed multispectral measurements are essential for understanding surface dynamics related to CO2 fluxes. But the current uh, satellites providing the, this multi-temporal information are too coarse. We actually see a significant gain when we use higher resolution as demonstrated with the time series of Landsat images. The uh, systems uh, based on light area remote sensing and multi-spectral cameras can provide time series at very high resolution at reasonable costs. And UAVs and RCs have achieved a notorious operational efficiency, so that's rather impressive. But we see that the rough landing is really a significant limitation for uh, costly sensors, okay? even moderately costly sensors. So these systems work best with standard cameras and for RGB photography. But we don't think they are um, uh, right now the, we do not think they are appropriate for our um, purposes. Geometric processing of light area remote sensing images is complex and below the current standards of conventional aerial photography. Hmm? That's important to be recognized. I mean, you are not going to get the same uh, quality of, of, of ortho image that you are getting using the uh, standard methods that are available nowadays. But, um, I, we think that we are going to be able to get multi-temporal registrations with errors lower than one meter, which is enough for the uh, GPP mapping. And then we think the sub-meter resolution for very detailed maps can be processed or obtained with these uh, uh, systems, but these maps will have distortions. Nevertheless, we can live with those distortions because the, f uh, the final map can be warped to a bus to a better geometry in post-processing. So you do not need a perfect image in order, geometrically speaking, in order to carry out this type of vegetation mapping. And that's all, thank you very much. So thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions? Maybe I have a question. Yeah. Um, it w was the <coughs> multispectral camera you used designed by your group or No, no, the, the multispectral, there are two. It is the being designed by the Institute of Geomatics, but I've not presented it here because okay. this is work is still in progress. And this is that's based on an RGB camera okay. and, and, and a monochromatic camera with, uh, for a near infrared with, without, okay. the f without the blocking filter. And the uh, one we have used for most of the uh, 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 results that I saw in here is a um, mini MCA ah, tetra camera. camera. Ah, okay. Exactly. Hmm? And uh, what is the cost of this camera, just to have an idea? It is around um, 18,000 euros. That depends on the actual configuration that you, that you purchase. But that's, that's so it's um, too costly for a UAV, but it's very reasonable for uh, for an airplane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our goal in terms of cost is to get each campaign well below the 1,000 euros. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something really cheap, 700 euros, something like that, mm -hmm. so that you can have 
10 campaigns for a year. Okay. And that has another, um, um, if you want, if you has had another add value is that um, you are in the, you have the control of the acquisition of the data. Okay, mm -hmm. sometimes when you work with uh, an operator that is using a very expensive equipment and you even have to uh, apply for another budget mm -hmm. that is covering that or another program that is mm -hmm. covering that, then your control on the actual campaign mm -hmm. is very reduced, it's very limited. Mm -hmm. And Lynn, do you think that the reliability of the UAVs in the next future can be improved and so allow the use of the Tetracam on the... Well, some people do it. I mean, I don't think it's a problem of the reliability of the uh, um, uh, vehicle, which are very reliable. I'm very impressed by the... I'm, I'm very operational. I'm very impressed by that. But the problem is that if uh, you have something that is very expensive, then you need something that is close to... Um, well, similar to an airfield. So that depends where you have your towers. Where we have the towers, we we must have rough landings. And actually, the system they have developed, it is designed in order to support uh, rough landing. Mm -hmm. So it's made for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the problem is that, so the, the, the vehicle does not break. So mm -hmm. The problem is that if you have uh, expensive equipment in it, it's obviously going to suffer. But what do you mean by rough landings? Is it just... Uh we have we well I should have put the link in here for we have we have it in um, in uh, in YouTube I mean with the actual uh, movie uh, what you see with with the camera I mean there are rocks etc so it's able to really okay. land on something that is uh, completely completely wild mm -hmm. so in some cases in the Montseigne with a different uh, in a different project we were landing over um, uh, these wraps mm -hmm. directly not over the Other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Augustin. And mm. maybe we can move to the last presentation of this uh, afternoon. Arno Carrara and Javier Pacheco are gonna introduce uh, Las Majadas, Fluxnet site and all the spectral measurements which have been carried out uh, at this Edicovarian site. No, 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 Okay, so I will start. Uh, first, I will talk about uh, multispectral proximal sensing, which means more or less two band sensor. So, first to show what is a DESA, because it's something that is not known very well by non Spanish people. It's, it's open woodland ecosystem from a great variety or from quite open ecosystem, like you see top left to quite nearly closed forest, as you see on top right. Uh, our site is kind of uh, average mm, DESA, to say it quickly. So the main issue for making continuous measurement and uh, the main challenge at the site is the spatial heterogeneity and the spatial scale, because the tower is only 15 meter height. And as you, as you can see from uh, the size of the tree, which are quite big, because you, cannot, you are not high enough to have an image that is comparable to what you can see uh, for a pixel that is illustrated more or less by 500 by 5 meter, 500 meter square uh, on the top of the right. 
So we go for a strategy. I just talk about uh, two sensor bands as described by John Gammon, that it mean uh, to, to retrieve a typically vegetation index. So the first objective was to have a long-term monitoring of NDVI, PRI, and water balance index because I didn't knew nothing about uh, about let's say remote sensing or infrastructural measurement, but just have some money to remaining to invest in invertible, and then I decided to, to, to put a few sensors there in 2008. So uh, the setup was really without any knowledge, so I would do it differently now from what I learned. So uh, we have uh, the measurement setup is to have continuous measurement, so half an hour, it's a fit with the Eddy Covariance Tower uh, measurement, let's say, on the same um, time step. And plus, we make some periodic manual measurements to have an idea of the variability in the footprint area and uh, okay, to, to cope with uh, uh, spatial variability, but only for the herbaceous layer because we cannot go to measure above the different trees. So we have one tree, one uh, spot of 20.2, 20 22 meters square on the grass, which is continuous, and plus some periodic manual measurement. So the instrumentation for this uh, two-band continuous measurement are uh, two kind of sensors. There is a sky sensor, uh, which we purchase, and also uh, the one which is home-built by uh, people of university in Paris, which is Jean Pontalier, and which are made to measure uh, <coughs> NDVI only uh, having a radiance measurement, not irradiance measurement. So they are basically the bandwidth of the, of the sensor is there. If you want more detail on this sensor, it has been published very recently, uh, a first uh, review of the first result, because this kind of sensor is set up in quite a uh, number of Eddy Covenant Tower, mainly French-speaking uh, tower, if I can say it like this. Uh, so the preliminary results that we have after three years, okay, we have more or less three years of data here. Uh, here you can see uh, in red, uh, the results from uh, the homemade built by University of Paris sensor. In green, uh, you have the results from the sky sensor. And in uh, the yellow uh, triangles show uh, the measurement of the herbaceous layer by averaged by transect made by the group of uh, Pilar, the CSIC with the uh, ISD field spec 3. And uh, the uh, blue square are uh, the result of our transect measurement using also a sky sensor spectrosense. So these sensors are 10 nanometer uh, bandwidth for the skies and uh, centered in uh, 680 and 8 800 or 860. 800. So what first we can see uh, from a very quickly is that there is a baseline for this DESA. Uh, a DESA, the herbaceous layer every year <coughs> uh, during the summer is totally dry out. So we expect more or less a constant signal during the summer, which is the case for uh, the sensor of the University of Paris. You can see that every summer more or less we reach the same level. But it's not the case for uh, the, the sky uh, sensor. Uh, the first year is at one level, I set up the line there, and you can see that the last year uh, it's much more uh, low than that. If I can have a second. So uh, this makes us suspect um, also we have some gaps due to insect nesting in the sensor hole for the sky sensor, uh, which is not uh, something trivial, it is really a problem because this sensor you have to set up, and for routine measurement you really want to have unintended measurement as robust as possible without high need for maintenance. So that's also a problem. So the results show that uh, basically uh, comparing uh, the continuous NDVI measurement versus the uh, periodic manual measurement that we have from two different sources, the uh, ADS uh, field spec, the comparison is in green, and uh, uh, the sky sensor, it's in brown. So on the left, you have the comparison with the JIP, uh, the what I call the JIP University of Paris sensor, and on the right for the Sky uh, commercial sensor. So wha what we can see uh, is that uh, because discover more or less three years of data, uh, the periods are not exactly the same for the comparison with the field spec and for the other reference measurement. But what we can see is that, the, uh, as we can see from the time series, 
that the sensor from the University of Paris presents higher uh, deviation uh, comparing to the 1 1 line. Here it's put in uh, gray. Uh, comparing to uh, the sky sensor on the right. But uh, on an opposite way, whatever you take as a reference as a period, it looks much more stable because uh, the slope of the regression are more or less the same. The two regression are more or less the same on different period uh, using different uh, measurement as reference measurement, which is not the case for the sky sensor. As you can see, there is two very different slope and uh, the lowest, especially there is important deviation in the lowest part of the value, which correspond to dry summer period when we measure basically on a dry and senescent uh, herbaceous layer. So these <coughs> are almost the conclusions. So from that conclusion, I will say uh, that uh, the, from our experience, uh, the home-built sensor uh, by University of Paris looks much more suitable for long-term routine measurement, but obviously requires a calibration or a correction procedure. It's more a correction than a calibration. That uh, may be site-specific, it's not very clear for us, we are investing in TIGIT, but it's, it's not very clear. We have made that uh, comparison, and I will show that later. So first, the, the, the explanation of why uh, the sky sensor is doesn't look robust is because after investing in TIGIT a bit, we have detect what we can show here, that there is a degradation of the sensitivity of the sensor. Here I show uh, what I call a kind of proxy of the sensitivity to have a constant, which is a rough assessment of the stability because this sensor have uh, irradiance measurements. So we compare the irradiance in each sensor with a short wave incoming radiation for clear sky days mostly. So this is expected to be more or less stable a long time. This is three years of data. Even if there can be some slight uh, uh, tendency, slight difference between winter and summer due to the cosinus diffuser, which is of lower quality for the sky sensors are comparing to the high uh, quality uh, Kiefenzen and short wave uh, incoming radiation sensors. So, but we can see here, for example, for the red sensor, which is one channel that has gone down before, it's not here on the graph, or on the lower graph, we can see one of the two channels have also a great decrease after one year in the sensitivity, sensitivity is cut by the half. So this is for the examples that we had for our PRI channels, just the irradiance one. And also another example for the NDVI channels that you can see that also the two blue ones which are used for uh, calculating the NDVI of the grassland have uh, experimented some uh, important decrease in the sensibility and, and brusque decrease. When you can see one of these brusque decrease have direct effects on the NDVI and then the pattern uh, that you see below uh, with this kind of um, bell uh, following by a plateau during winter should not be like that. The reality from other sensor or also from the measurement from a PILAR group with the field spec shows that more or less from November when uh, there is a regreen of the herbaceous layer to April when it goes down, the fountain was good here, it was more or less a flat. So this kind of feature is directly uh, created artificially by the by the loss of sensitivity of some channels that we don't know exactly what it happens, but makes the sensor quite unsuitable for long term. So for our experience at our site, we can say that the sky multi sensor presents some sensitivity change that makes them not suitable at this time for long term time monitoring. We suspect this degradation have to is partially due to high temperature because uh, for some reasons, so maybe they can be improved because the sensor body also, which is totally black, I mean in an environment like Spain in summer must just over warm the inside, so there may be some issues there, we don't know, but whatever the result of our team measurement are not really <coughs> uh, good. So I came back to the sensor that for us works better, so the, the home built by my um, University of Paris. So we, have, we, we need to have a, a calibration or a correction uh, factor to, to, to be able to, to have more uh, accurate uh, NDVI measurements that then we can compare maybe with satellite or whatever, or try to use an explanatory variable for explaining variation in a GPP or whatever carbon flux. So we have just a very limited experience because we have this sensor which is very cheap at our other sites. For example, here it's a site in uh, close to Valencia in um, Shrubland. It's uh, Shrubland with uh, mainly uh, Romero. Uh, here, okay, we have very uh, much lower variation in uh, in NDVI uh, during over the year. <laughs> we just experiment a very small variation, but more or less here in green you can see the the correlation, the correction uh, <coughs> factor for this sensor uh, built in Mahadas, and you can see that it fits quite well 
for the scales that we have, it, it could be used quite reasonably well for the data at this site. At another site, which is the site of Alinea, where we have also uh, this NDVI uh, constant measurement. Here, we have very little point to, 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 to calibrate the reference because we don't go so often to make manual measurements of transect. But also, you can see that uh, the line of Mahalas in green is quite okay for most of the measurement during the, the summer season with the difference of NDVI that can be during the summer season. And after, of course, what makes the, uh, the slope very different is the single point measurement, which is very low, which corresponds to snow conditions. So that's a little bit maybe, also it can be easily separated snow condition and can just be put out from uh, NDVI analysis because it doesn't use, we don't really need the NDVI value or whatever value of vegetation index during snow to understand carbon balance. So part of that, it looks also that it's conservative. This uh, We have another site in a uh, paddy rice field uh, close to Valencia, also very nice um, <coughs> for remote sensing products with very large areas. So here we can also see uh, the same stories that the few points that we have uh, uh, fit quite well uh, also to the low regressed in, in, in Mahadas in another site. Uh, Two exceptions from that, this is the two moments where uh, the sensor was seeing water. I mean, here, for example, you can see the crops, uh, I would say, end of July, okay, there is very important light, so you don't see basically the water, but when the rice is growing, which is a top low point, top low point was pure water, and the intermediate point, uh, which was seen, it was a kind of growing uh, uh, season, but I mean, the growing, the rice was growing, so you, you, will, see, you will see some plants plus some uh, water. So this, this uh, sensor, have a, as it is now, have a 100 uh, field of view. So from the zenith, it's 50 and 50. So at, at this time of June and July, so, so there is must be some specular effects that must be responsible from that uh, deviation. But of part of that, the rest, when there is a, once the vegetation are fully covered the water, fully, and after also when the, the crop is going to go senescent, to go yellow, to produce um, the seeds, then more or less, uh, which is the other points, uh, more or less the, the correction uh, regression that we have works quite well. So at the end, what that was looking like uh, in the jeep corrected by uh, the law, and it fits quite well, it's not presented here, but with, with the original measurement uh, made by field spec or whatever. So it's a cheap sensor, quite robust, and up to now we are happy with it, but <coughs> uh, we have to try now to use it uh, with um, eddy current data. So last time, last thing that I w wanted to comment is that, okay, we have fixed uh, measurement in uh, vertical radiation, so it was also some something commented by Nicole or, or Jose or or John Gammon that we have some angle uh, effect. So as in our case, it's not the view angle effect because we only look uh, from the same uh, position. And uh, we can see that we have a strong uh, dependence on the elimination angle. So here it's an example for May, for example, in the grassland. And this depends on the season. It depends also on the kind because here we can see, for example, this severe uh, journal variation. This is made from average of uh, the day, just selecting the clear sky day as it is shown in the graph below. Uh, and uh, we have it, it's, it's for the canopy, the tree canopy. So it's in July, so we have another shape. And here it's for, and we have a different shape from uh, the two different sensors, the one with narrow angle of view and the one with larger. And here is for the PRI, it's not very obvious, but for the scale of the PRI, because the scale is not very good, it's a very important uh, variation, also daily variation in PRI measurement. So we also don't understand that, but it's definitely an issue if you want to compare on uh, the full season what you have to select, the midday measurement or the, uh, a similar angle through the year, or this is an open question for us. Well, uh, that's what I wanted to talk. I will. And we talk about the uh, hyperspectral proximal sensing in, in our site in Mahadas. Uh, we have uh, replicated and adapted the AMSPEC system, a multi-angular unattended hyperspectral system in, in this site. And well, the system is based in a unispec DC spectral radiometer, and we use a pan tilt unit which is uh, moving the, the fiber optic and, and so that we can sample ra uh, reflectance from different viewing angles. And the system is an attendant and it works under a MALDA protein.
the first uh, conclusion or the first lessons learned that we have had is that the, even these systems, uh, some of these systems has already been developed. Uh, replicating them is not an easy task because this system, they are still prototypes. Mm -hmm. And they are very sensible to any change you introduce, and, and you will be forced to introduce changes, no? because you will have to face different environmental conditions. Your tower will have different constraints. Uh, you will have a different structure in your ecosystem. You will find new versions of the hardware or updates, and they are not, uh, they are not always well documented. Uh, you can have uh, your, your hardware breaking down for several reasons, and then you have additional problems. And for sure, in the end, you will have to change the, the software, for, and then then you will have to deal with new issues like the buffering, the control, and and also the licensing of the of the software. So after a lot of uh, things, we have learned a lot of a uh, lot of things about this system, and uh, we have had a lot of uh, problems and experiences. So we the, the system is uh, eventually working, but uh, we still have to smooth some things, and we can keep on improving it. But uh, mainly, the system is working now. Uh, well, uh, depends how, how does it work, how does this uh, multi-spectral, multi-angular system work? Uh, the, s the, the system takes these three kind of measurements. Uh, it works in a 30-minute base, uh, so it's measuring, uh, scanning the ecosystem for 30 minutes, and uh, within that time, uh, the first thing it does is taking a, a, a measurement, a round of measurements in the same zenithal angle of the sun. So it, it starts changing the zenithal angle and also the also the, the azimuthal angle to, to change the, to, to, to complete the round uh, with the same uh, illumination angle. Then it starts scanning the, the ecosystem, as you can see, it starts uh, changing the, 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 the blue points, which are the, the zenith angle, and then uh, once it has uh, covered the, the whole range of the zenith, uh, then it changes the, the azimuth and it starts changing again the, the, the zenith. And if, it, uh, if the system notice that there is a satellite overpassing the, the scene and maybe taking an image uh, then it start following and start tracking the satellite so it, is, it measures with the same uh, with the same viewing angle of the satellite um, and this is how it uh, works uh, I, will, I would like before it starts working maybe we can uh, see the, the connection the live connection with the system this is the uh, uh, remote desktop and it's uh, how is it working in the in the tower if it's maybe it should refresh uh, Maybe stop it now. I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe there's a small failure now, <coughs> which usually happens. Okay. Well, yeah, I think it's stuck. But uh, uh, well, anyhow, we we can we can see and we can control the system in with this kind of screen. So we have uh, we have here the the radiance and the radiance of the of the sensor in in digital numbers, and we have also the ratio. And we have here the, the image that the, the, the webcam is, is capturing every time. And uh, well, we have the, the position, the degrees, which is uh, using. So we get some information. I think now there must be some problem. Or maybe the, the system is, is off because uh, uh, when the sun angle is lower than 20 degrees, it switches off. So maybe, maybe now it's later, too. I don't know why. Anyhow, we, uh, OK. We, uh, for some time, we have been forced to work in a fixed position because we were not we were not able to to use the multi-angular system, and we have been also taking some data. Maybe will help us to understand what are we sampling now. Uh, so we aimed the, the the fiber optic to the east in an angle of 45 degrees, more or less, and then we we start the sampling data. And this is an example of uh, the results we got in a in an unstable day with the uh, clouds clouds overpassing the the scene, some sunny moments also, and this is the, the kind of data we are we are getting. Uh, this is the PRI, and this is the this is the uh, an estimation of the radiance received by the by the by the sun by the, by the scene, and this would be example for a clear sky day when with the there is no clouds, uh, the, the radius is increasing and decreasing around the day. We have a shadow here over the, the cosine receptor. We have to change the cosine receptor because the tower itself itself was casting a shadow. And these are the kind of data we, we are getting. And this is also the reflectance for uh, for a clear sky day in this, in this site and also for a, for a cloudy day. And this is important because uh, directional effects are stronger and they're, and they're high uh, direct radiation environment so when when the sky is cloudy and there's a high amount of a of a diffuse radiation the, the reflectance changes and and the directional effects are not so important so the one of the things we have to do is to separate the the the, the measurements in different illumination conditions and and estimate different models for each uh, for each one of the of the the conditions and this would be an example of the 
of the multi-angular measurements we are taking. Uh, these data are from the, from the last week when we started working with the multi-angular data. And you can see here that we have a, a regular measurement with the solar plane and also the complete scan of the ecosystem, but we have no here satellite overpass. And we can see that there are a lot of different, uh, different uh, spectra, and that's, that's because our ecosystem is also quite heterogeneous. So every time we move our field view, we are sampling something different. And this is something that we will have to deal with too, and we will have to try to, to understand what are we measuring and what's the effect of its measurement, what's, if it's part of the, of the, of the cover in, in, the, in the measurement, and we will have, we'll try to separate that somehow with different models. And well, this is the, um, what we still have to do, we just started working last week, so we have a lot of things to do already. We have to, we have to try to, to know what are we viewing every time exactly, and then we will try to correct VRDF, uh, considering not only the illumination conditions, but also what, what are we watching, what are we viewing every time. And then we would like to, to link this optical data with the ethical variance data and see what can we, what can we find out. And in the meantime, there, are also, there is also some there is also some uh, some maintenance and some calibrations we have to take care of, uh, and uh, this is also an important part of uh, to assure the, the quality data. And, and there are some things that should be uh, in investigated here because it's not a, as I said in the first presentation this morning, it's not a, it's not a something that is completely solved. And just finally, I would like to talk about the multi-scale sensing that we are doing in, in this site and with this project. No? We are, uh, we, for two years, uh, something more, uh, we have been working with the biospectral project in this place, sampling uh, optical and, and biophysical variables from, from different levels. And we are working at different scales, trying to, to upscale uh, the data we have been sampling from the ground. Uh, for, um, from March 2009 to May 2011, we've been working formally and monthly, uh, sampling both the uh, optical data and biophysical data in, in, in for grassland and for home oak, both leaves and, and canopy. And we have had a couple of uh, hyperspectral flight campaigns with the INTA. Uh, we have one flight in, in May 2010, and we have another flight uh, more complete in, in May 2011. Uh, we, we had three images in the afternoon and three images in the, in the, in the, in the morning with a different configuration each one. And we are, well, we've been working with the uh, canopy nitrogen content estimation, also with water and evapotranspiration estimations. And in the second image, we were trying to analyze the intra-daily uh, differences and, and variabilities. We are also working with Landsat imagery. We have, uh, we have a lot of uh, ground through data, so we are trying to validate some uh, images calibration and for, for optical and thermal methods. And we are also well, we, are, we are trying to calibrate a canopy water content model uh, based on a radiative transfer model. And we are also estimating evapotranspiration and there is some work done with the carbon stock. Uh, for the models imagery, we are validating, validating some uh, standard products uh, like the NDVI, LAI, or GPP. And we are also validating this canopy water content uh, product or, or model who has been calibrated for MODIS. And there are also some work with CBD for estimation of evapotranspiration. And that's, that's all. So thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Javier. Are there any questions? John first. I think I was the responsible of the microphone, but uh, I think, uh, can you can you speak louder maybe? I cannot. Uh Temperature effects on calibration, and I was curious whether you've experienced issues with that, or whether it was just something you thought was going to happen. Yeah, ac actually, we uh, uh, Michael lent us uh, the SpecCal software that he uses for the calibration of the uh, his sensors, and we we found some relationships between the, the temperature and the spectral shift and the full width of hull maximum of the of the sensor, and that's something that we maybe in the future should uh, deal with because. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, some power constraints in, in our tower. We work in uh, we are uh, powered by solar panels, so we, we have no power for maybe for a 
a good uh, thermal uh, stabilization of the system. And uh, we know that the, full, the, the spectral calibration is, is wider when, when the temperature, temperature is wider and we have some spectral shifts. So we, we maybe now it's early to do that and we have a lot of things to do before, but uh, we, we have that in mind and maybe at some point we would like to, to, to take that in account because uh, we have a, this spectral software is, it uses uh, atmospheric bands and, and Fraunhofer bands to, to, to locate you know, your, your, your spectral, uh, to, to check your spectral calibration in, in your instrument. And the Unispec has a, maybe a two cores uh, resolution, but uh, for some bands it works and we have found some, some relationships between the temperature and the spectral shift and also for, for the spectral calibration, the spectral, uh, spectral resolution. So right now we are not working on that, but maybe in the future we will be interested and it will be also, a, maybe, maybe it will be a, an interesting point in this kind of uh, systems. That was Nicole. Uh, the question is for Arno. <laughs> if I understand well, the NDVI sensor, the, the French sensor, don't use the radiance measurements. And so it's like to do a, an NDVI with uh, radiance measurements and not reflectance. So I think that it was quite expected that uh, you don't have the same value as with the ASD or not. And I think that it it's very difficult to use, uh, it is very useful to see the trend during the season, but I think that it can be quite difficult to use the NDVI in an absolute way to, for example, for validation of satellite products or something like this. Well, at least for a specific <coughs> ecosystem in our case, uh, the, the um, time series looks very consistent and robust, no accurate presenting very high correlation and very precise correlations. The running mean square error was just 0 0.2, 0 0.02, sorry. So 0 0.02 of precision as, a, as, a, as you can call it as you want, everything is a proxy in the life. So uh, this proxy you have for sure to calibrate it, but after I think on, on long term, because this is a point to have routine measurement. When I set up that stuff first, I was not expecting nothing because I didn't knew anything about that, just that the PRI, which I was calling Penuelas uh, Reflectance Index, was just something that was in the air, and I was thinking it, it's maybe good to do that. But what is good, what when you want to study carbon flux at a, at a site, really what matters you now is to understand uh, the variability with climate, which means the internal variability. This is really the signal that uh, uh, you have science inside, you know, to, to, to force a model, to calibrate any model. I mean, just to, to observe one season of something today, you does not learn much uh, on, on ecosystem carbon flux. So the long-term stability for me was a very important criteria. And I don't care much if I have a good proxy, something robust, <coughs> if I have to calibrate it one time, making some measurement with a better system. Of course, this is not totally accurate. I'm even surprised by the stability of the, of the comparison between uh, another stuff that should is defensible as NDVI? No, but I agree that uh, for long-term monitoring is very useful, and also if you have to hmm. compare fluxes with uh, NDVI, it, it works better than Sky, and I trust that <laughs> it works better. <laughs> but I think that uh, it's quite strange to talk about calibration, or in any case, I think that it's more difficult to compare. I don't know calibration. Data acqu acquire. I think that uh, <coughs> in, uh, yeah, it works well and this yeah, is uh, no more stable than the sky. I, when I plug the system, people, when they have published the paper on, on sh presenting the results of this sensor, they just present this as, as a measurement of NDVI without saying much, without comparing, without validating with nothing, which I found a little bit strong, but it had been published. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in my in my point of view, it's just something to whatever is the absolute value of NDVA, what it is. I mean, when you compute from what is from I see from uh, the field spec value. No, it's not an absolute value, but it's a okay, value you calculated you from reflectance, and in this case, it's calculated from uh, radiance. It's a different quantity. Yeah. It's whatever. Not wha what I see myself <coughs> is that more or less when you when you s when you are in Spain using this kind of sensor, after you filter out with the condition of. Uh, if you want to really see uh, the temporal variation, the seasonal variation, and the internal variability, you want to clean a little bit your signal for uh, perturbation for cloudy days or whatever. So at the end, you use mostly 
clear sky days. Okay. So for me, I don't understand the concept at all. So maybe I, I don't measure it right then, so I'm totally wrong. But when I see... No, but I'm not saying that you are totally wrong. No, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just what I want to say, when I see the, the maybe for finest studies is something different, but the correlation between the irradiance at whatever for a clear sky day and the short wave, the global short wave in of, of 300 to 3000 nanometer or whatever is defined, the correlation is nearly peck fair. So <coughs> I don't understand why you need that for some other application more fine for some I don't talk about, but for something so rose as NDVI really, at the end with a short wave in, all what I have as, a, as input, because it's not just also, it's when it's two different sensors, it's not as you say, it's another story is to make your sensor like this, then your measure is clear. But for me, the sensors that I have looking upward, uh, unattended, they don't provide me a more stable measure of the irradiance. I have the feeling uh, in, in that specific bandwidth than a good uh, keep and zone and high standard for example, like the CMP22. So uh, on a practical point of view, on a theoretical, I don't discuss nothing because I don't know any shit about that. But on a practical point of view, I don't really understand why we need more or less not very reliable measurement just because on the theory it sounds better. Other questions? Maybe I have one. Um, Concerning the sky sensors, um, you showed some time series and it was something like uh, three years or two years, I don't remember three exactly. Years, three years. Three years. Um, did you calibrate the system in these three years? We never calibrated. Nevertheless, when you calibrate, you can imagine that you sent your sensor at a specific moment where you have lost some sensitivity and then they change the calibration factor, but it will not prevent the stuff to have some brutal change. Mm -hmm. You calibrate to change the value, but not the response of the sensor, unless you really do something physically to the sensor. Yeah. But here there is no calibration is something uh, for radiation sensors, they are photodiodes and similar to stuff, they calibrate, but it's not kind of cleaning a chamber for an air gas mm -hmm. sensor. Yeah, it's yeah, not only a calibration. The factors. I, will, I don't think it would have prevented us from our main problem because it was not a long drift. In that case, it's mm -hmm. quite different calibrating it. Mm -hmm. And if you want accuracy. I, mean, I think it's a quite a uh, nice example of sensor, you know, sensor drift. Uh, so uh, I have to say that we have another sensor since uh, two years <coughs> now. Uh, the, the same sensor, the sky sensor, which up to now uh, we don't suspect any any drift, and for the four channels that are used, even eight channels, because there are two channels for clear right up two channels, so it's eight channels. And statically, in, in two years, we didn't have any problem like this. And statically, on which are on in the field and attended in rose condition, sun every day, whatever, mm -hmm. the half of the sensor, uh, half of the channel of the input have been screwed within two years. So it really look like uh, this. Uh, the sensors that we have in, in the garage, I would say, and that we put out just for campaign measurement, have responded to the specification of the sensor, which say less than 2% of long-term uh, mm -hmm. deviation. But the one in C2, dangerous. Other questions? Okay, this is the time now. Uh, we are only half an hour late, <laughs> so um, it was a qu quite interesting uh, session about uh, proximal sensing and uh, and upscaling um, uh, ground measurements. Uh, I would like to thank all the presenters.